Andahai. I'm the CEO of Axios. Uh, on behalf of all of Axios, welcome to our first ever summit. Uh, What's Next started as a newsletter, but it really animates what this company was founded to do, which is help all of you, help all of us get smarter faster on the topics that really matter, the topics that are going to shape the next five or 10 years of all of our lives. We're here in DC. This is not a typical DC summit, not a typical DC event. You're going to hear from 12 CEOs, innovators, uh, founder billionaires, and only two people in politics out of 12. And the reason is what we realized starting Axios is politics matters, and I think we're quite good uh, at covering it, but it's really the collision, the collision of business, technology, media with politics that really creates these new dynamics, opens up all these new opportunities. Uh, Steve Case is here. He's one of the people who is early to spot this, early to put money uh, into the people who are thinking the smartest about the changes that are unfolding in every city in America, including here in DC. This summit's designed to be different, to feel different. You're gonna hear from our smartest journalists and what we do at Axios is we hire people who have subject matter expertise, many of them who are very familiar to you. You're gonna hear them in conversation with those CEOs, with those thinkers, uh, with those founders. And then we're gonna break into small groups for the people that are here. We have tens of thousands that'll be joining us uh, online, but for those that are here, we're gonna break into small groups and we're gonna have real discussions about what is happening and what are some of the solutions that can make a big difference. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the day, the reasons you should stick around, uh, is at lunch. One of the neat things that we've done is we have uh, brought together uh, a, an army of people to go cover local in local communities. And in, we're in 14 right now, so at lunch you're gonna have dishes from the top dish from the 14 cities that we're in uh, today. And then we're gonna end the day with some cool uh, cocktails with a couple of uh, wild twists. This day would not be possible if it weren't uh, for our sponsors. Uh, Bank of America, Density, Meta, PwC, their support, the support of their executive teams makes this full day extravaganza possible, makes it possible for us to share it for free with anybody who logs on online and wants to watch all of these awesome uh, interviews. And what the sponsors want, what we want, is for you to leave with an illuminating new lens on these topics and some fun surprises, including meeting for the first time the next generation of Mike Allen, our friend Tortoise uh, here. Uh, Tortoise uh, is one of the many cool new innovations that are uh, on the playground that we've put together uh, today. What you're able to do, uh, Dimitri is the creator, the founder, the CEO uh, that brought us uh, Tortoise. And this is the future of how you're gonna be able to buy things, whether it's in a big warehouse or whether it's in a neighborhood. In fact, we've talked to Dimitri about starting to sell Axios swag, either maybe starting in DC, but in all of our cities. Show us how it works. All right, fastest way to buy anything. Just walk up, tap to pay, and voila. Success, please open the box to retrieve your cookies. There you go, Jim. When you're finished, Beautiful. please Enjoy. make sure the lid is firmly And if you're shut. here, you we get them. If you're here, you get them for like two bucks. And I know from my kid who's in college looking at the credit card receipt, they cost a hell of a lot more than $2. Uh, so enjoy the day. In 2017, we set out with a mission to get you smarter, faster on the news that matters. And since then, well, we've covered a lot. How people live, work, communicate and move around has completely changed in just five years. And the pace of those changes, it's only accelerating. But we're helping you stay on top of it. Today, we'll cover the five trends you need to know to be better prepared for what's next. The pandemic, demographic shifts, and new technologies are reshaping how people move and connect in cities. But what's working, what's not, and what can people expect from the places they live? Society is moving away from fossil fuels for the first time in more than 100 years, requiring that everything from cars to buildings go electric. Getting there means a revolution in infrastructure and AI, and that's just the beginning. 
where, how, and why we work are questions that matter more than ever in the wake of the pandemic. This means more uncertainty across generations and a chance to fix what's not working at work. Currencies are going cashless, DIY investments are booming, and spending habits are changing, causing everyone to rethink old assumptions about how to make and manage money. Technology's next platform could be a virtual universe or a smart world with AI automated everything. No matter what, the key will be defending against vulnerabilities while technology continues to morph. So that's what's next. But first... Welcome everyone to our annual What's Next Summit. We are so excited to be bringing you some of the top minds across topics like energy, the future of technology, what's next for cities, finance, and more. When we were thinking about who would be one of the best voices to bring to you to talk about emerging technology trends, we couldn't help but think about streaming, of course. And I absolutely love that video because it ends on the smart home. I'm here today to introduce you to one of the top minds in streaming. So without further ado, please welcome me in introducing Cesar Conde, the chair of NBC News Group. Thank you. Sarah, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I wanted to start off, since we're kicking off the conference, with news of the day. Last week, Axios reported that MSNBC is in exclusive talks with White House Press Secretary Mm -hmm. Jen Psaki about potentially bringing her on, giving her a streaming show, and then also having her on as programming. Do you have any comment about the report? Well, I saw, first of all, great to see you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, Congratulations to Jim, Mike, wherever you are, and the entire Axios team on the launch of uh, of this new event. We're very excited for you. Um, I did see those reports over the weekend, including the report from uh, from Axios. Um, And, you know, I don't have anything to add beyond what's in the reports. Beyond that particular report, MSNBC also has a contract with Simone Sanders, the former chief spokesperson for Vice President Kamala Harris. She has a streaming show. She appears on MSNBC programming. It seems like this is becoming a trend where MSNBC is bringing in sort of a revolving door of Biden administration officials. Do you worry about how that impacts MSNBC's credibility? You know, I think the, the great thing about all these emerging new platforms that we're seeing in the media ecosystem, um, streaming being one of the primary ones today, I think what that has allowed us and allowed other media companies is to begin to bring in a variety of different voices and perspectives. We have more places to have individuals. And so in our particular case in the past, what we've done is we've tried to bring in a variety of different uh, individuals who bring unique perspectives. Um, we've brought in journalists like Tom Yamas for our primary NBC News streaming platform. We've brought in Simone, as you said, a, a political contributor. We've brought in Joshua Johnson um, from the radio space, uh, Katie Fang, one of the great legal minds. So we'll continue to do that um, because we think that it allows us to tap into brand new audiences and hopefully that'll uh, help uh, bring uh, audiences to our overall portfolio. When I was reporting out that report on Jen Psaki, one of the things I noted was that because you have a lot of streaming platforms, you're able to give some of these talents their own shows, or some of these officials their own shows. Is that going to be the new norm, that people walk in the door and they expect to have their own streaming show? Or do you think that it's just going to continue to be sort of like linear TV, where it's still a prized possession? Look, I think, um, again, the ecosystem that's developing in the digital space, we're seeing so many of these new platforms. It just provides more space. Streaming is one of them. Audio and podcast is another place that we are seeing a tremendous amount of audience uh, move towards. And so it, it, we have much more real estate in this day and age than we did in the old days where we just had you know, a, a, a grid during the day and a few hours in the morning and a few hours at night. Uh, I don't want to say that we have an infinite amount of inventory, but we have a lot more inventory. And we think that's great for audiences because they'll be able to tap into to new, uh, new people that may be of interest to them. And that's hopefully something we'll be able to, to contribute to over time. So while we're on that topic, Rachel Maddow, who has for many years hosted your 9 p.m. hour on MSNBC, sure. the highest rated hour on the network, 
has renegotiated a contract to expand her portfolio. She's going to be doing documentaries and podcasts. Are those the types of conversations that you're having with staff across the board from TV? They want to get into this other stuff? So um, Rachel uh, is, is a great example of someone that's going to be with us for, for so many years. And it's a great example of our distribution, uh, our digital approach um, has at the center of it what we call our omni-channel strategy. And what do I mean by that? It means we want to make sure that we have our content being distributed to our audiences on all of the platforms in all of the places that they're choosing to consume their information and, uh, and their news. And so when you think of someone um, like Rachel who has a large engaged following that wants to hear more from her, we're in the great situation where we can have someone like her contribute on our cable network and we can have her also now begin to be part of our streaming platform and we can have her uh, build content for podcasts or audio and she can build long form uh, or documentary type information for topics that uh, require or, or merit deeper investigative work. Uh, and so that's one great example. We're doing that with a lot of talent. Jim Cramer from CNBC is someone we're expanding to the direct to consumer space. Um, Andrew Ross Sorkin, one of our great talent at CNBC is now been tapped to do a long form show on NBC News Now. So we can do it just not with talent, we can do it with brands. Um, in our particular case um, at, at NBC News, uh, we have the Today Show. And so people think of the Today Show as the morning show. But the Today Show in many ways has evolved over the years um, to be almost like a lifestyle brand. And so we touch to a number of topics. Yes, we touch news, but we touch lifestyle, entertainment, home, family, health issues. And so we're able to now take with this omni-channel approach, we're able to take something like the Today Show and expand it into streaming, where we now have Today All Day, which is a 24-7 streaming platform uh, around Today and many of these topics. Um, we're able to have our, our talent, like Hoda Kotb, launch a phenomenal podcast. One of our other talent on the Today Show, Jenna, uh, Jenna Hager-Bush, um, has a book club. So it allows us to play in a lot of different places, and so we think that is certainly one of the uh, directions where the, the industry is going, and so it's a place where talent and brands and franchises, they matter more in an omni-channel uh, ecosystem. And we think, look, this is a win for our talent um, and brands because they have access to broader audiences. We think it's a win for our audiences because they can get more of, of the people and the brands that they love, and it's a win for us as well. I know you probably can't address it, but I have to ask. Sure. While we're on the topic of Rachel Maddow, do you have any sense of who's gonna be replacing her at that 9 p.m. hour, any hints you could give us? Um, Rachel's going to be with us uh, for, for a long time, and we're going to see more of Rachel, not less. Fair enough. Okay, so let's talk about the talent. You know, journalists, they require a lot of time to do research and to make calls. Do you ever worry about spreading certain people, not brands, but spreading people too thin if you're assigning them all these different types of things across the platform? Look, we have, uh, we have incredible journalists who have tremendous bandwidth, um, and so clearly ensuring that we're resourcing um, our teams in the proper way to make sure that we're feeding all of these different platforms in the proper way uh, is absolutely something that's top of mind for us. But at the end of the day, I think, and, and hopefully you would agree with this, I think our team of journalists love the ability to be able to, to reach audiences on so many more platforms. Um, and so yes, there's a little bit more that they need to do, but that ensure that, that requires us really on, on, uh, on, on the corporate side to ensure that we're giving as much resources, resources as we can to all of the emerging platforms. Speaking of the corporate side, for those of you who don't know, Caesar runs a news division across NBC, which includes NBC News, MSNBC, and CNBC. So how many people are within that whole entire news group? Uh, we have a little over 3,000 plus folks wow. uh, in our news organization. Globally? Yes. And I wanna talk to you about the biggest story that all of them, all 3,000 of them, are really focused on right now, which is Ukraine. You all have folks on the ground yeah. in Europe Walk me through how you're thinking about that in terms of safety mm -hmm. and also in terms of the content that you're providing for your viewers. What are they expecting? Yeah, so, um, you know, the reports that we're seeing out of the Ukraine, um, even since yesterday, are, are horrific. Uh, you know, when this crisis in Ukraine started a few weeks ago, I think the first thing that came to mind for me was that it was a reminder of uh, how fortunate we are to live here in, in the United States. Um, as we've witnessed millions of Ukrainians 
uh, leave their democratic society out of fear of being ruled by an autocratic society. Um, I, those events have personal resonance for me as I think they have uh, for so many people around the world. My mom uh, left Cuba in the early 1960s when Fidel Castro was tightening his grip on that island country. And my two younger brothers and I were born here in the United States and we grew up in Miami uh, among a diaspora that understood firsthand what, uh, what an important role uh, a free press played in a democratic society and they understood that that's something that could be lost. It could be lost as quickly as within a generation. And so growing up, uh, I, I I, I grew up with a very deep respect and understanding for the role of journalism in a democracy. And so these events are very personal for me as I know they are for many others. Um, as it relates to, to Ukraine, I think there's a, a number of dynamics, um, uh, as we all know. We have the military confrontation, of course. We have the humanitarian crisis that continues to evolve and is heartbreaking. Uh, and of course, the broader geopolitical ramifications. So as we look at all of those different issues, we look at them through a variety of different lenses. So for example, we look at them through the lens of the Russia-Ukraine relationship. Certainly, uh, the short-term change in their relationship, but more importantly, where does that go in the long term? And something that's become painfully obvious to all of us over the last few weeks is that this is going to be a crisis that's gonna go for a long time. So we are preparing for, uh, for, the, um, uh, for the long haul. Uh, and so, um, you know, th that's, uh, you know, that's, that's something that's, um, that is extraordinarily important for us uh, to make sure that we think through what is that situation um, on, on the ground there. Obviously, the war has been a boon for, you know, engagement with audiences. This is something they really care about. Ratings are up. Um, is there a concern that once audiences stop engaging to the same extent that they were at the beginning of the war, there's not going to be as much of a commercial incentive to keep driving that coverage? Um, no, I think this is, uh, this is an incredibly important, uh, incredibly important issue. Um, I think people realize that you know, uh, this is having geopolitical ramifications. Um, we talked about the Russia-Ukraine lens that we're looking at this through. Um, I, think, I think it's also important we're looking at this through the United States and NATO alliance uh, lens. Um, the alliance, um, clearly at the beginning of this crisis, has uh, stayed very strong and unified. As this crisis emerges, we wanna make sure that we're watching to see does that alliance strengthen, does that alliance show any cracks? And I think another lens that you know, people are increasingly talking about is the role of China. Um, we saw some of this coverage early on in, uh, in the crisis. We think going forward, this is going to be an important part um, of the crisis. But, but I think, uh, to, your, to your question, I think on the ground reporting, the reason I think this is important for, um, for our audiences and, and for the world is it is not lost on us that this war in Ukraine is almost like a, like a, it's like a prism into the state of journalism today. Um, in, uh, in many ways, we are seeing the bravery and the courage of our incredible journalists and, and so many of our peers uh, in journalism as well who are on the ground in harm's way. And this is a very, very different war than what we've seen recently. Um, you know, and that's caused us to revisit some of our assumptions as far as preparation. Uh, I would tell you um, a quick example. Uh, from a security perspective, in the more recent crises we've seen overseas, uh, our preparations for security of our teams usually is based on the assumption that we have some proximity to U.S. military presence. That is not the case in Ukraine. And so that has, uh, that has forced us to be much more focused and, uh, and thoughtful as it relates to preparations of uh, of, uh, of security. Um, I think you know, another dynamic we're dealing with is the proliferation of misinformation and disinformation that we're seeing in our society. Uh, we're seeing in the microcosm of Ukraine um, from a number of different fronts. At the beginning of, uh, of this crisis, um, we were receiving a lot of information, uh, footage, uh, video and the like from social media as well as individuals on the ground. And we have an entire uh, social media team uh, dedicated to just vetting and ensuring that the information uh, that we're putting out is, is verified. At the beginning of this crisis, in the first few days, the overwhelming majority of the information that we were receiving, seven, eight out of 10 of the, of the videos, were fake or doctored. Wow. And so, um, you know, in many ways, what we were receiving was, was, was counterfeit news, right? It's, you know, someone was, like in any counterfeit situation, someone had created or recreated something that was very valuable um, but with the intent to deceive, deceive or defraud. 
And so, you know, this, this topic is taking up much more bandwidth and resources from us um, than, in, than in, a regular, um, in a regular situation. You know, and I'd say maybe the last dynamic we're dealing with is, is, is this proliferation of places where audiences in the region, here in the United States or overseas, um, the places that they're getting their news, they're getting more news, they're getting their news faster, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting better news. And so ensuring that it's real and it's accurate is, is fundamental. So for us at the news group, what we're focused on um, is really taking the incredible work of our courageous journalists on the ground. How do we decipher fraud, um, I'm sorry, fact from fiction, and, uh, and then ensure we disseminate it across all these emerging platforms, in our particular case, across our broadcast TV networks in English and Spanish, um, our cable networks, our digital, social, mobile uh, uh, platforms, and of course, our emerging streaming platforms as well. There's been a huge push, not just in terms of how you're managing this from sort of a business and resources side, but a content push at NBC to cover misinformation. I've noticed that you've hired a lot more internet culture reporters, people who dive into this specifically. Is that one area that you're gonna to continue to go deeper on? What are other areas of content that you guys are gonna go bigger on? Let me, let me address this misinformation and disinformation because I think this, this is important. Um, when you look at the state of journalism right now, I would say from a macro perspective, um, I think what's been reinforced over the last few years is the vital and important role that a strong and independent media plays in, uh, in a democracy here in the United States as well as, as overseas. And so that's from a macro perspective. I think we have some real strengths in our industry right now. Um, and, and one thing I would point out uh, as an example is we are, um, we are, we've been, what's been, what's been seen over the last two years is that covering increasingly complex issues like the pandemic, like the economic crisis, like social justice, um, leading all the way up to the, uh, to the war in Ukraine. Covering those complex issues requires extraordinary expertise by our journalists uh, to ensure we're covering these issues uh, uh, correctly. It requires extraordinary resources um, uh, to, to ensure that we're covering them comprehensively. And in many cases, it requires extraordinary courage for our journalists to be on the ground and authentically uh, talk, talk about these issues. Um, and so it, it, in many ways, we, we all like to think news has always been important. It feels that news is more consequential at, at, at this uh, moment in time. And in many ways, we, we, we like to say that in, in our media industry, our journalists and our news teams are our version of first responders. They have never stopped working. They have never stopped going towards the crisis, towards the fire. And so we're very proud of that. So I think the core of the character of our journalism industry is strong. At the same time, to your question on misinformation and disinformation, I think we're dealing with a fundamental challenge, and that is trust in our institutions here in the United States, including the news media. And so um, we, we believe passionately that um, this is a topic that we all have to do our part. Um, there's no silver bullet to, solve, to solving it, uh, and it's not something that'll happen overnight. In, in our particular case, we're trying to do a few things because we think it's important to be proactive around this, around this topic. You know, clearly um, an area of focus for us is our overarching mission, focus on facts, um, accuracy, holding uh, those in power accountable, holding ourselves accountable to make sure that we get things right. Um, but I think there are some other tactics that we are trying uh, to, to implement to address this issue of trust. Uh, and misinformation. Um, you know, first is we are big believers that newsrooms have to represent all of the communities that we are serving here in the United States. And so what does that mean? We think our newsrooms have to have diversity of gender, diversity, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of geography, diversity of socioeconomic backgrounds, diversity of experiences, perspectives, and the like. Um, we think that helps us serve our audiences better and reach broader audiences. Um, you know, I, I, we think ensuring that we have, um, yes, there's gonna be increasing subscription services coming out of news organizations such as ourselves, such as you all, um, but we think it's equally important to offer free, free access to world-class journalism from news uh, organizations that have high rigorous standards to the broader population. If we don't do that, we run the risk that over time, large portions of the population who may not be able to afford subscription services may be left with only what's out there in social media, and worse, 
um, some of the misinformation and disinformation that's, that's out there. I, I, I would say a last thing that we are trying to, to really lean into is we are trying to utilize the very same technologies and platforms that have been used over the last few years to disseminate misinformation and disinformation. We believe we have to use those very same platforms to disseminate uh, world-class journalism with high standards, hopefully trying to reach some, uh, some of those audiences. So none of these uh, are a silver bullet and none of this will, uh, will, will happen overnight, but we all have to focus on what we can control. And those platforms, I'm assuming, are Facebook and TikTok and all of that? Absolutely. All, all of those emerging platforms. I wanted to follow up with you on the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion. You have a stated goal that you want NBC to <clears> reach 50% of your staff as women, 50% multicultural. But you have never said when you want to hit that goal. Like, where does that stand? And when should we expect to see that you hit that? Sure. Um, so as, as a little bit of context for everyone, um, in the last census, I hope everyone saw, in, uh, in 2020, the United States hit uh, an important milestone. Uh, for the first time, people under the age of 18 who were also people of color crossed the 50% threshold of the population. The overall US population will cross that 50% threshold as well in the coming years. So when we saw that data, we had a choice. We could either be uh, a future-focused organization or we could be an organization that let change happen to us and then tried to catch up. We chose the former. And so um, with that in mind, we did launch the 50% Challenge Initiative um, with that aspiration that over time, one out of every two of uh, our news team members would be women, one out of every two would be people of color. Um, we are not putting a timeline on it because we want to make sure that we have sustainable and systemic change over time. We are about to hit the two-year mark um, this summer. Um, we had great progress um, in the first year, and our goal is to ensure that we're moving um, the needle every single year, but doing it in a thoughtful um, um, manner uh, throughout that. We think that, yes, this is the right thing to do, but we also actually think this is the right thing to do for our businesses. To touch a little bit on the topic before, this will allow us to tap into new audiences. It'll allow us to touch topics and issues that are on the minds of our uh, audiences in a more authentic way than we would otherwise. I want to push back on something. The news media industry has traditionally lagged in terms of diversity, in part because there's been a lack of accountability. So many of these companies have been privately owned, and so they haven't had to report out data about you know, diversity and equity mm -hmm. and inclusion within their companies. So how can we hold NBC accountable to that goal if we don't know when the end date is, if we're not reporting out mm -hmm. metrics? Sure, so um, it, it's, it's a very fair question, and the way we address it is we leaned into transparency. So when we announced the 50% initiative, we opened um, our, our record on this. So we announced publicly that at the time, we were at 27.5% of our teams were people of color. And uh, we've committed to every year um, give the results and the progress, and that is what we did last year. Uh, when we hit the one-year mark, and we went a step further. We broke it down um, by uh, ethnicity, how we were doing in each one. So I think the answer to the question is transparency. And um, we're going to hold ourselves accountable, uh, and we're holding ourselves accountable publicly. And so we think that's an important thing to do, and, and we hope others uh, in the industry will continue to do their part. I hope so, too. As we think about this conference, thinking about trending tech, I want to pick your brain about streaming specifically. So NBC News Group has a few streaming services. <clears throat> all of them are free and ad supported. First of all, I know you said that free was important because it keeps things widely accessible. But can you walk me through the decision not to put things behind a paywall? And I'd love your thoughts on CNN's decision to put theirs behind a paywall. <clears throat> sure. So. Um As we were looking at, um, at the evolving nature of our, 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 our media space, clearly um, consumption patterns started to shift uh, over the last few years. Uh, the pandemic didn't change consumption patterns, it just accelerated trends that we were, uh, we were already seeing. And there's uh, probably two fundamental things that are driving change in our industry. One is uh, demographic change, which we touched on a little bit. Um, and we've made big investments there uh, and have prioritized that. The second is technology has changed consumption patterns, and this is the other area of, of, uh, of investment for us. Streaming is where people are moving as far as consumption. So over the last few years, the habits 
of consumers and streaming as it relates to entertainment content um, have been pretty much set. Um, we all know Netflix, Disney Plus, Peacock, which is our NBC Universal streaming service, the HBO Maxes, Hulus, Plutos, et cetera, et cetera. When you look at the consumption patterns of uh, audiences as it relates to news in streaming, those habits are just recently starting to be formed. So that's why a couple of years ago we moved so aggressively to invest in the streaming um, ecosystem. And so our first investment was to, uh, was to strengthen and launch our NBC News Now streaming platform that you alluded to. It is our 24-7 um, news uh, offering. It is um, hard news, breaking news, general news, no perspective. Um, available, broadly distributed, uh, as you alluded to, Sarah. Um, we also believe that, um, that ensuring that uh, our audiences have access uh, to that world-class journalism is, is important for the reasons we talked about before. Um, as it relates to your question about uh, free versus subscription, in our particular case, we anchored our investment around NBC News Now. We then launched uh, Today All Day, which is our 24-7 streaming network around the, around the Today franchise, and that is also off to a great, uh, a great start for us. But we also felt that it was important to bring some of our content uh, around MSNBC, and we just announced recently that we're gonna be putting MSNBC on Peacock, and to be uh, specific, that will be behind the Peacock paywall. Um, and so in our particular case, we think it's uh, important to offer that, uh, that uh, variety to our audiences of both free as well as, as subscriptions. You came from Telemundo prior to this role. Where does the news from Telemundo fit into this whole atmosphere? Sure. Um, well, you know, uh, Telemundo has, uh, has an incredible um, history of, of, of journalism on, on a variety of fronts, and, and, and it is part of our NBC Universal um, group. There's a tremendous amount of collaboration. I loved my time at Telemundo and, uh, and at Spanish language media overall. Uh, it, it was an incredible experience, and it, and, and it helped me in so many ways in this role. Um, I'd say, you know, the, the fact that it gave me a front row seat for so many years to the demographic tsunami that the Latino uh, community is here in the United States, um, it is driving the large majority of our population growth over the last decade here in the United States, particularly with the younger demographics as it, as it skews so young. Um, we, we dubbed it at the time at Telemundo the 3M generation. It's a generation that's millennial, it's a generation that's multicultural, and it's a generation that's mobile. And so that uh, understanding the tastes, the habits of, uh, of, that, uh, of that audience uh, has certainly helped inform uh, my experience in the news group as it relates to developing new services, attracting younger audiences, and the like. Um, I think Telemundo's news um, experience was also great because yes, we covered events and news here in the United States, but we also covered um, uh, a big proportion of our time uh, with news outside of the United States. So before we had the war in Ukraine, um, over the last year or so, we had a crisis in Venezuela, we had a crisis in Cuba, we've had complex events in Mexico and Peru and the like. And so the experience of covering issues in markets outside of the United States where it is complex for journalists Western journalists to operate has been a good ex, uh, has been a good experience. Um, in addition to you know understanding secur security concerns, uh, I, I think the other great experience about Telemundo for me is, is that it's it's been a reminder um, that great talent can come from all corners of an industry. And so in our case, we are tapping into the bilingual talent that we have at Telemundo in front and behind the camera to help us at the news group tap into new audiences and appeal to new audiences uh, in English language. And so that's been a great collaboration for mm -hmm. us. Jose Diaz-Balart coming into yeah. MSNBC. But I guess my follow-up question to you on that is, why doesn't Telemundo have you know, its own type of news streaming service? Is that something you're ever thinking about? Yeah, we, we think um, there's a tremendous hunger for news uh, in the Hispanic uh, media space and the Spanish language space. Uh, and so Telemundo will continue to, to invest and, uh, and diversify into, into all of these emerging platforms. Speaking of the emerging platforms, one of the core struggles for people like you who have to manage linear TV networks as well as digital opportunities is how do you measure success? You know, in the linear TV world, we know ratings matter. In digital, 
everybody has a different measurement platform, everybody has a different metric of success. How are you thinking about measuring success in digital as it compares to TV? Yeah, um, th this is an emerging topic and something that um, I think will be refined over time. But to your point, um, you know, clearly in the linear space, we have more, um, more specific metrics that have been followed for years. Um, not that that is less important, but it's becoming less important. Um, I think reach um, on, on the digital front is important. I think engagement levels, uh, how passionate are our audiences about the content that they're seeing in digital is something we can track um, uh, a lot better. And I think the ability to attract um, broader and diverse audiences uh, is, is fundamental. Um, I, on that last point, the launch of NBC News Now, we talk about it from an editorial perspective, maybe from a business diversification perspective, but one of the things that has been so fundamental for us uh, with the NBC News Now experience, in traditional linear television, um, for any news outlet, news broadcast, cable news networks, the average age of viewer is 60 plus years old. Um, for us on our NBC News streaming platform, the average age is about 35 to 40 years old. So it's not 18 years old, but for us to be able to have launched um, a new platform at scale, which is growing exponentially, that is now a generation younger, um, is a big step forward for us. And so that's another way that we're thinking of uh, of our, of, of our success and, and, and measuring our, uh, our performance. And how should I be thinking about measuring your success as a reporter? Do you have metrics around, you know, obviously because it's not paid, it's not really people that subscribe to the service. So how do you quantify how many people are either engaging with the service or how many people it's reaching? Uh, on, on the streaming front, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, we have, we have metrics, we have monthly. Um, like what are they? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, monthly uh, viewers, mm -hmm. monthly visitors, making sure that, yeah, there's an, a, a certain amount of time that they're spending. Mm -hmm. um, but on, on the free basis, that's the way we're doing it. On the subscription basis, going forward, once we launch MSNBC, obviously looking at the number of subscribers that, that we are contributing to, uh, to Peacock mm -hmm. will be a metric as well. And do you have like a number of monthlies for NBC News Now or any of those? Uh, not, not off the top of my mind, but something we can get you. But it's in the tens of millions of people that are, that, are, that are visiting on a monthly basis. When it comes to the job that you do, it's overseeing all of these different things, and it's overseeing 3,000 people. My last question quickly before we wrap up, what is NBC News' return to office plan? How are you guys managing it? How are you thinking about it? Yeah, return to office, I think, uh, obviously has been a top of mind uh, topic for all of us. Um, the last two years have been extraordinarily challenging for all of us as organizations, very challenging for all of us as, as individuals. Um, you know, and so as, that, as it relates to, um, to return to office, um, I think the last two years we've learned a tremendous amount. I'd say what are th new things that we've learned that we will be applying. Clearly a hybrid, flexible work environment is a net, net positive. We think this is uh, great for work-life balance um, and this will be an ongoing part of our culture. Um, you know, I think uh, a second thing we've learned is there are certain technologies that are available to us that we weren't maximizing before. Take something like CNBC. In the old days, we used to just assume every guest had to come into the New York studio or DC or, or one of the bureaus. Um, we were forced for a long time to do it via video. And you know, what it's allowed us to do is bring in uh, speakers, guests, that from different parts of the country that maybe we wouldn't have had the opportunity to bring in. So that's been fantastic. That will be um, something that we do going forward and a lesson learned. At the same time, I think the last two years have reminded us of certain things that we need to get back. Um, you know, the first thing is, I think it uh, reminds us that, that there is power in proximity. Uh, for us in, uh, in the news uh, industry, ensuring that our journalists have the ability to go out and physically be on the ground to cover a story is fundamental. And so the analogy for us, I think, in the office is in an environment, in a newsroom where creativity, um, collaboration, and, uh, and, and engagement is so fundamental, we are stronger together. And so uh, the power of proximity is very, very um, clear in our heads and something we wanna recreate. And I'd say the last thing that's on our minds Sarah, as it relates to return to office, is, is our young, uh, the young members of our teams. Um, we've had hundreds of people join our news group since the pandemic started who have never set foot in our office, who have never been exposed to our culture in our, in our newsroom. Uh, 
ensuring that those individuals, just like we all did early in our careers, how did we learn? We learned through observation, through osmosis, through volunteering, um, through being mentored by our senior colleagues. That has not happened in the same manner, and we are concerned um, that that's not a good thing for our young team members in their uh, development of their careers. It's not good for us as an industry, so that's something that's top of mind for us as well. I, def I know I definitely feel that way about making sure I have that power of proximity. Um, Cesar, thank you so much for taking the time today. You know, some of the things that you mentioned, I love that you dropped the names Jim Cramer and Sorkin. Reminder that CNBC has some of these cross-platform plat uh, personalities too, not just Maddow. I thought it was interesting that you said 70 to 80 percent of the videos coming in about the war at the beginning were actually misinformation that you all had to vet. Um, super interesting what you were saying that it's important to think about this crisis as being something that's long term yeah. and that we're going to be going through for many years. I love the three M's of the multicultural, millennial, and mobile audience from Telemundo that is a reflection of the streaming audience today. Tens of millions of people watching news across your streaming platforms. Um, and you know, at Axios, we like to end all of our newsletters on one fun thing. So I have just a quick one fun thing for you. What's one show across all of your platforms that isn't getting enough attention that we should check out? Um, Yellowstone. If you haven't checked out Yellowstone on Peacock. But Bob Backus isn't going to want to take that back? Mm, no comment. <laughs> Cesar Conde, chair of NBC News Group, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. Good morning, and welcome to the inaugural Axios What's Next Summit. I'm Mike Allen, a co-founder of Axios. And when Roy Schwartz and Jim Vandehei and I started with a big idea, we couldn't have imagined this summit. So thank you. We appreciate those of you who are joining us virtually around the world and those of you who are joining us here in person. Wherever you are, we'd love for you to join the conversation. Hashtag what's next summit. What's next summit is our hashtag. We're going to bring you some of the le world's leading thinkers and doers on the future of work, tech, money, cities, and my favorite, electric everything. Our themes today, as Jim Vandehei mentioned at the top, are at the heart of Axios journalism. From the very beginning, we've said, we're gonna make you smarter, faster on the topics that are changing the world over the next five to 10 years. And now here we are with the CEO talking to a robot. I wanna to pause to salute the amazing Axios events team. A year ago, Kristen Burkhalter, one of our great Axios leaders, said, we're doing this. A year ago, it wasn't so obvious that this was a good idea. But for one year, her team never considered the possibility that it wouldn't happen, and so it did. Like a lot of things in life, if you wait till it's obvious, you're too late. And so, applause for Axios events. Our first guests have worked together around the world. Laureen Powell Jobs is the founder and president of the Emerson Collective, where the big idea is helping everyone live to their full potential. Jose Andres, chef, chef humanitarian, founder of the World Central Kitchen, his big idea, feeding the many. They need no introduction, so in the spirit of Axios Smart Brevity, I won't introduce them. Lorian Powell Jobs, Jose Andres, welcome to that Axios What's Next Summit. Thank you for Thanks, doing Mike. this. Pleasure. Chef, welcome. How are you? So, Jose Andres, you were just tweeting from Ukraine and Poland, and our friend Steve Case, who's sitting up here, said to me, he's going to blow you off. I cannot do this to Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to be with her, I show up, period. It's a, uh, it's a good rule, and this is such a treat uh, for our audience because this is the first full day Jose Andres has been in Washington, D.C. since February 27th. So thank you very much for making that possible. <laughs> Maureen, you were just in Poland with Jose. Tell us what you were hoping to do and what you saw. Um, we were, thank you. Thanks for having both of us, Mike. Um, we, we were visiting the um, Polish border with Ukraine and the World Central Kitchen team. Um, I, 
and we wanted to see if we could be um, helpful, mindful, uh, and uh, present for refugees and understand mm. what was happening. We also had time with the World Food Program in Krakow. But when we went to Przemysl, where the central kitchen is, for World Central Kitchen, for that, that part of uh, the border crossings, what we found was astonishing. The world, and I'll just talk for a minute, and of course I'm talking about Jose's work, so he speaks about it much better than I, but the World Central Kitchen had set up an extraordinary kitchen in a warehouse in, in the town of Shemesh um, that, was, that was glistening so perfectly clean with giant, giant um, round cooktops and stoves and then these convection ovens and a walk-in refrigerator and freezer. And there were hundreds of volunteers and chefs from all over the world who were at task making food. There were people making homemade applesauce for baby food and packaging that. There were people who were making giant vats of borscht and there was a giant one of paella and it was, and the kitchen smelled heavenly. And it was just such a beautiful, beautiful moment in this kind of in the middle of a maelstrom where you have in the town of Shemesh, a town of 60,000 people that have seen 800,000 refugees come through in a month. And they, they coordinated them, they embraced them. The whole population of the town actually is housing a family or two, and that's widespread, of course, across the country. They, they, they meet them with dignity and care, and, and it's really kind of this, this mom, very, very touching moment of the best of humanity in the midst of the worst possible circumstances. Yeah, you mentioned mindfulness. I wonder what it was like for you. For me? Um, well, when you speak of refugees, perhaps that, that connotes some, some image in your mind, but these particular refugees were, by and large, young mothers and each, and the and children. So each woman there had, had multiple children. Uh, the people in the town had brought cribs and strollers and toys, and, and kids were running around being kids, you know, taking toys and sharing and playing, and they had nursery schools set up, and they had little learning centers and little book areas, but at the same time, um, obviously people had, had run from their homes. Everyone had a kind of a small suitcase with them. And we spoke yeah. to a number of the women who were just, just completely, obviously, shell-shocked, talking about the heartbreak and the shock of, of what they had just experienced and who they had left behind, which is typically uh, their husbands. And some had um, sons who they left behind. And uh, it, it felt, obviously, um, heartbreaking and uh, and unnecessarily brutal, and it, and for me as an observer, it also felt shocking that in this in this time of 2022, the whole world is witnessing this utter destruction of of people and community and and uh, cities and towns um, that were previously actually just flourishing. And Jose, just in the last few days, you've seen the worst of it. So you've been to Bucha, you have been on roads where you had to worry about mines. Tell us about the turn this story has taken in the last 72 hours. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the 72, last 72 hours has been um, a celebration for the people of of Ukraine, especially for the people of Kyiv, because you could see that they were to a degree relieved that the battle for Kyiv has been won by the Ukrainian troops. Um, Kyiv was very intense. First, when I went in uh, 10 days ago, um, 
to, to access Kiev, you have to go almost over 50, 60 checkpoints. And I arrive at 3 a.m. in the morning when curfew starts at 9. And, and you have to be telling them that you are there with organization that does food. And in every checkpoint, they tell you you are not going to go through. But mm. you keep showing photos of what you do and maps of what we were doing. And every checkpoint opens up. But, uh, but the checkpoints, they don't recognize you. They don't recognize anybody. They are defending their city. They are. And I learned the value of a city without walls, uh, which is a very difficult city to attack, if you think about it, and a very smart way to defend. But the city without walls, what I saw was, as men and women were fighting the war, uh, with many other people fighting the war other ways. It's what we say, we, we are fighting the war with people that come back, used to take care of giving extra help to the hospitals, arriving with wounded men and women and children, uh, people that are fighting the war through food, the food fighters. Uh, there's many ways to fight the war. Uh, people can be looking at what happens and do nothing, or they can be fighting for what is right in many other ways beyond grabbing a gun. The last 72 hours was the moment that the people of Kiev and all the people of Ukraine began saying, we have a chance to win this, to defend our country. The day that they announced that um, the troops moved totally away from Kiev, you could see certain pride in everybody, but at the same time, they knew that this is only the beginning. Many people say this is phase two. For us to go Bucha, maybe was not the smartest thing to do in many ways, because Jews was barely liberated, but at the same time, fail was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. We're talking about men and women that, um, the same way Lorin describes the border, mainly a lot, of, a lot of women with children. In those towns, is the elderly or the super poor, people that had no money even to buy a, a bus ticket or don't own a car, and people that are so, so old or so sick that they cannot move and they stay behind. We had to go there because that's the people we were feeding. Over 30 days with no food, afraid to go out because if anybody moves, they will shoot you. That's a mother that you were an elderly woman walking, trying to grab something to eat. Those people will be shot as we saw in the images. And for me to arrive there and provide food to those people in Irpin, in Bucha, as maybe risky it was, we did it very well, very safe. And quite frankly, I will do it again every time. Right now, we are moving north as all the cities are being liberated and the army is moving out. We are arriving there with thousands of hot meals and bags of food so people have in every family for a few days until the private sector reopens again, supermarkets reopen again, which is going to take a few weeks. What's it like to ride in a vehicle where you're worried about mines? Um, well, you, you follow procedure. We were well supported by, in this case, by the mayor of Irpin. Um, the division that helped retake Irpin, many of them were from Irpin and from Bucha. So while they are fighting the war, at the same time, they took time to say, these people are coming to feed our, our, our men and women. We're going to be helping them. So we, 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 were, we had protection. But obviously, you make sure that you don't move away from the roads. Uh, that you stay in the main road every time. If you have to maneuver back uh, a couple of times that you make the wrong turn, um, you make sure that you do it over the same road. You don't want to never to put yourself in any situation because they believe mines are all over. Mm. And unfortunately, until they are all clean, uh, all the roads are clean, it's going to take weeks, months, if not years. And Jose, when you show up in these areas, like sometimes you have propane tanks and yeah. like big cast iron pots, right? Like you show up, you travel light. Yeah, well, uh, Lorin described our kitchen in, in Shimish. Um, but when I arrived there, I think it was 48 hours after the war began, uh, uh, Sam, who, is, who always shows up in some of these things for Walsh and Kitchen, within 12 hours we were cooking. And people say, how are you able to be cooking within mm. 12 hours? Well, because we arrive and we find somebody's already doing it. We get alongside them and we say, can we, can we join forces? And most of the time, everybody will say yes. In the early hours of this begin, uh, that began, when began, you will see firefighters cooking with charcoal and wood, making these big pots 
in every single place that was people arriving 24 seven. And the firefighters were not firefighters anymore, but they were cooks. The people of Poland, for example, was unbelievable. In every single city, uh, uh, Lorraine has described the situation of this town. A small city with a mayor doing extraordinary things, right? Mm. So since we arrived, uh, by day three, we were in every border around Poland, inside. By day four, we began being inside Ukraine. By day six, we were almost in every country, Moldova, uh, Slovakia, Ukraine, um, Hungary, Romania. Uh, two weeks later, we, a week later, we opened in Spain. Before we knew, we were in 21 cities in Ukraine. Right now, we are doing around close to 300,000 meals a day. We are already on our way to 10 million meals. We are in every train station, in every bus station. We have cafes in every border pass 24 7. Uh, and right now, we have Nate Mook, the CEO of Old Central Kitchen, in one of the most difficult cities in Kharkiv in the north, feeding every shelter, feeding anybody that is in need of food. Um, this is very much what has been the operation the last days, the last few weeks. In, I was say one more on Ukraine, then yes, Lorraine, about your first big collaboration. You mentioned the last few days going back to the weekend have been a time of celebration as uh, Russians pulled back. But we've also seen a lot more about the horrible things that occurred, the tactics that were being used. How concerned are you that starvation is using, being used by Russia as a tactic of war? Well, it, it's, it's a concern. It's, food has been used for the history of humanity for, for very bad things. Um, and do you believe that's they, being done they here? Claim, they claim in some places that they are arriving themselves uh, with humanitarian aid. Even some soldiers will tell you that we had to be careful how we did the food because Russians will take advantage of feeding people, claiming that they are the saviors and they are the ones. It's so funny how everybody has, obviously, an opinion. But one thing is clear. Uh, Ukraine uh, is big producer of cereal. Um, if mm -hmm. we don't help Ukraine, it's a new Secretary of Agriculture. I was able to meet with him. Um, um, we asked Secretary Bilsak, we need to give Ukraine all the help they need to make sure that all the cereal for planting, all the pesticides or insecticides they need to make sure Ukraine keeps being the producing region uh, that it is, that they will be successful this year. If they are not successful this year, beyond all the horrors of war, we will see the Middle East, we will see other parts of the world, that the price of cereal will raise. Many of these Middle East countries will not be able to have enough cereal to keep feeding themselves, <coughs> then we will see all the other ramifications that a war like this creates. Hunger in the world will only increase. Many more millions will only increase. So this, this war that Ukraine is fighting for, they're fighting it on behalf of all of us. They're fighting for liberty, for freedom, for democracy, but they are also fighting for making sure that we can keep feeding the world. Jose, do you believe yeah. Russia is using starvation, hunger as a weapon of war? Uh, totally. What they are doing in Mariupol, we delivered one time to Mariupol 1,000 meals. The people that did it put themselves in huge risk. Um, the people are really hungry in Mariupol. They've not been allowing any humanitarian aid going in, but they've not been allowing even women and children leave in Mariupol. They've been shot. Uh, Red Cross has been trying to do it. So, sure, they are doing it. What they are doing in Mariupol is something like <coughs> nobody can be supporting. America, Europe, the rich countries of the world, they should stop right now from buying absolutely anything in terms of energy that is coming from Russia. We have one chance in history to show how you can play wars with true economic sanctions. So every company for profit, they should for once put real profits on the side and put all the pressure they can on Putin and the Russian government to starve them from money that allows them to keep paying for this war. I hope Europe, I hope America will stop buying any energy that comes out of Russia. If this is the sacrifice in Europe, we have to go. Maybe I don't have hot water today. I think that's a sacrifice we all can do. We cannot allow what he's doing in Ukraine right now. We need to do <coughs> more. I don't think we are doing enough. And that couldn't be any stronger. Lauren, in 2017, when Hurricane Maria Category 5 hit Puerto Rico, it was the worst U.S.-based disaster in, a history, in a century. 
and it was uh, the worst uh, hit for Puerto Rico ever. Jose was there, he was having trouble, and you showed up. Tell us what happened. Oh, goodness. Um, may I say one other thing, however, about, about the extraordinary, extraordinary um, impact and, and operational excellence of World Central Kitchen inside Ukraine and in the surrounding countries. When, when Jose says, you know, we're, we're doing 300,000 meals a day, he said that very quickly. Yes, yes. I want people to just pause and think about what that means. Those are hot meals, and they're often served in pop-up tents, in train stations, uh, on the actual border, many, many, many areas on the border, in cities, inside Ukraine, and they're awful, often served on tables with tablecloths or small coverings. Dignity in for those guests. Correct. The dignity is so deeply moving and so important. And so, so he's not talking about MREs. He's actually talking about a home-cooked meal. And for people who are hungry and cold and traumatized, the power of a home-cooked meal it is not to be um, exaggerated. So I wanted to make sure that that visual came through because it's so much heart that is put behind this, so much love. And I think then when people receive that, they feel the love and the care that's put into the food. Um, so when, when um, we were together in Puerto Rico, I actually didn't know that, that Jose was having a difficult time. I knew it was extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. Um, well, he can set the stage about why things were so incredibly difficult. But um, what they did when they went to San Juan is they, they took over the sports arena, which, which often happens because that's, um, that's a, a center where, where food at scale is already made. So what World Central Kitchen does is in addition to having a network of chefs around, around the world, they also have a network of kitchens that perhaps didn't get destroyed by, by the catastrophe at hand. And in this case, because the hurricane um, destroyed so much of the island, there were a few kitchens in schools and the kitchen in the major arena that was still operational. So that's where they, they come in and they sort of send, send the message out to chefs and cooks. So, so a lot of people who are home cooks, who are, who are quite excellent, also end up coming up. And they work with other humanitarian organizations and other food providers and multilaterals, but sometimes it's difficult for, for UN to, to make the kind of pivot, to get the kind of supplies that's needed. It, it's a bureaucratic process. They come in for the long term, but the people who respond immediately are the people who are right on the ground who have the skills. And so when we, when we came to San Juan, we came to this amazing setup where we saw, we saw thousands and thousands of sandwiches being made. We saw vats of paella that I had, I had never seen this kind of capacity food at scale happen in this way that was so beautiful. And then what they had done for distribution because so many of the roads were destroyed, they actually used the, the US military for some of their distribution um, and they also used local food trucks. So, so food trucks would come to the arena and load up and then head out. And when Jose describes these maps, they have literal maps that are hanging all over the walls and, and they have population centers mapped out and they're very precise about how many people are where and how the distribution is happening. Um, and, and that very clever use of food trucks as distribution center and keeping food hot and also people who know the communities is very deliberate. So that, that arena that Lorraine described is an arena we were doing roughly 60,000 meals a day. 
um, the kitchen she described in Poland is a kitchen that we built to do half a million meals a day. We are far away from needing that, but for us it takes the same time to build a kitchen that you can do half a million meals a day, the one that you do 50,000 meals a day. So in these scenarios, never waste time, because it takes, you, it takes me the same to create a restaurant like minibar of 12 seats, that the restaurant in Disney of 600 seats. It's the same time, people. It's the same meeting. So if you're going <laughs> to meet, just meet to build something that's worth it. Um, so when Lorraine came, that was the main kitchen. But because gas was difficult and roads were difficult, uh, we went from 10 friends the first day at Jose Enrique to more than 25,000 volunteers. We went from the first kitchen to 26 kitchens. We had 10, 20 food trucks. We went from 1,000 meals the first day to almost 150,000 meals a day, specifically in the places that, that needed hospitals and other places that were hard hit. But you know what we do that is very powerful? We, we don't cook. We, cooking is easy. I mean, you understand, when you are with cooks, you are going to eat. The, 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 you are going to eat. You, you are with cooks. <laughs> what we do is we create distribution systems. Is it like we create our overfoods from scratch in a matter of days, where we produce, but more important, we distribute. And this is what makes us very different. And the urgency of now is yesterday. When Lorraine came, um, I cry often when I tell the story. I hope I will not today. Uh, was very powerful in more ways than one was very powerful in more, more ways than one because we were spending money we didn't have. We were spending money that is like, okay, we'll see how we pay for this shit. It looked like my restaurants that I opened them and then, oh, I'm gonna make money or no, but like hopefully I will pay the investors back. Hopefully Steve is still trying to make <laughs> sure that I pay him back on his investment. We are partners. Uh, Blurin too in ways in the private sector. But this is, is just crazy. You're doing an operation that you are not looking at how much money you have in the bank. Um, my credit cards are very gone by then. They give me a line of credit that my wife is like, that's great. We're not going to retire rich, Jose, like I told you. Uh, uh, <laughs> and Lorena mm -hmm. arrives and was used the connections with other people. Um, um, people like Ted Leonsis, I know many of them are partners in other enterprises where they are helping us, uh, all the people at the, at the wizards and the capitals from DC. And all of a sudden, they put together a whole bunch of people that they were not only supporting us financially in the short term, but with connections to other things that we could be needing. And this is why it's so important, these kind of things you do, this networking, knowing each other, every minute you spend with a person making sure that matters. Um, if we did Puerto Rico in many ways, when Lorraine and all her team of Emerson show up, is this moment like Amos is giving you this kind of, I've been a sailor in the Spanish Navy, and you cannot sail without wind. You don't see it, you cannot touch it. You cannot put it in, it's an intangible. But when someone comes and gives you wind behind the sails and you feel you can go anywhere, that's a very powerful thing to do. So obviously, uh, Lorraine has been a blessing in my personal life for more reasons than one, her team. But there's so many people, you in the room, we all can be always be that wind behind the cells in certain mm. moments. We all need to know when we become that wind. That wind is one of the things that really can be moving humanity forward. We all need to be wind sometimes. Uh, when you came, Lorraine, you were that wind. Mm. And and we've been working in many other things. I mean, Lorraine does so many things. I, keep, I don't keep up uh, <laughs> of what she does, uh, impacting in so many areas. In our work in World Central Kitchen, in many ways, we are doing what we're doing now. Remember Bahamas? We did 80,000 meals a day, people. We were the only ones on ground zero for 11 days. 80,000 meals a day. That's what we became. For me, it's even easier if nobody else shows up. Why? Because if they tell me, you have to feed everybody, you're like, great, let's do it. Uh, but anyway, this is what we've been doing since Puerto Rico. Even we began 11, 12 years ago in Haiti, really the big beginning of what World Central Kitchen has become. Mm 
mm -hmm. uh, was Puerto Rico in more ways than one. And since then, we keep learning and we keep improving and we keep maximizing our resources. And so far, we are still learning, but you know, uh, slowly but surely, we try to keep feeding in emergencies as many people as we can. And, and they learn a lot about, about what works, what can be done better, and to share that information with, with some of the, the global players is really, really important. Um, so I'd like to emphasize that, I, know, I mean, Jose has no problem speaking up to anybody, um, obviously, but it's really important for those who actually care about um, our connection from human to human as, as our sisters and brothers who, who are in times of, of trauma, and, trauma and catastrophe, to actually keep getting better and better. And I think that sometimes there is some of, some of the, um, the amazing UN organizations and everyone understands how difficult it must be to have that kind of um, global enterprise operating. Obviously, they can always get better. And to have the kind of nimble speedboat that is Jose and World Central Kitchen can really help the ocean liners course correct. And uh, nimble speedboat, that's great. And I went to add New Orleans. Yes. I land from Haiti earthquake. I land in New Orleans. And I had one person that seemed to know everybody in New Orleans. Everybody will give him a hat. He knew where the need was. We were able to be in Little Cayu within 24 hours, in Huma within 24 hours, in Low Nine within 24 hours. I can say almost the mistakes of what happened in Katrina were somehow so we were there feeling a lot of people. Who I had next to me as a translator, driver, a guy called Mayor uh, Mitch Landrieu. If you are in New Orleans, shit, you want to have Mitch Landrieu next to you. And especially if you are in New Orleans in an emergency, that guy knows emergency. I met Mitch Landry through an event that uh, Emerson did uh, and through Lorraine and all. Uh, having Mitch Landry in New Orleans next to us, it made World Central Kitchen so much better organization. That's why in my life I learned every connection, every moment, every opportunity to establish relationships is so important because down the road, especially when people need you the most, you never know when those friendships and those moments are going to help you to feed maybe entire city or to me feed the entire state. So every second counts, people. Always, every moment counts. Lori, you so. and Jose have so many shared <coughs> passions, including storytelling and journalism. But one of them is system redesign. And that's something that Emerson Collective is very focused on. What have you learned? What can we learn? from the joint work that you've done to feed people who need it? So um, a lot of what he's describing is, is a new design for a system. So new design for <clears throat> humanitarian response, for, for feeding at scale, for, but also using networks, using the kind of 21st century tools and technologies and relationships and networks that exist across the planet. And, and not to ignore those networks, and understanding also the wisdom that resides in communities. No one knows better than the people who actually live in a community mm -hmm. what the community needs. And, and having that mindset to actually tap into all the resources on the ground, both repurposing of assets, but also the human ingenuity that exists in every single pocket on this planet, it is in some ways, obvious and in other ways profound. Um, so so the, all the systems that touch humans in our arc of life, all of our social systems, they're all powered by networks. And so making sure uh, that you can get proximate enough to understand what the proper networks are and then having a holistic view of how do we actually activate all these networks from government and business and civil society and philanthropy and, and activism and arts and then communications and storytelling mm -hmm. and market. All of these come to bear and everybody has a role to play. And Jose, a precept that I've heard you talk a lot about that's related to this is involving local people. So you did a New York Times bestselling book, We Fed an Island, about your experiences in Puerto Rico. 
And there's a photo in there that really struck me. It was a human chain of people delivering hot meals. And so you, at every turn, you seem to recruit local cooks, local help. Yeah. I mean, uh, who better than the locals? Uh, we are thousands of people now in World Central Kitchen across Ukraine and the six countries. We are literally thousands. How many people I can fly in from outside? It's always better when locals involve themselves. In the process, you are creating resilience because when something happens, we are activated within hours. Is an earthquake in Puerto Rico right now? In six, uh, sometimes we need to stop them because in three hours, they are feeling everybody. I'm like, hold on a second. This looks like a party. Do they need it or not? They activate themselves because the lessons of the past, the locals are already learning the lessons. They know how to work with us. Mm. They are almost like our food militia in a way. They are not in our peril. They are not wall working with World Central Kitchen every day, every month, every year. But when something happens, they self-activate themselves like if they were a national guard of food. Mm. That's when, when we show up, one or two days later, three days later, we've already been feeding from the first few hours. This is kind of the resilience we've been able to be feeding. In Ukraine, some restaurants were obviously feeding people in need. Many restaurants were done, closed, because everybody, many people were moving out. Remember, we have four million people. Uh, I don't know now the exact number. I've not been looking for the last few, few weeks, but four. But we have many more million that they are uh, inside Internal Ukraine, displaced. that they've been displaced. And everybody seems to be doing something. What we began doing was picking up the phones. I'm like, hey, you're doing 100 meals a day, we see on Twitter. If we support you and we partner, can you do 500? And they're like, sure. Obviously, that's a trap. Because once they do 500 for three days, <laughs> next question is, can you do 1,000? You sprung the trap. And some of the best <laughs> restaurants, now we have close to 220 restaurants, I think, or something like that, or more, maybe, that every one of them, we are maximizing what mm -hmm. they do. And what happens is all the restaurants that were closed, they look what we are doing with others, and they call us, and they tell us, can we join you? So World Central Kitchen, in a way, and others, maybe they don't call us, and they do it on their own. So in a way, what we are is that, uh, you know like Hunger Games, if you saw that movie, that they do those videos of, this is very powerful, because you are calling others for act to action, and others that they are wondering, what can I do? All of a sudden, like, OK, I'm going to do what they do, or I'm going to join them. And so all of a sudden, why we can do so many numbers? so quickly, so fast? Well, the National Guard of Food. OK, remember <laughs> one thing. Wall Central Kitchen at this point, without any doubt in my mind, is the biggest organization ever created in the history of humanity. Yeah, sounds pretentious at, at least. <laughs> Why? In my brain, and has been always been the way I want it, created to be small and slim, but big as much as, as fast as we want. Every single restaurant in the world belongs to World Central Kitchen. Every warehouse with food belongs to World Central Kitchen. They don't know it yet, <laughs> but eventually it happens. Marcus Samuelson, one of my dear friends, an amazing chef with amazing story, mm -hmm. a great soul, he became big lead in all the meals in Newark, all the meals in Harlem, Marcus Samuelson took care during the pandemic. Marcus, once I saw him during the pandemic, one night, comes and gives me a hug and tells me, Jose, you remember two, three, four years ago that when we were having a meeting about how to engage World Central Kitchen that you told us, don't worry, the important thing is that you are here today in this meeting. The day we need you, mm. you will know. Marcus said, I don't understand. Jose doesn't want me to belong to this organization. He said that day I saw him in the streets in Harlem after doing hundreds of thousands of meals for his people there. He said, now I understand what you were trying to tell me. That's why I'm telling you World Central Kitchen to a degree is the biggest organization in the history mm -hmm. with the smallest payroll and group of people in the history of the same time. But if I need to grow that organization to 10,000 people overnight, we do it like this. This is what we are trying to do in World Central Kitchen. 
Elise is about to give us the hook, so we're going to do a little rapid round uh, here, uh, pull back the curtain, look at some of the other work that each of you are doing. Laureen, if you want to talk about a system redesign, public high schools have to be one of the biggest possible projects to take on. Emerson has XQ. Tell yes. us about it. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been working in education for over 25 years in and, and mainly working with high school students who have the ambition to go on to higher ed, but are generally first generation. So in their families and in their communities, they don't have um, a pathway that's, that's highly articulated necessarily. So that's, that's the work that we've done, and it's informed actually so much of all the work that I do in my life about how to use the tools in front of us to actually get, get access to the information and the pathways so that people can um, have a life of their own design. Um, so w with my colleague, Ruslan Ali, after she came out of the Obama administration, she also had a passion for data and high school and, and changing, changing the actual lived experience within high school and, and what people ended up graduating, knowing and knowing what to do and um, the capacities and, and foundational knowledges that, that everyone should have had. So we, we started with first principles thinking, what is it that we think everyone who graduates from high school should be able to do, should be able to know? You know when people say, problem solving or critical thinking. What does that really mean? And how do you mm. teach to that? Mm. And how do you teach to that when you have fixed math and then history and then science and then English? That's all is sitting in a seat, changing a class, sitting in a seat, changing a class. And while the, the, the work can be engaging, it's really quite siloed. And so we worked with amazing um, thought leaders, educators, um, administrators, students, parents, um, to, to architect a, a pathway by which communities can come together and actually create in a greenfielding way what they believe is the ideal high school for this moment. Because the way that high schools were structured 100 plus years ago was, was the structure for that moment in right. the early 20th century. But it actually doesn't work in, in the early 21st century so for so many reasons. So much of the world has, has changed in a fundamental way. Um, and then we had an open call across America for communities to come together and field teams to actually um, build out and redesign high schools that would educate students so that they can be uh, ready for, for career or college after high school and mapping onto the workforce demands in their local communities. And we ended up having, um, this was seven years ago, we ended up having over 10,000 people, all 50 states were represented. We had 700 teams that went through this seven month program of a designer for learning. And we ended up, we thought that we would end up funding and supporting five high schools that were new designs that, that could serve as a beacon and an example of what's possible. But we had so many amazing designs across the country. We, ended, we now have 27 XQ high schools in states um, like Texas and Tennessee and Michigan and Indiana and so five -ish. New York, yeah, yeah, five-ish, um, and and now uh, full districts are actually looking at at the new models of schools and have have a strong appetite to actually pivot and have completely different knowledge base and competencies as a result of of what they're seeing other other communities do. So it's, it's very, very exciting and optimistic work. Um, we, see, we see the repurposing of assets, like in, in the school in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, that is now a high school inside a museum in Grand Rapids that uses all of the artifacts in the museum as part of their learning. And then the one that I was mentioning in Indiana is in Indianapolis, 
It's called Purdue Polytechnic, and that high school is connected to Purdue University, and actually uh, Mitch Daniels was part of the design team wanting to answer the the, the gap in their, their workforce and, and, and teach students differently, and that one's about project-based learning and really oriented around kind of big challenges. We see one in, in uh, Louisiana that's actually oriented around studying coastal erosion and the effects um, of the change in climate on, on the low levels in the United States. And, just, you know, it makes learning absolutely relevant and very, very exciting. And so since we're still in early days, but the results are quite um, in, encouraging and, and uh, thrilling. Jose, we had to start heavy at the top, but so many people uh, in our audience associate you and your restaurants with happy times backstage. Sarah Fisher and I were talking about the time that at Haleo here in DC, uh, we had croquettes in a sneaker. Mm -hmm. That was your idea? Yeah. <laughs> In yeah. a sneaker, did but you say? Yes. It's just something I like to share much because everybody hits it's me real. on Instagram and Twitter, and I'm, now I say it's not my idea. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Okay, uh, so. Uh, but, but, but let me tell you what I did. Do you right? use other kinds of shoes? Yeah, <laughs> c campers, but. This gets me talking then to senators and congressmen when they come to my restaurants. And then I'm able to tell them why we don't end food deserts in America yesterday if Republicans and Democrats work together. Or why we don't have a food White House conference as when I had with President uh, Biden uh, town hall, uh, town hall uh, uh, that we were talking about how food could be what end many of the problems that we have in America and around the world and why we don't do a National Guard of food fighters so we can be there next to the poor people when they need it the most, and why we don't make food actually a true agent of change to make not only America a better place, but the world itself. So a sneaker like this gives me this opportunity to engage with those politicians and others to tell them if we can serve croquetas in a shoe, Imagine what else we cannot do if we put all of our minds together. Okay. I am Jose, Jose. and I endorse this shoe. <laughs> Real quick, because we're over our time and I'm going to get in trouble, but Laureen and I both want you to tell, backstage you said, I have to tell a story oh. about shooting. And I said, no. And you said, no, it didn't oh, begin that way. No, no, no. You told me something he's, about the scuba diving. Yeah, he said, he said, I want to ask you about scuba, but I think Jose heard shooting. And so he said, well, I actually have a funny story about shooting, okay. which uh, he promises so it's now he's tell. Well, but we began talking about diving, about going diving together, yes, because fair, Lorraine fair loves diving. I love diving, even with this body, I'm a great diver. <laughs> I went down on a submarine 500 meters in Galapagos with National Geographic. Um, and from the 500 meters down, uh, I mean, technically, I brought water with me, so I've been feeding people at 500 meters oh under goodness. the water. <laughs> but now, I don't know if you read, uh, I did one dish, paella, that is going to be served in the space station mm -hmm. in the next few days. Are you okay, connecting but the what dots? Is this so I fed people very in the bottom of the ocean. Oh. I'm feeding people at the top <laughs> of the space. <laughs> and then I'm in Kiev before curfew. And the alarm sounds in my phone. It's not a missile alarm. It's the space station alarm. Oh. Because the space station is passing through. I'm looking, oh my god, the space station. It's to my slide. Where do I go to? A checkpoint with eight military doing their job. I'm able to be away from the lights. The military comes. What are you doing? Ah, the space station. The guy looks, smiles. Ah, the space station. And then the space station. Me, I'm looking at the space station. He shoots something in Ukrainian down. Next thing, what happens? Everybody's shooting to this white thing, a star moving in the sky. Da, 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 da. They thought it was a drone. They thought they were. Kiev is a city super safe because even when people see, saw something moving like this, like it was a star, they will shoot at it. 
So between my love for scuba diving, going to the bottom of the ocean, to my love to feed on the space station astronauts, and my love to follow these, I almost created an international conflict. <laughs> when, when I tell the guy, why you were, I told you it was a space station. What the guy tells me, mm. we're Russians in the space station. I'm like, yeah, but they're astronauts. No. They're not military. No. Jose Andres, Morgan Powell Jobs, thank you for joining Axios What's Next. Thank Amazing, you. thank you. Energy. Our electrical infrastructure has to expand in order to address the climate crisis. We need electricity to power small things like this and bigger things like this. But before electricity can power everything, we need to find better ways of storing and moving it. And we need to figure out how the government and the private sector can work together to expand capacity. So here's what's next for this technology and infrastructure. Thank you very much for joining the Axios What's Next Summit. For those of you joining us virtually, we'd love for you to be part of the conversation with those of us here in DC. Hashtag Axios, uh, hashtag What's Next Summit. You could do it at Axios. Our next guest, Mary Barra, started a GM when she was 18. She was a co-op student at the Pontiac Motor Division, picked up a BS in electrical engineering, an MBA, she became a VP, an SVP, an EVP, and now she's the boss. Uh, she's uh, the chairman and CEO, Mary Barra. Welcome to Axios and the What's Next Summit. Thank you so much for doing this, for coming to DC. Uh, so I had a lot of fun out front in the cruise origin. Yes. So uh, I got inside, no steering wheel. Uh, we'd love for our guests to try it. Some of you did on the way in. Uh, we'd love for you to enjoy the cruise origin. But tell me how soon I'll see that around on the street. Well, uh, we're uh, in validation right now, so we'll be, uh, uh, the vehicle will be ready to put on the streets uh, early next year in January. So it's right around the corner and really is going to, I think, change the way uh, ride sharing, um, well, the way people enjoy ride sharing. And uh, how comfortable is it? Uh, you know, it's very comfortable. And I, I just recently, I was out last week and, and about a month before and taking rides. Uh, without anyone uh, in the front seat. And the ride, it's like riding with a very confident driver who pays attention to all of the laws. Uh, and uh, it's really a pleasurable experience. I'm, I can't wait for everyone to experience it. So Axios always starts with the news and breaking news this morning at 7.30 a.m. GM announced a partnership with Honda to make electric vehicles more affordable and Mary Barra, is this a way to bring electric vehicles to the mass market, or is that going a little far? No, I absolutely think it is. Uh, it, it, it really is an important play to bring not only scale, but speed to making EVs affordable for everyone. And if you look at uh, where the market is for new cars, uh, getting something that's under $30,000 makes it very affordable. So we're really excited. Honda's a great partner. We've done many things with them. So I think this is gonna be a really important path yet in this decade, in 27, we'll have a, a, you know, a attainable EVs available. Attainable EVs. Mm -hmm. And so is this uh, Joanne Muller, who you know well, uh, Axios uh, transportation uh, correspondent. Uh, we're chatting on the way in. She gave me uh, this question. She said, is this a way for GM to separate itself from Tesla and EV startups? I, I definitely think uh, to get, we, we have a very um, important goal that we are saying that by mid-decade, by 2025, we'll sell more EVs in the US than anyone else. And to do that, you need to have a portfolio of vehicles. Over four years ago, we invested in the Ultium platform, which gives us the ability to do a small vehicle like an Equinox or uh, the vehicle that we just talked about doing with Honda, all the way up to a super truck like Hummer. So if you can have a portfolio, that's how you're going to you know, really engage people in EVs. And so we do think um, that's gonna lead to a leadership position. So I think it will be uh, a distinguishing separation at that point in time. So 
can EVs scale? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're doing that today. The Hummer is rolling off factory zero. Uh, we have the Lyric um, that is coming from uh, uh, Tennessee in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Shortly, we'll have the Chevy Silverado also being built at factory zero. So we definitely can scale and we can do it quickly because we've invested in a platform called LTM. Uh, environmental groups say GM is blowing smoke, that you have limited offerings and there's a long wait to get them. Well, I think uh, we have the Bolt um, EV and EUV that we've started producing again this week, and I'm really excited because that vehicle was doing well before we realized there was a, a, uh, a rare but an issue with the battery from LG, and so we're, we've dealt with that. So we'll have the Bolt, the Bolt EV, we'll have the Hummer, uh, the Lyric, and th then it just rolls that we've said we'll have uh, over 20 EVs in the U.S. Uh, by 2025, so they're coming. Another thing you'll hear from skeptics is, okay, uh, come talk to me when you can make a $25,000 EV and when there are charging stations in every neighborhood. Well, uh, again, um, we've already announced that next year we'll have the Chevrolet Equinox EV available, and that's going to be around $30,000 starting price, so we're getting close. The project we announced today with Honda will get below that, so I think Check on number one, got that. And then uh, from a charging infrastructure perspective, uh, we are working, uh, we think it's a multi-pronged solution. So we're working with a lot of startups who are doing charging infrastructure. We're investing a quarter of a billion dollars ourselves. I think what just was passed with the infrastructure bill is gonna provide charging as well. So I agree, you need charging along with EVs, but I think it's well on its way. I was chatting uh, before the event with our friend Sandy Schwartz, and he said that there's also an issue with the grid in some neighborhoods? You know, I uh, have been talking to a lot of uh, power companies, and in some cases, you know, from a grid perspective, we have to look at it holistically, and so, you know, the weakest areas need to be addressed, but I think the power companies and energy companies are looking at doing that, and, and we're having conversations as well. And, you know, there's a lot you can do to when the EV charges. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, when you get home, uh, get home whenever you're done um, with your day. It can be scheduled, and so I think there's a lot of work to do, work we can do to make the grid work for EVs for everyone. And the last question about EVs. How concerned are you about the battery supply chain and your ability uh, to source uh, parts from within the U.S.? So we've been doing a lot of work on the uh, battery supply chain uh, across uh, and, and looking at it to get as much as we can in North America. First, we're investing in four plants. Uh, we have one coming on this year, one next year, and one the following year, and we'll be announcing the fourth location yet this year. So we're bringing that manufacturing to this country, whether it's the, um, the rare earth material or uh, all of the components that we need. We've done quite a bit of work of sourcing in this country or in North America. So we're securing this, uh, the materials that we'll need to make sure we reach our goal of 2 million uh, EVs on the road by uh, 2025. And what would you change about the Biden administration's approach to creating an American supply chain for EVs? Uh, you know, we're working on doing th doing that. I think there's things that the administration are they're considering that will, I think, further support it. But we're very focused on bringing jobs to this country, uh, creating good paying jobs, and also having a more stable supply chain, which I think is important not only for e EVs and, and to support what we need to do from a climate change perspective, but from a national security perspective as well. So autonomous vehicles. When will we have vehicles for personal use that have extended look away driving that I can watch Netflix. Well, so, you know, today we have Super Cruise, um, but we, it's a driver assistance technology. We've announced by 2023 we'll have Ultra Cruise, still a driver assistance technology. So we're going to be watching to make sure you don't look away for too long. Right. You encourage uh, us not to watch Netflix. Right. Uh, yeah. Because you still are, the, is, if it's driver assistance technology, you still are the person responsible. But we believe um, as early as mid-decade, we'll have a personal autonomous vehicles available that will then, it crosses that line where the vehicle is now responsible for the operation. And again, I think that can happen by mid-decade because of our partnership with Cruise. Yeah, I just want to draw a line under that. So the, so the personal vehicles is the reason that's important. That's different from like a robo taxi. You've said mid-decade in the past. Are we talking like 2024? Uh, we've said as early as 2025. And uh, what is, how affordable, available will, that be, will those be? 
Well, you know, as we first start to roll those out, that, uh, that technology is expensive. We already have a lot of work going on at Cruise to get the cost of the technology down. So as the capability of the vehicle goes up, the cost will come down, but it will start as a, a relatively um, a higher priced vehicle until we get the technology down. And that's why we're also investing in, in Super Cruise and Ultra Cruise because it dramatically makes uh, the vehicle safer. And you know, our goal is to create a world with zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And all of these technologies are enabling us to do that. So actually, I just had an interesting poll this morning with our partner, Momentive, uh, looking at how different age groups uh, embrace autonomous technology. And young people love it. So in our poll, seven of 10 young adults say they drive an electric car if they could afford it. What do you think is the appeal to youth? Does that relate? Does that uh, comport with research that you do that younger people a lot more eager to embrace it? Um, I, I think uh, we've done extensive research and I think people look at affordability and is there a robust charging infrastructure? Is the vehicle going to be in the segment that I wanna drive? I'm not gonna drive a sedan if I really wanna drive a truck. So that's why that portfolio is so uh, important. But I think the main thing is we need to get people into electric vehicles because they're fun to drive. It's instant torque. Uh, you know, whether I've been driving a Bolt and now I'm driving a Hummer and it, they're just incredible. So I think as people experience the technology from an EV perspective, uh, they'll be uh, convinced. And what do you think explains the youth appeal? I think uh, generally just an attraction to new, new technology. I, I don't think that's, that's new across many different forms of technology. But again, I think experiencing the technology is the best way to convince people that they're gonna get more and not give anything up, whether it's uh, electric vehicles or then autonomous. I mean, the, you know, after I've had several rides and now have, have taken rides without anyone in the vehicle, uh, in the driver's seat, um, experience it. I mean, it, I, three, four minutes in, um, I'm trusting the technology, I'm convinced, uh, and I feel it's a, it's a smoother ride, it's, it's a better experience. We had a conversation in the Axios editorial meeting yesterday, somebody threw out the premise that vehicles may become more dangerous become, before they become safe, and that is that with this partial automation, drivers may over trust it. Do you worry about that and how do you solve for that? Well, I, the way we have solved for that is with Super Cruise and Ultra Cruise that we're making sure you pay attention. And if you don't, we warn you, we warn you. Yeah, so tell me what happens if I'm, tell me what, what So happens. at first you'll be, you'll be warned. You'll, you know, you'll get a, a beep. You'll get uh, uh, the, your, you'll have a sensor uh, in the seat. And eventually if you don't uh, pay attention, uh, the vehicle will stop operating. It'll, it'll safely stop operating. GM also is a SaaS, software as a service uh, company. Tell us about that. Well, we believe if you think about the vehicle, it is a software platform. So as we look at what people are doing today and what we can do to improve the customer experience, we see a huge opportunity there. And we've invested uh, in, in a technology where we can, uh, one, do over-the-air updates. We call it our vehicle intelligent platform. We started rolling that out in 2019. So as every new vehicle that comes out, uh, primarily will have that capability. But then on top of that, by next year, we'll have a kind of think of it as an operating system called Altify that enables us to, uh, for instance, we'll, if we develop something two or three years from now, we'll be able to backcast it into your vehicle. So, you know, what's exciting to me about this is your vehicle will get better over time. And so it's really exciting the, the, the changes that are happening in our industry and how we're going to be able to better serve customers. When you were named CEO eight years ago, right? Uh, starting as a co-op student and coming back as the boss boss, uh, it was covered as a signal change for an industry. You'd been a top GM executive for a long time, but there are a lot of old boy elements of this industry uh, that remain. What did you face that a young woman today wouldn't, or has it not changed that much? You know, I uh, sit here today as the chair and CEO of General Motors because 25 years ago, people invested in my career. General Motors focused on diversity. Apparently, it was one of the best kept secrets from, a, you know, from what people think about it. So I was given, uh, I had great mentors and coaching. I was given stretch opportunities that prepared me for this role. So yes, things have changed since I was 18 years old uh, and, you know, maybe had a different reception when I went into, uh, into one of our plants. But, you know, we're really proud as we just staffed up our CAMI plant in Canada 
that it will have more women uh, working at the plant. Uh, so there's been tremendous strides made in representation across all levels. And I think it's an environment that we are really trying to create an environment where everybody can bring their true self to work to do their best work. Something you talk a lot about is purpose. Yes. I, I think every company and it needs to understand why, they're, why they exist. And so our purpose at General Motors is to pioneer the innovations that move and connect people to what matters. And as you and I talked, the what matters, and, and, and uh, that was something that we hope uh, for all of our employees guides you know, their, their decision making every day and gives, gives them that, you know, that outline and alignment of where we're going. And I will tell you that our employees have responded really positively to this. And I personally think when we look at attracting and hiring the best and the brightest, they wanna work for a company that is doing something that matters, but also um, shares their values. And so, uh, again, we're on, a, on that journey. We continue to work and improve, but I think it's a, a very important um, element of any company, of the culture, if you're gonna attract the best and the brightest. You told me a surprising story about a deep dive that you did into the old GM bylaws. Yes. yes. So as we were working on our purpose, um, we, uh, you know, we, we knew it's, it's hard to pick the words and you want it to be something that everyone can remember to help them guide them every day. And we were kind of at a, we were kind of stuck. And so I actually uh, talked to another CEO that I have tremendous respect for uh, and their purpose. And he, he said, you know, look into your past. And so we actually got out the articles of incorporation of General Motors. And it was, you know, so inspiring because they talked about pioneering. They talked about electric vehicles over 100 years ago. And uh, that really um, was instrumental in us uh, defining our purpose and finding that connection. Part of the GM way is dress appropriately, work appropriately. Yes. What does that mean? Well, dress appropriately, uh, was I had the opportunity to work in human resources about, oh gosh, more than a decade ago. And uh, you know, we had a multi-page uh, uh, dress code. And you know, the way I looked at it is, it was something that no one looked at. And, and frankly, when you think about everybody at the company, they're doing something important. We should be able to trust that they're gonna dress correctly for the job they're doing. And you know, we have people who are meeting with government officials or meeting with customers or interfacing with dealers or you know, assembling our vehicles. How can we possibly write a manual long enough to say, you know, here's how you should dress? So dress appropriately really empowers everybody to figure that out. And you know, I think it was really important for our culture because instead of somebody saying, yeah, you know, um, that's just what the rules are, it empowered people to say, what should I do? And that then led to work appropriately as we, for those employees who had the opportunity to work remotely during the pandemic, um, and first of all, I have to say I'm grateful for so many employees who came to work every day, followed the safe, safety protocols, because uh, building cars, trucks, and crossovers is our business. But for those individuals, again, you know, there's been so much debate about return to work, and our guiding principle was do your work where you can do your best work. And that's what work appropriately means. So it's not, I want to work at home, so I want to, you know, if that's what I'm going to do, or, you know, this manager wants to see everyone. It's really, again, being thoughtful about where can I do my best work, which sometimes can be remote and sometimes will be um, in one of our facilities. And for those people who were able to work from home during the pandemic, our reporting shows that people at GM adapted fast. And uh, there was even some design that speeded up our people working on parts of cars in their garage instead of a lab. I, there, people were so creative. If ever anyone had told me that we could not only you know, maintain the business, but in some parts, speed up our, um, our electric vehicle programs and continue on with uh, the technology development, I think it just shows the agility, the resiliency, and the creativity of our team. So I couldn't be more proud. And some of it did speed up? Absolutely. So Mary, we always end our newsletters and our events with one fun thing. And you have an awesome story about your first car. So my first vehicle was a Chevy Chevette, uh, but the backstory was my dad, who worked for Pontiac Motors, uh, where I started, and he retired my senior year in high school. And so we went to a Pontiac dealer at the time, and we put a deposit on a Firebird, and then we came home, and uh, because my father was retiring, um, you know, I had to make sure I knew how I was gonna pay for school. So unfortunately, I had to go get the deposit, bought the Chevy Chevette, but it was a great vehicle. It took me all through my schooling, and then actually, 
my brother and I uh, uh, swapped vehicles and it took him all the way through med school. And you told me about the letters that you get from customers. Why do people name their cars? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, this is an incredible business because for most people, a vehicle is either the most important or the second most important purchase they make. And so people re relate to their vehicles. We've had Tom the Tahoe, we've had Malibu Barbie. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just so fun. I mean, I've, I've had letters from people who say, you know, my vehicle was with me through my cancer treatments or was with us through, you know, three successful Suns lacrosse uh, tournaments. So I feel very special that we get to be a part of people's lives. Okay, drop the mic. What was the Chevette named? The Chevette didn't have a name. I'm sorry. It, it was my Chevette. It was my red Chevette, but it was cool. That'll do it. It could even be a song. Mary Barra, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation. Well, hi everyone, I'm Margaret Tolliv. I'm the Managing Editor for Politics here at Axios. And a reminder, uh, you can all follow today's discussions on Twitter with the hashtag What's Next Summit. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Northrop Grumman's Chairman, CEO, and President, Kathy Warden. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Kathy, um, there's so much to talk about, but I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine is on everyone's mind. And maybe we can start there when we're talking about the future of uh, defense and technology and how this all comes together. Um, for sure, it's been a wake-up call for the West about many things, including cyber. And I wanted to start by asking you about cyber. Um, essentially, what threats around cyber are you most concerned about right now? And how much of this uh, is for the administration and the Congress to work on versus how much is this a private sector issue? I think it's absolutely an issue for all of us to work on together. I just spent the morning in a cyber task group with government and industry collaborating on how we share information because this is really a time unlike any other where our adversaries who seek to get information are not going to necessarily come through channels that are obvious. We have to think about the way we're implementing technology in our companies and the vulnerabilities that that use of technology creates. And if a company isn't thinking at the same time about their technology implementation plans, and their cybersecurity plans in tandem were already behind. So this absolutely is an issue for the private sector, but the private sector doesn't have access to information that the government does. And so that's why the information sharing between government and industry is so important. Do you see any evidence that this effort has been stepped up since the Russian invasion of Ukraine? I know a lot of investments in work in cyber are tied to, to budget cycles and defense authorization cycles. Um, how has the, the war changed this, and uh, are you convinced that the proposals in the budget package, for example, uh, are, are taking this where it needs to go, or, or are there specific areas where you think there needs to be more investment or, or more direction? I absolutely see efforts have been stepped up, as well as the funding to support them by the federal government. And the sense of urgency on the part of the private sector has certainly been elevated with just the understanding that cyber now will be a tactic used in conflict and that we all need to be prepared for it. The Shields Up initiative that this administration launched has helped to create that awareness with the private sector. At the same time, there are tools, information sharing mechanisms that enable businesses to do their part. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about cyber techniques being used in a conflict situation, the government has a really important role to play. And this administration has stepped up to that charge. I think when we talk about the future of war, like increasingly we are talking about areas like cyber and areas like 5G, um, maybe even more than we're talking about boots on the ground or the use of drones or that sort of stuff. So I also wanted to touch on 5G. Um, China is said to be far ahead of the US in terms of its build out of 5G. 
how concerned are you about that? And uh, can you give us a sense of what is happening on the U.S. front to try to, is that gap closable anytime in the next generation? Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you some context on why I think technologies like 5G are so important. When we think about today's environment, it's less about the traditional arms race of the past, and it's more about the technology race of today and the future. And I think that what we will see is that conflict takes on a different meaning in terms of how operators engage in cyberspace. Uh, and there are all kinds of ways that our government uses technology today to share information and enable assets to work together. We have to think about that being done securely. So it's not using commercial infrastructure directly, but it's using the technologies that exist in the commercial world, like 5G. So we have launched a partnership with AT&T and Northrop Grumman to come together and provide the government that same type of connectivity that we rely on in 5G to connect assets in the government. Think of it as the, uh, the internet of things that we engage with every day in our lives now with assets that are federal assets and military application. Kathy, I want to stop you for a second because I am familiar with Northrop Grumman's work with the Department of Defense on, I think it's called JADC2, and you've now mm -hmm. exhausted my knowledge <laughs> limits on 5G mm -hmm. and defense. Um, but uh, the, in, the, what you just said about a partnership with AT&T is news, is it not? Mm -hmm. It is, absolutely. This partnership between Northrop Grumman and AT&T takes the, what we each bring in expertise of working with clients and working with this technology for communications and integrates it to be able to more rapidly provide the Department of Defense what they need to support their vision of joint all-domain command and control. Is it happening now and how does it actually work? Because from what I have, from my limited knowledge base about this, this sort of involves like putting sensors on stuff and connecting stuff across branches of the military. How much of that is already uh, in place and, and to the extent that it's not in place, how does it limit the ability for the military to coordinate? It's largely not in place today. Platforms that have been built in the past were never really designed to be able to communicate with one another. Uh, it's, if you think about your own technology in your home, it's like having a refrigerator from the 1990s that was never designed to be technology enabled. Whereas if you buy one today, you will be able to do settings and get information from your refrigerator about what is in it and what you need to restock. It's just a whole different set of capabilities enabled into the platforms. So because platforms weren't built to uh, work that way, it would be very costly to replace all those platforms. What instead we're working on is the ability to connect and interface, so build communications capabilities that allow that interconnectivity to happen without having to change out the platform And what are itself. we talking about connecting? Well, like, what are we talking mm -hmm. about connecting? Are these... Um, missile systems, mm -hmm. are they uh, aircraft, what are they? Yes, all of the above. We can communicate with just about every platform, sensor, and weapon today, but in stovepipes. This is about connecting all of those stovepipes together, so having a backbone of communication that allows these assets to share information. One may sense a threat, another may be capable of uh, destroying that threat, but they should be able to share that information to work together, even if they weren't designed to do so. How does That's, it work right now? It's like some guy in a command center, yes. like on the phone, like and it's in slow. a movie? It's, and it's slow. slow. And there's sticky notes and all kinds, of, and I'm not trying to put 3M out of business, but at the end of the day, it's not a very efficient process for people to be passing information through humans uh, to get this work done in the time frame that we need it to be done. Speaking of time frames, how long does a project like this take, and how much will it cost? We expect to be prototyping technology within a year because the technology is not the hard part. We have solved the technology challenge in this area. It's the application of it to existing assets today. And that really will operate at the speed the government is ready to move along with industry in incorporating these technologies into the way they operate. Do you need uh, like a telecom partner? And I, I'm trying to understand whether 
the defense application is more likely to propel the consumer application or whether the consumer demand is more likely to propel the defense application? But we think it's a bit of both. In areas like space, where we operate commercial uh, federal government in the exploration mission with a partner of NASA, and in the Department of Defense with national security applications, we find there's a lot of core technology that stretches all of those missions, and we're able to apply it to different applications. I think the same is true when we partner with commercial partners who are looking at consumer applications or business applications, there's a lot of commonality in what the government needs, and we can move faster together. But if a prototype is zero away, this is what, a decade-long project? I see joint uh, all domain command and control, which is the federal government's vision, and particularly the Department of Defense vision for how these assets get connected, taking, yes, a decade. But at the end of the day, the technology will be there. That will not be the limiting factor. The limiting factor will be how quickly it gets adopted and brought into their command and control structure. Um, while we're talking about the future, can we do space, a little bit of space? Sure. You're not an astronaut. I'm not. <laughs> but increasingly, a lot of Northrop Grumman's work is in space or around space or about space. Um, Northrop Grumman has worked on the Webb Telescope, mm -hmm. right? NASA's Artemis program. You are a supplier for the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Space Force is a client. Yes. What space work are you most excited about right now? And what do you worry about the most when you think about the prospect of militarization in space? Well, it's like picking your favorite child, which I never do, to say what part of the space mission is most exciting, because frankly, they're all incredibly exciting right now. The James Webb Space Telescope, which you mentioned, is now in orbit a million miles from Earth. It will look at light from around the time of the Big Bang and help us to better understand the origins of our universe and look at exoplanets that we've never seen before. So that's pretty darn exciting. But then when you think about the fact that we've developed the first uh, satellite that will help sustain life in other satellites, so again, satellites that maybe had a 10-year life, we're going to be able to extend that life for commercial partners, for government partners, so that we can drive down the cost of operating in space significantly. That's a first of. That's pretty exciting. And then the work we're doing in national security, which I can't talk much about, test the limits of what can be done from space every day. And so it's the kind of work that our talent really wants to be involved in. It's what helps us to attract talent to the company. So that's incredibly exciting. So there's not one area that's most exciting. The one area that I worry most about is we have had freedom of operation in space for decades. And that opportunity no longer exists. Space is becoming crowded. There's a significant amount of debris in space. And other countries have the ability with anti-satellite technology to remove assets from space if they choose. So all of this means that space is becoming an environment that needs stronger governance models, relationships between nations to figure out what it means to respectfully operate in space. And this is, again, not a technology problem. Our company is a technology company. Uh, we find those challenges really exciting to work on. But oftentimes, the policy challenges are the ones that delay the application of the technology that's available. Any big policies for us to be watching this year? I, it's my sense as a uh, political journalist that not a whole lot more is going to get done in Congress. Uh, ahead of the midterms, but what should we be watching on the space front? Space policy is developing in the background. I wouldn't expect to see anything yet in the foreground. It's not one of the highest priorities right now, but it certainly is something that the U.S. and our allies know need to be worked, and norms and behaviors in space is something that this administration is taking on, have made some public statements about, but I don't expect any big news on that front the remainder of the year. Space tourism is a thing that... Um, it is. We talk and hear more about. Um, uh, I'd sign up to go if I could afford to or won the space lottery. Um, do you think you'll be traveling to space anytime soon? 
I don't have a ticket yet, but uh, I do believe that I wouldn't have believed this if you would have told me as a child that one day I, as just a normal person, would be able to go to space in my lifetime. I would have told you that that probably was ambitious and a little bit science fiction. Uh, today, I do believe it. I believe I would have the opportunity to do that if I chose to, and that more and more people will. And I certainly think our children are of an age where space has seen a renaissance. And children uh, today are getting the opportunity to think about could I live in space, not just travel to space in my lifetime? And that's pretty darn exciting. Um, back on Earth. Yes. <laughs> I want to go back to Ukraine for mm -hmm. a moment. You've been CEO of Northrop Grumman since 2019. You joined the company in 2008. Uh, I have read that 9-11 changed the course of your career. I'm wondering if you would share with us why and whether you think that there is maybe a generation of experts who might be entering the defense space for whom this invasion of Ukraine is going to be a pivotal moment in their lives. I do. I think as we have moments like 9-11, uh, which in my case, my husband was working at a government installation that was targeted and was evacuated. My mother was at the Pentagon, experienced the same thing that day. And I was running a business that had major clients in New York City. The only reason I wasn't in New York, I typically uh, was, is because I had just returned from maternity leave and having my first son. And it was a rude awakening to me as a US citizen to have an attack on US soil, something I had never thought would be possible. And it changed my life because that day was one of the hardest days I've ever experienced. And I thought to myself, if I can do anything to help my children not grow up in a world where they're afraid of this on a daily basis, I want to do that. Unbeknownst to me, because I was working with commercial clients at the time, my company also did work with the government and the intelligence community and asked me if I'd go for a short period of time and work with the intelligence community on information sharing to help address the issues that had, in part, led to the events of 9-11. And I said, absolutely, I'll go do that for a short period of time. Well, here I am in the industry, uh, never looked back. And it's because I want to work on things that have mission and purpose in preserving freedoms and protecting people. And that's what our company does on a daily basis. I think we're at that moment again now that particularly citizens in Europe would have thought they would never experience what they experienced in the world wars, in particular World War II, and yet this invasion of Ukraine for many Europeans feels terribly familiar. And we are having young people, both in the US and our allies, that know if they get called upon to go engage in conflict, that they're willing to put their lives on the line. We take that incredibly seriously in our company. And it is our purpose to give them the best tools available to protect themselves while they are making this choice to go and preserve freedom at all costs. And so this is a moment in time where I think many eyes have been opened, reopened to the fact that these threats exist and we need to be prepared to deal with them. Um, we're, uh, as we bring this conversation in for a landing, it has been my observation also that, um, and maybe this is generational, uh, that uh, investors, younger generation of investors has pushed companies to move away from any involvement in cluster bombs, even if indirect. I know that's uh, uh, something that uh, your company has thought through also, that watching the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there has been um, uh, a renewed discussion about the morality of war, of the ground rules of any kind of war. And um, a lot of conversation about defensive versus offensive military capabilities. Uh, Eric Schmidt was in recently for a visit, and we talked about uh, what he said. He'd like to see more innovation around defensive systems mm -hmm. to make civil society safer from war. I'm wondering if that's something that you've been thinking about and how Northrop Grumman you know, wants to participate in that conversation. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe that deterrence of conflict is always the first objective. And so our company is leading the modernization 
of the US strategic deterrent, which our allies also rely on. And in many ways, it's not about building weapon systems that can overpower the, the weapons of our adversary. It is about having the defensive posture that other adversaries wouldn't want to get into a one-to-one -one conflict. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, in today's environment, that's about arms to some degree, but more and more, it's a technology race. And we can have deterrence through technology application and utilization that would deter an adversary from engaging in conflict with the US or one of our allies. And that's always the goal. Kathy Warden, uh, we are out of time. We will leave our conversation here for now. Until next time, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank and, you, Margaret. I uh, appreciate the conversation. Thanks. Good to be with you. Uh, it's so good to hear live applause again. Uh, thank you all for joining us at our inaugural summit and making this such a success. Uh, as a reminder, you can follow along on social media using the hashtag What's Next Summit. Uh, and our next conversations are going to focus on work shifts. And I am delighted to kick this off with the Chief Purpose and Inclusion Officer for PwC in the US. She is also the leader of CEO Action. Uh, the largest CEO-driven business commitment for advancing diversity and equity. Uh, welcome, Shannon Schuyler. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Like you said, amazing to actually hear this in person and not to be in a little box. So yes, it's, it's great. Um, you're in a unique position, given your role at PwC and with CEO Action. And a lot of the future of news reporting is talking about 2022 and how it is the hardest year to lead a company. Uh, leaders are expected to weigh in on cultural and societal issues. They have to navigate new technologies uh, and trends like the Great Resignation, uh, which we've talked right, a lot or the about. Great Pivot or the Great Epiphany or all the other all ones. All of those, yes. all of those uh, trends. Uh, so what are you seeing? How is this manifesting in the work that um, you're doing? Is it changing things, influencing things? What does it mean for you? No, I think a lot is happening, and, and I would say it's an exciting time. I think for years, we kind of, every couple of years, say these things are important and people are important, and then something happens and we take a step back. And I think we're realizing now that we're in fundamentally a different place. Our people are expecting more, and they are saying, we will leave if you do not do it. And it's not just around the edges, it's not just pay, it's not another week of vacation. It's saying we actually want to customize our jobs. We want the ability to tailor our experience specifically for us. And it was interesting, all the conversations this morning where people were talking about the need to be more thoughtful, more focused, making sure we treat people with dignity, making sure it's purpose driven. That's where we are. And that's in a different place than I think talking about talent as widgets instead of really saying that they control the destiny of the success of an organization. Yes. Uh, we absolutely believe that at Axios, that our employees are our single most important asset. Uh, and we heard earlier this morning about the importance and power and impact of being a purpose-driven organization. And in your role, I'd love to hear what that means for your day-to-day -day work. No, and, and it's an amazing role to have. And so our purpose is to build trust in society and solve important problems. And you might not tie that to a professional services firm because what we do is specific things around audit and tax work and consulting and building products, but why we do it is we believe we have the responsibility as an organization with 275,000 people to make a difference in this world. And whether that's around environmental sustainability, whether that's what we do in our communities and foundation, how we look at DNI and how we really make sure that thread of equity goes through all that we do or help one another. That all really is coming together with our purpose. And the goal now is how do you crossroads that? Mm. How do you get your people to understand purpose for them is important, and when people come into the organization, they do a purpose assessment so we can figure that oh, out. Wow. And then how do we put people on jobs based upon what their purpose is so we can show them that that purpose and those values actually intersect with the organizations to try to create that stickiness and that feeling that we're doing this and it has real meaning to it. 
Yeah, and speaking of all of those pieces, we also um, have learned that transparency is a critical piece of it. We lean heavily into transparency at Axios as a way of building trust. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how you've seen that and how it can also help with purpose-driven work? Absolutely, well one of the great examples is when the murder of George Floyd that night our CEO and I got on the phone and we were talking about all the things that we wanted to do. So we had a strategy. We had a strategy around purpose and inclusion. We were gonna roll out our first transparency report the following year. We decided at about 11.30 at night that we were rolling it out in two months. Why? Because we felt that we needed to be transparent right now to say this is where we are and we need people to know that because we need to reflect that we need to be better and we need to go the next place. And, and that gets you back to that whole thought and, and one of those great quotes of, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It didn't matter how good the strategy was for our culture to truly trust each other at that pivotal time, we had to do something to make sure that we were uplifting it. And transparency, I think, is one of those ways that builds the trust yep. and builds accountability that we need in order to make sure that we're moving forward. And it also builds uh, authenticity which employees are always looking for as well, we find in Absolutely. organizations. Um, and thinking about employees, uh, another thing we obsess on is employee engagement uh, to try to both attract, retain, unleash the, the talent that we have. Um, as, as you think about that as well, what are the ways or programs that you've assessed to actually help uh, engage employees as well, realizing they're complex, everyone needs something different, how do you figure out what you're going to implement and what is actually worthy? Well, and it's such a great question because I think for so long it was easier, or we thought, right? The easy button is let's make sure everyone has the same issue and then we'll solve for that issue and everyone needs the same benefit or wants to work hard here and, and take this time off. And what I think we've realized is that's not the case. And the more that we can customize that experience and what we've done is we've started to ask our people questions asking them how do you not just self-identify from a race, from a gender, ethnicity, but tell your story. Mm. Tell the story of who you are in the order in which you want to tell it, down to all those details so that we can understand who you are and you can let us though about your purpose and how you want to belong here. And what we need to do now as leaders is let each person find a way to live that out. So whether that is understanding additional benefits, whether that is saying that we have a model where people can be 100% virtual or work from anywhere, whether that means that you don't have to come within a practice and stay there, but you can go more fluidly and more agilely through, whether it means that you can come and you can leave for two years and have a role to come back, it's dramatically changing what we've thought about from an HR standpoint for years, where we got to have more people go on the same path because that gives us structure. Well, I think we've realized that everything is not in our control. And the more that we start to embrace that yes. and allow that to happen, the more we're gonna be able to get more from our people and more from what we're able to do overall for society. Absolutely. And as you look forward into the future, and I know we both would love to have a crystal ball. <laughs> I was gonna say. Um, but you know, what do you foresee as the biggest challenges in building trust and then maintaining trust with employees? I think the biggest challenge that I see around trust is that you have to stay consistent, mm. right? Because it takes a really long time to build it, but it leaves so quickly. And right now, I think CEOs and, and those individuals, they can't afford to stand on the sidelines for all of these different issues. Because if you stand on the sidelines, it means you don't care. Mm. And someone's gonna put something in your mouth. And I think what we have to say is we have to be in this. Our people are in it, they wanna make sure that their voices are heard, and we in turn need to make sure that we're coming up before it happens with what are we gonna do? Yeah. What are we gonna do with that legislation when it comes down? What are we gonna do if people can't travel to where they need to go to? What are we gonna do when we look at really limiting our carbon intensity? And we have to get in front of that. And I think it's really important that teams take time to map that out and know what their strategy is to make sure that that happens. Because otherwise, I think the inconsistencies is what gets you the most off track around trust. It's people will take the hard news yes. if you just say it. Yes. And if you continue down that path, immediately if you're wishy-washy, it's not gonna have any kind of sustainable outcome. Yeah, and even if they disagree with the answer, just knowing that you've been thoughtful about it, you have a reason for it, and you're willing to share that. Absolutely. Um, all right, as we get ready to wrap up, two final questions. One, what keeps you up at night? And then, what are you most hopeful about? Oh my gosh, probably both the same thing. What keeps me up at night is my nine-year-old son, <laughs> who is, um, 
trying to figure out who he is. And so as a multi-race child, he's gone through COVID trying to decide if he wants to be black or white. Mm. And that keeps me up because that, I'm thinking, what is that going to do to our future? What is that going to do to the world that we're trying to create? On the flip side, it makes me so hopeful because he comes up with these statements of epiphanies of, oh, I can be both. And oh, I can do all of these things. And so it's seeing that we have the ability through what we do and the mentoring and fostering truly this next generation to come up. I think we have a potential that we've never had before. And that's incredibly exciting, even though a couple of sleepless nights. Yes. Uh, well, I appreciate that. That's uh, <laughs> wonderful to hear both sides of that coin. Um, thank you so much thank you for this conversation, much. these insights and perspectives. I deeply appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank everyone for being here. This is pretty amazing. So thanks for that. Awesome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming back to your seats. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined in a second by Ryan Breslow. Uh, if any of you have been in an airport in the last 24 hours and passed the newsstand, he is on the cover of Forbes's uh, new billionaires issue. He runs a company called Volt Financial down in Miami, which is a one-stop checkout company. And um, in Silicon Valley, he is either viewed as an ambitious young founder or a giant pain in the ass. Ryan, join us. <laughs> So, Ryan, uh, I want to start with this, because there's actually been breaking news in the last 30 or 40 minutes. This is almost the opposite of what's next. This is more like what's past. Um, one of your top competitors, or at least on the startup side, a company called Fast, which you have had some back and forth with on Twitter, announced it is going out of business. Your reaction to Fast um, going slow? <laughs> um, well, we, we went a little bit faster. Um, I think. Uh, you know, my take on this whole situation is, you know, they got a lot of funding and we had been in business for a lot longer. You know, I've been doing this about six years. When and, they and we should say, and you guys are like one-stop checkout, kind of what Amazon is on Amazon, but for the vast majority of companies that aren't Amazon. Yeah, exactly. We do this native one-click checkout. It's not another button. We take over the full checkout experience end to end. So we're the first bona fide checkout company. Um, but they were, you know, very helpful for us in terms of helping make this a category. Because whenever we'd say we're doing checkout, you know, no one will understand it. So competition was actually the best thing that happened to us. Uh, we will get back into the company specifically in a bit. But uh, one of the things that you are best known for is this idea of conscious culture, which is something you've instilled at Bolt. What is conscious culture? So. I, s I spent a lot of time thinking about culture and made a ton of mistakes, just like every mistake possible. And, you know, I was racking my head against the wall with our team and like, what is the best possible culture? And we realized it was two things. One is a high performance culture, right? You're building a business you need to execute. But number two is a humane culture where you're respecting the humanity uh, of the people working with you and people you know, can have fun and, and, and have joy uh, at your company. And so conscious culture is all about bridging execution with humanity. It's respecting the performance attributes of the business, um, but also for those who perform, like treating them really well. So what, it, practically speaking, so if I'm a Bolt employee, what does that actually mean for me? When I sit at the bar and, and I say, oh yeah, I saw Ryan on TV talk, you know, conscious culture, how does that help you? Yeah, there's a lot. We have a whole playbook on conscious.org, which, you know, goes through in depth, but some examples, um, one of which is how we do feedback. Most companies are in the dark for six months and you get feedback, and you know, we give written feedback at least once a month to our team, and we let them give it to their managers, and we force constructive feedback, so it can't all just be positive. And so it's, this is making our workplace more conscious about how they're performing, or we're giving them that feedback. It takes real work for managers and real work for the employees to ingest and give their managers feedback. So how we do feedback is one component. Another is our approach towards meetings. We say, you know, your you need to be just as conscious about your time as the founder or executives are, and so don't attend meetings if you're not needed. Speak up if you think a meeting is useless. Right? Do stuff in writing if it can be done in writing versus being unconsciously going through the motions um, in meetings. We have this 
You uh, call it like work theater. I think is the term yeah, you work, use, right? Yeah, work theater is what I, what I use. So I think American business or I mean, business around the world is infected by this virus of work theater, which is where people care more about how they look working than impact. Um, so one so. of the other things you've done, of course, is the four-day work week, which, which yes. you have evangelized for and you've actually instituted a bolt. Let, a little history here. Why did you come to the idea that a four-day work week was superior to the five-day work week? Well, we had people burning out left and right. When COVID hit, we're like, oh, people aren't going to work as hard. They're working at home. It was the opposite. They're working so hard, and they're burning out. And we were trying to coach people to, on how to create more balance. So we'd, and then we start giving wellness days. Like, we'd spin really hard. Like, we need a wellness day. Every week, we're doing wellness days. And we did like three weeks in a row. And then at one point, I'm like, you know, why don't we just do a four-day work week? Well, I mean, isn't the answer less productivity? And, and I say this for at the yeah. time you were CEO, now you're executive chairman. I mean, that would be the normal answer from someone in your position, right? Right. And we found the exact opposite is true. You know, people are way more conscious and deliberate about how they spend their time. There's far less work theater. You know, they may work on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday a little bit, do some catch-up work, but it's better than what they're doing previously, which is, you know, five days of working like a zombie and then trying to catch up on a, on a Sunday and never really feeling that they've, you know, they have a mastery over their work. And, and four-day work week has done miracles for our culture. Why not three-day work week? That's a good question. What's the was, answer? Uh, well, I mean, what, what's the answer? Because th if, if these people are on <laughs> average working 80% of what they worked before, why not 60? They'd probably be happy. Well, it should be a zero-day work. It shouldn't matter how many days you're working. You know, as long as you get the job done. Another thing that we do at Bolt is we realize that people are working on all these things that we didn't even want them to work on. Right? I'm sure we've all experienced that in our workplace. So everyone has three goals that they have to deliver to the company. If you're an IC or manager or leader, and we don't really talk about anything else. And so um, we don't care if you get those three things done by working three hours a day or, or, or six or 10, um, as long as you get it done. Uh, one of the other things you've done, uh, interestingly, is you have, and this is something that, I, and you know, I've, I've written a little bit about this and said I think you're wrong, so I want to hear you kind of defend it here, is you, like a lot of startups, um, employees get options, options, stock options companies, they could eventually uh, cash in on if the company's bought or the company goes public. But there is a, there's some tax implications if you wait until the day the company goes public or the company sells. So you're letting people get the, uh, exercise their stock options earlier, and one of the ways you're helping them afford to do that is giving them loans from the company, which they actually, they're not non-recourse loans, they would owe the company money if, if the thing was underwater. Why is that not potentially putting hundreds, if not thousands, of your employees in debt to your company? Because the, the inspiration for this was, I would want this if I'm joining a company, right? And so I believe in treating your employees like you want to be treated. But you'd want a lot of things. You'd want a free car and a plane and a million dollar salary. There's lots of things you'd want. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was hard to put into place, right? And so we did it the right way. We did, you know, legal tender offer. We got people financial guidance. We gave them stipends to do so. We exposed them to all the risks of the business. And we said, hey, if you want to take out a loan to exercise early, get all the tax advantages, you're going to take the risk of if the company goes down, you are on the hook for that loan, but you can capture more upside. And I, you know, we have very smart people who are making a lot of money. We have tech workers um, who can make decisions like this responsibly. And I believe we should empower them to make these decisions. Uh, moreover, what most folks don't realize is that uh, in private companies, earlier stages, you have a split between your preferred price and your 409A. So the employee has coverage there. And that could be up to 5X. Even at Bold, it's been up to 5X. So the company, you know, at any point in time you're taking out a loan, you have 5X coverage. So there is, uh, I think, you know, I would, want, I would want this if I were in their shoes. I, uh, you know that it's illegal for a publicly traded company to do this in part for this very reason, of, of the potential of employees getting, getting in trouble, do you think that rule should get rescinded for publicly traded companies? Well, I think privately traded companies have a lot of limitations on 
uh, on financings. And in a publicly traded company, you get stock, sure. right? So it's not an option. So it's, it's kind of apples to oranges. And you could get financing against that stock. It's treated like a liquid asset. In a private company, you can't get financing against that stock, which is another thing I think needs to be solved. You, uh, a phrase you've used about conscious uh, culture is work like a lion. What does that mean? It means to work with a high degree of intensity in achieving important outcomes with little regard for work theater uh, and, uh, you know, outcomes over everything, right? I like to work like a lion. When I'm, you know, working, I'm focused, I'm present, I'm attentive. If you're calling for a meeting with me, you know, you better be prepared, know what you're asking for, know what we're discussing, right? And, uh, and, you know, and it shouldn't just be for me as a founder. Right? Everyone in the company should work like a lion. And I think if you do that, you actually don't get burnt out as much. Because burnout comes from being drained of your energy, right? So if you're working in a passionate way, it actually gives you more energy. And then when you're not working, you've got everything done, right? You have time for your family and your kids and, and other things in your life. I'm wondering, and obviously lots of people at Bolt now work remotely like so many people do, but there are a lot of people, I think, uh, who feel that some of the off in office culture stuff, you know, just the, the, the chit chatting at the water cooler, you know, not necessarily about work, just about your day, is a, it's not family per se, but those are friends, and th then there is inherent value in that. Do you disagree with that? No, I don't think you need to be there five days a week to chit chat at the water cooler, right? You can have a workplace, it's a shared workplace that's optional to go to, that for the people who want to chit chat at the water cooler, they can go. Some people don't want to chit chat at the water cooler. They want to do their work and they want to, you know, go on hikes on the weekend or, you know, whatever. What is your greatest distraction that makes it harder to work like a lion? Uh, I've eliminated most of those from my life. Including so. you don't drink coffee, is that right? And you no expect coffee. people to trust you. All of these people to trust <laughs> you. <laughs> I, I tell I tell people, you know, you you think you need coffee? Look at me. Every meeting, I'm very engaged, high energy. It's because I don't drink coffee, not because I do. I, d I don't even know how to respond to that. Um, <laughs> how often do you, okay, so how often do you, do you have a, you probably actually know, how many hours a week do you work? I have no, I don't know. You don't know? How many I days a week do you I kind of flow in and out. Um, and on average? You know, how many days a week do I work? Yeah. Um, I, well, I only put meetings on my calendar four days a week. Okay. And then the other three days, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's much more. You know, as a founder, you have to, you have to work more sometimes. Um, and you have to be always on. But uh, I, you know, it, I try to stay balanced and always reset. So let's talk about the industry a bit. So again, uh, just to, to reset, you, it's this one-stop checkout. The, the, the skeptics of companies like Bolt, well, they say a lot of things. But one of the things they'll say are Apple and, and Android slash Google already do this very well via Apple Pay or Android Pay. Why do we need you? Why yeah. do we need you? So there's a lot of confusion in the checkout space. That was the opportunity for Bolt. Is we had a very simple insight. You go on Amazon, you have a one-click, delightful, instant experience. Go anywhere else, and you don't. Yeah. And so that's the basic premise. Right? I don't care who else is in the space. Nobody solved this problem. And so the way we solve this problem is by not being another button. Because a button needs you to keep your info up to date with that button, remember your password to that button, to, cl you to click something else. So you have this NASCAR effect on checkout, where all the biggest brands in the world are trying to compete for you to click their button. And the vast majority of shoppers are just clicking the normal checkout. And so we are the first company to platform eyes, I think it's a new word, the normal Checkout. And so we run your checkout. At the end of checkout, there's an opt-in box to create an account, default checked. You go through that, you keep it checked, you now have a Bolt account. When we see you at the next Bolt merchant, if we recognize your cookie, email, or phone, we prompt you, you already have an account, we log you in with a one-time code, and now you have that one-click experience. So it just works like magic, no change in consumer behavior, it's the normal checkout flow. Do you feel, you know, let me say this fast. 
th there's this perception, and, and I think partially driven by you, that you guys had, you know, revenue was relatively uh, modest last year, at least based on the Forbes story, like 40 something million dollars, but that there's about to be this massive surge this year. Is that legitimate? And can you give us uh, some sort of multiple sense of what that surge you expect it to be? Yes, it's, a, it's, it's enormous. I mean, I basically locked myself in a room last year and just closed deals you know, all day, like. You shouldn't kill a lion in a room. Yeah, okay. exactly, just worked like a lion, closed an unfathomable amount of deals. 14 months ago, we were a $450 million company. We raised four rounds, last round was 11 billion. They were gonna Does that raise. worry you a little bit? Because Fast was a $900 million company yesterday, and today they're out of business. Right, well, they're a 900 million company, like, a year ago okay. or more, right? But now they're a zero million dollar right. company. So what we've done is every quarter, we've dramatically exceeded the last quarter in terms of deal signing. So what investors are buying with Bolt is they're buying our book of signed deals. And these are very like large, gargantuan deals that have tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue impact because of the volume that they bring to our checkout that are mostly rolling out this year and, and some into next year. Uh, as a piece of that, uh, you guys, are, it's interesting because you, uh, you were part of the Stanford Bitcoin Club while you were uh, briefly at Stanford. Where, what role does crypto play in Bolt on, on the payment side? Because it's, it's one of the things in, that you know, you've said in the past is you realized very quickly that, that at the time Bitcoin, per se, was very tricky for purchases because it's so volatile. How, what role does crypto play in Bolt? It's going to play a big role. So we have, may have an announcement coming out this week. You want to that, share it yeah. now? Um, it's going to be a big announcement. Uh, <laughs> the long and short of it is we're going to do everything crypto when it comes to commerce. Anything you need, merchant needs, NFTs, crypto, one click, making everything one click super easy. Mm. And this was the original vision for Bolt, actually. What people don't realize it was the first year, this is what I worked so, on. So what's changed? Because the volatility is still there. Volatility is there, but the use cases are there now, too. So, you know, people are using crypto to buy NFTs and participate in games and uh, just are, are purchasing things. And so um, we now have, you know, every retailer in our network wants to sell NFTs with their products um, and just doesn't know how to do it. And the consumer doesn't know how to do it either. And so we can be this really amazing bridge. Do you own any, NFT, any NFTs, personally? I own some NFTs, yeah. The, there, and you know this, uh, there, there is this kind of split uh, among tech people. Uh, and you see this mostly play out on Twitter, which is either you know, Web3, generically speaking, is the future of technology. It's the next major paradigm change. Or a lot of kind of the Web2 folks, including folks like Aaron Levy, Box, say, no, there's nothing Web3 does better than what we already, not necessarily than what we already have, but by the current architecture. Are, are those folks wrong? And if they are, what does Web3 do better? Because right now it is slower and more expensive. Yes, they're entirely wrong. So um, well, I think uh, Web3 is the future of everything. I think that uh, inherently Web2 and kind of traditional businesses require extraordinary overhead. Um, the middlemen make all the money, and those middlemen are not necessary with decentralization. So I think what we're going to see with Web3 and DAOs in particular is platforms that do the same thing that Web2 companies do, or where middlemen, middlemen reap all the profits, and they're going to distribute all the profits to the creators, and there's going to be no more need for those middlemen. There's going to be no more need for those middlemen. Uh, I should also, this is the moment where I'm supposed to plug, Axios has a new crypto newsletter. You should sign up. <laughs> it's in my notes, I'm supposed to say that. Um, you are, as I said in the open, uh, you are on the cover of Forbes as of, as of yesterday. Um, what do you think about that? I, I guess I'm asking, really on the, you, you walk through the airport, I guess maybe this morning or today, and, and you see yourself there. Given some of the stuff you've talked about, about kind of conscious culture, et cetera, is it a little weird to now be the poster boy for 20-something year old billionaires? Um, you know, I don't see money as a bad thing. I think it depends what you do with it, right? So for me, I intend to give as much of my money away in, a, in, in a ways that help people out as possible. You know, a year ago, I started a, a foundation that uh, sets up community dance classes. I, I love dance. 
changed my life. I think if you teach someone to dance, they can't become a bad person later. So uh, seriously, so we teach people how to dance, we do free community dance classes, after school dance classes, so kids aren't on their phones or learning how to dance. And we've taught almost 30,000 students how to dance. And I'm um, working on multiple projects uh, around green technology and the environment, and so more of those will be announced soon. Uh, I have 40 seconds. I've been told to leave directly at zero, so this is now going to be on you. Uh, you've talked about valuation. The company was valued at $11 billion. Uh, I know you were trying to close a new round by the end of February that would value you at $14 billion. Did you? We did not um, because we're going to do something even bigger and better. Something bigger and better. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. <laughs>The pandemic has completely altered where and why people work. People across different career stages continue to change jobs, causing growing uncertainty for young employees, while older employees retire early. These shifts will impact business and labor across the country, leading employees and employers to wonder what's next at work. Um, it's great to be actually in a room with people. Um, that hasn't happened a lot, but like the rest of the working world, this is a hybrid event. So I also want to say hi to all the people on the live stream. And that's actually really emblematic, like the video was talking about, of the world we're sort of in right now. Sometimes we're online, sometimes we're in person. We know that we're going to something hybrid-y, but we don't really know what it looks like. I'm still trying to figure it out just for my own life, let alone the companies I write about. And as I try and figure it out, there's no one I would rather have this conversation with than our next guest, who is Stuart Butterfield, the CEO of Slack. Welcome, Stuart. Hey. Great to see you. Yeah. So I think I haven't seen you in person in quite a while. Like I feel like in the beginning of the pandemic, you were doing these video series, you know, talking to journalists, what we were doing. We kind of figured out the whole pandemic thing. We've been talking about this idea, oh, it's not gonna be the same. You know, the, it's all changed. We're gonna go back. It's gonna be different. It's gonna be hybrid. And we use these words, but I don't know if I'm the only one. I imagine there's others in the audience. I don't actually know what that really looks like. Like, I get that some people will be in the office, and some people will be online, and some people will be only one or the other, and some people will be doing a little of both. But beyond that, do we really know what that looks like, or do we just kind of know that some people will be online and some people will be in person? You and me definitely don't know. Maybe, maybe someone does, but um, I think the, the interesting thing is it's, it's hard for me to imagine someone really wanting to go into the... Um, the office if they're the only one there. You know, if there aren't the colleagues and there aren't the amenities and there isn't the, the whole experience, which kind of suggests this bifurcation where um, we'll see if companies are successful in getting people to come back to the office, but obviously there's a lot of that going on now. Um, companies will definitely be successful with people not coming into the office because we just proved that, that you could do that. But the, the reason I think we don't really know is um, it's just too hard to pull apart all of these factors. Uh, where you are in your life makes a big difference. A lot of people who are fresh out of college uh, have a much higher desire to get back into the office as you know, the basis of their social life. Um, on the other hand, there's people like me who have an 11 and a half month old, um, and there's no like trying to get the last train to get home before he goes to sleep or anything like that. And in fact, between calls, I can go downstairs and play with him. And three years ago, that's not at all what it would have been like, and, and uh, I just can't imagine giving that up. So there's a range of personal experiences, and then there's a, like, a range of what the, what the companies are, are aiming for. The, the distributed model, I think, has a, a little bit of an upper hand, just because um, it does seem to be the preference of most people. The, the after comp, the number one desire people have is flexibility. And flexibility is a good thing, I think most people agree but it's also really complicated. It's really complicated to create a productive workforce in a, a, a world where we don't have set hours and set places, and it's also really difficult, and I wanna get into this in a little bit, to create the workplace you want, the culture mm -hmm. you want, all those things become 
different and challenging. I'm curious, how close do you think you are at Slack to having the culture you want, even with a workforce that you don't see? I remember we were talking you know, six, nine months into the pandemic, mm -hmm. and I think you had had the first acquisition, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about hiring an executive. You know, Now, every company has hired tons of people during the pandemic. But at the time, it was new. Like, not that you can wave a magic wand, but if you could, what would, what would the ideal Slack work experience look like? What would some of the actual characteristics be beyond hybrid? Um, well, the first thing I, my mind went to was, I'm not sure if this counts as, as hybrid or not, but the, um, the design of the offices. So we still have our, we, we let go of a couple of leases that were expiring. I think we probably have like five or six offices. We were also, as pe many people probably know, acquired by Salesforce, so there's places where we- Oh, we're gonna get into that, okay. believe me. Um, but our headquarters is in San Francisco. I think it holds about like 1,250 people. It's 10 floors. You know, it's a glass. 10 stories isn't much of a tower, but you know, glass office building anyway. Big logo on the side, and it's awesome. The each floor is a different biome of the Pacific Crest Trail, and like we we um, kind of threaded the needle between a cheap build out and something that people really love. And I went there one time so far during the pandemic, and there was 30 people in a space that's designed to hold 1,200, so it's very depressing um, and weird to be inside of it. But I think, I bet we had this exact, and I probably use the exact same phrase nine months in, the least important um, thing that we were paying for with that building was the factory farm, like battery chicken housing for people to sit at their desk and use their laptop by themselves and not talk to each other. All of the other stuff, like the projection of power and the place to bring recruits and the place to host uh, customers and the all hands and the meals and the offsites and the management training and learning development programs, all of that stuff was, was really valuable. So um, the, the, I guess the thing I'm looking forward to the most is uh, the results of a bunch of experiments you're doing in different kinds of layouts and different kinds of facilities. And this might sound icky to people, but uh, I was in Javits Center two months ago, and I was walking around, and it's like, man, we gotta build something like this. And I don't mean exactly like Javits Center, but the, you know, like those walls that you can move, like they have in hotel ballrooms, and the catering facilities, and like the hundreds of desks or tables and chairs that you can kind of reconfigure. I think larger companies are gonna need a, something like that in order to make the best use of people's time when they are physically together, because I think most of the time, people will be traveling. And you went through also a lot of, we all have gone through pandemic experiences. <laughs> Clearly you've had a baby during the pandemic. You also had a corporate marriage during the <laughs> pandemic. What has it been like to become part of this much larger company during a pandemic? And what have you learned from it in terms of what a merger looks like post whatever we used to have before? Yeah, it's funny because I think at this point, um, you mentioned hired someone to the exec team I don't actually know the latest number, but I would, if I had to guess, I'd say two thirds of our employees are probably hired post pandemic just because we've grown so much. Um, we did an $800 million convertible bond offering in the early days of the pandemic without having to go meet the investors. And this whole acquisition happened with no um, meeting in, in person at all. But now it just seems normal. It doesn't seem like, a, you know, back then doing the bond offering felt like at this crazy accomplishment and we were so happy we didn't have to travel. To I remember you were like, this is like perfect because <laughs> normally I'd have had to go and do that awful road show and yeah. Exactly. Um, but now it just seems like, to, at least to me, that seems like the normal. Like that's the, that's the default because why would you um, travel more than necessary? But like I said at the beginning, it's hard to pull these things apart. I, I came here from New York, so I took the train this morning and I wore a mask for three hours and that still sucks. You know, it's not, it's uncomfortable. Um, it's still a little bit scary, maybe overstates it, but you know, it's like you, there's a little bit of risk associated with that. Um, and that has nothing to do with, with whether people 10 years from now or 20 years from now will spend more time working in offices or more time working from home. But um, the other uh, factor that I think you need to tease out is we, if we were all, all gonna work from home, we wouldn't have built our houses or designed our houses the way that we, we designed them. And I think as people make more and more changes and more adjustments, um, it's, it's almost like a one-way ratchet to making it more pleasant, more comfortable to work from home than from the office. So that's really interesting. I mean, we talk a lot about how the office is gonna be different because of remote work. This is actually the first time I've had a conversation. How is the home 
going to yeah. be different because of remote work. Are uh, companies going to start paying? I mean, they've reimbursed like a, you know, a computer here and there, maybe home internet, but we haven't had companies say, here's a bunch of money, build like a really productive workspace. Is that something you think we'll start to see? Yeah, I think some of that, and it's funny, I should see what happened to this, the startup that I remember uh, started like just before the pandemic and their business plan was like um, at home IT for remote workers. So we'll take care of like shipping the laptop, picking it up, the ergonomic chair, monitors, make sure people's networks are okay and, and stuff like that. And then the pandemic started like right after. I thought, that was a that was a good business idea. Yeah, good, good timing. Um, but you know, that hasn't really come to fruition. And over the last couple of years, I have cursed the fact that there is no one from our business technology group who lives in my house and can help me with different things that, you know, as, they, as they arise. Um, again, post-pandemic, I think that's, that's less of a problem, and that does seem like something that's, that's ripe for outsourcing. But I think also just the reconfiguration of the, of the home, you know, like the, the kind of canonical set of rooms that people imagine gets shifted slightly, because the people who, besides the young people, the people who came into the office during the pandemic were people who, two parents working at home, there just wasn't enough places to, to do calls at the same time. And I want to get into that, because you know, it's really one of the things that I think a lot about, and I've had some really interesting conversations. By the way, Reshma Sadani, who founded Girls Who Code, has a great new book out, Pay Up, looking at some of the equity issues. And one of the things we were talking about is, you would think, like at first blush, when you think about the hybrid workforce, you think more flexibility, oh, that's going to be great for working moms. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a real fear that it could be worse in the sense that if people have the option to be in the office or not, how much pro proximity bias will there be where those who are coming into the office um, seem like the people who are really committed and you give them the plum assignment because mm -hmm. they're right there. Um, how big of an issue is equity in the hybrid workforce? And have you given some thought to how do we make sure um, that we're really being inclusive? You know, inclusive used to just mean, you know, do we have like the camera turned on in the conference room so that whoever is remote is dialing in? But it's mm -hmm. really a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's much more complicated. And there's a bunch of me. So some of them are, are uh, I don't know, easy. I'm not sure. The, the Salesforce exec team is, is um, sometimes getting together in person, or at least parts of it. And it took one meeting before we made that rule, which is now pretty common, where even if you're in the same room, everyone joins the Zoom independently, so they have their own little square, because otherwise it's too hard to see. And um, there's, there's that kind of stuff. And then there's the research that um, Future Forum, is an organization that we, we back, um, has done. Uh, all people who uh, work to companies where when they went to work, they felt underrepresented are happier. Because there's like this, right. you know, code shifting doesn't kind of ha have to happen. There's a flip side to some of those too. Like now you're seeing into my home, you know, like and you hear my kids and see what I have on my wall and, and, and that's like a little bit more intimate almost. Um, but the, you know, fewer microaggressions and, and fewer, um, I guess, moments where you don't feel included. And, uh, and that's obviously a positive thing. Right, and that's, like, there are these things that we sort of have learned actually work better that we clearly want to take with us. I think what's so tricky is figuring out what do we want to take with, what do we want to leave behind from both our experience zooming in. I mean, I totally get why you want each person that's physically present to be in their own Zoom window, but it also seems like we're kind of, that, doesn't that feel a little bit least common denominator? Like, if the future of office is us all sitting in our Zoom windows, that mm -hmm. sounds pretty crappy. Well, they still get to be in the same room with each other. Um, I, as the CEO, I, I'm not sure if this is the default or not, but I traveled more than the rest of my team, and so I was usually the one who was remote, and I just like, I'm getting old. It's so hard to hear, and it's like makes me cranky when I can't hear. Like the, um, we tried 20 different kinds of microphones and, and stuff like that. So I think that will be a boon no, no matter what, like the, the better configuration. Um, but I think the, the much more, well, I'm going to try something. I can't really see people in the audience that well, but I wouldn't mind a little hands up for people um, who would prefer to have the option to work from home in the future. It seems like a no-brainer. Like, it's got to yeah. be close to 100%, because who wouldn't want to have the, the option? Um, and I think as long as that, that desire is there, there's going to be more and more conventions um, that end up replacing the time that we spent in the office. Again, not 
using our laptops by ourselves and not talking to each other, but like actually building relationships and like uh, uh, strengthening trust and uh, I don't mean trust trust falls and, and stuff like that necessarily. Oh, we're doing but, that after, okay. by the way. <laughs> um, but it is really valuable to spend time with people face to face, and I think people really crave that. And I think that is um, something that that we've been really lacking over this period. You going back to the beginning. I'm not sure how much of an impact that's had on the culture, just because again, it's there's so many things that are different now that it's it's hard to make the kind of direct comparison. But it is the thing that I think people uh, crave the most. And where do the technology tools fit in? I mean, obviously, pre-pandemic, you know, a lot of small companies, mid-size, even some large enterprises, had a strong Slack culture. I imagine that's boomed. Bigger companies are using it. It's become a real important part. Can you offer some Tan, uh, some tangible ways that a tool like Slack needs to change now. Like, it, obviously, you added a bunch of audio and huddles and mm -hmm. stuff that really helped um, during the pandemic. What are the technology tools we need for hybrid work? Or what are some things that aren't built yet? Either way, things you have added or things that you're like, wow, I bet we're going to need this. Well, I'll give you two. So one is just in, in Slack itself, more and more asynchronous tools. Um, and I would include in that category not just more like audio that you can play later or you, know, you can play back and the creation of transcripts and all of that kind of stuff, um, but better tools, I need this, for triaging all the messages um, and uh, kind of sociological support, I guess, or, or guidance on uh, how to help organizations become more effective in, in this way of communicating, because um, this is, is something that blows my mind all the time. All right, imagine some of you are executives at companies that have around 10,000 employees, and so like roughly, let's say, that's a billion dollars in payroll. If you're an executive, you spend 100%-ish of your time on communication, and you know, more or less every manager is going to be a similar proportion. The person inside the company who spends the least amount of time on, on communication, and I mean reading and writing messages, you know, preparing reports and reading other people's stuff and having phone calls and one-on-one -on -one meetings and all that. Um, the people who spend the least time are, you know, like maybe it's 30, 40, 50%. So if you average it out, you, you have people spending 50 or 60 or 70% of their time on communication. So you're spending $600 million, let's say, a year on communication, and how much investment do you put in to training them to be more effective communicators and to have better meetings? The reason that everyone in this room probably knows about the Amazon six-page memo format and we all read it at the beginning of the meeting be before we have the discussion is because there's so few examples like, the, of people even trying anything to, to make um, uh, communication better. So I think that, that part is, is something that even at Slack, where we're, I think we're much more conscious of this, we still underinvest. And we do a lot more onboarding. We do have a Slack 102 course and a Slack 102. Yeah, I noticed it was probably one of the most popular things we had at one of our internal meetings was someone just shared their Slack tips. And like one of the things I noticed pre-pandemic that's changed a lot. Pre-pandemic, I didn't feel a huge need to like manage. I didn't even bother to learn like how do I say I'm not available and whatever. Now, like. I would be absolutely, like, I, I just have to set some time aside and mm -hmm. say, I'm in a meeting, I'm taking a break, whatever. Yeah. Um, and it feels like there's even more of a need. Otherwise, the default is kind of you're around 24-7. Mm -hmm. Like, I, there was an article, I think, in the journal about how a lot of workers now have a 9 p.m. shift. Um, I have a yeah. 9 p.m. shift. I have an after the kids go to bed. How many people have a shift that ends you know, starts then or ends after a kid goes to bed or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a lot of people. Like, how, how important is time management and sort of managing, triaging communications in sort of how to use your product well? I think it's very important, and I'm horrible at it. So I'm not sure if I have any, like, great advice or, or feedback. But the other thing that I think we're missing is, um, oh, let me put it this way. I think there's an enormous number of opportunities to make improvements that I almost feel like people haven't made, maybe because they don't think that this is a permanent new normal or, or something like that. Um, but what became really acute for me when my days were 90%-ish Zoom meetings was there's no artifact left behind. Like, we have this meeting, there's all this discussion, we could easily make a transcript, we shared a bunch of documents back and forth. There's not even, like, a record of who was there and how long we talked, which would just be so useful to, to like, bundle that, that stuff up. And I could keep going for a long time, we don't have that much time, um, on, on those kinds of opportunities to make really fundamental 
uh, product improvements to things like Slack and, and obviously the whole spectrum of, of everything else. But I feel like we're, we have 10% of the tools we need. Um, really quickly, because there isn't enough time to fully get into it. But you know, we thought of ourselves as a global tech industry for a long time. I think the tensions with China started to make us feel like that wasn't the case. You guys had a big wake-up call with Russia. All of a sudden, you had to turn off a ton of users yeah. um, just because of international sanctions and stuff. What did you learn, and what should people take away from that? Is globalization over? Like, are we having to think about regions more? Um, I would have uh, been much more globalist, internationalist, something like that, um, three months ago. I think so. I, I have. Uh, I don't know, this this the invasion just seems so unbelievable in in certain respects, like like a, a thing that you would see in a, in a movie. Um, but if that's uh, something that happens, then I think there will be a reconfiguration, um, and the customers who can't use Slack in Russia will inevitably find something else because they're not, they're not going to shut down, and that will lead to more bifurcation because China is like a totally different world, obviously. Well, I had a ton more that I wanted to get to. I actually really was hoping you'd break out the ukulele and uh, play a ditty <laughs> for us. So next time at Axios, what's next summit to uh, Stuart's going to play the ukulele, which is going to be awesome. Um, thank you so much. Uh, congrats thank on you. the baby. Uh, Stuart Butterfield from Slack. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Back out this afternoon. We had such wonderful programming this morning, and how great was Stuart Butterfield and Ina Freed. I am so excited to introduce you to our next guest. This is somebody who has the best insight into what companies around the world are planning and doing and how they're looking ahead to what's next. Please help me in welcoming Julie Sweet, the chair and CEO of Accenture. It is surreal to be sitting out here with Julie because we did a virtual conversation around two years ago. And I was saying to Julie, it was one of the most viral conversations we had because at the time we were talking about how do you get 500,000 people, which is how many people worked at Accenture in 2020, fully remote for the pandemic. And fast forward two years later, Julie, you now have almost 700,000 employees around the world. So talk to me about that growth and change over the past two years, going from 500,000 to 700,000, 44 billion in revenue to 50 billion in revenue. Uh, well, thanks, it's great to be back and in person, which is great. Uh, you know, it's been a fascinating two years, and uh, one of the things that when I think about our growth that I talk to a lot of clients about is uh, you know, what allowed us to scale so quickly during a pandemic entirely remotely. And I go back to uh, a change that we actually made March 1st, 2020, so just 11 days before the pandemic was declared, we put in what we call the next generation growth model. And uh, what it was was about how to scale. So we made the biggest change in our history. We designed it, implemented it in six months, not knowing the pandemic mm -hmm. would hit. And while the details of what we did are not important, I think what is important is that uh, operational agility starts with how you operate, how you organize, and being able to anticipate not just where you are, but where you're going. And so we actually put in that growth model. And when we announced it, we literally said it is because we need to, one of the big reasons was we need to be able to scale. Now, we had no idea that we were going to scale you know, at this unprecedented rate, which is you know, historic highs for us, but it really tested it. And so when I talk to leaders a lot, whether it's how you deal with uncertainties, how you deal with growth, it's that anticipation that's really important and to not be too mired in where you are today, but where you need to go. And have, do you have the courage to change um, before you're there? So you said it's record pace for growth. When does Accenture become an, you know, a, a company that has a billion people. Is that somewhere on the near term and the near horizon? A billion's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I'd, I'd focus really or, less. Or sorry, a million people. <laughs> yes, so uh, let's, I'd focus less about, mm -hmm. um, about the numbers of people because again, if you go back to how we're organized, we are very close to our clients and our people and that allows us to scale. 
I think it's much more about you know, what do our clients need and how are we going to deliver that? And so, uh, you know, I talk about there being five forces that are going to shape the next decade, regardless of the macro factors, which we know are changing uh, the economic factors. And uh, the first is the need to totally reinvent the enterprise. The second is the ability to access, create, and unlock talent. The third is sustainability. The fourth is operating in the metaverse uh, continuum. And then the finally, the fifth, is the ability to harness the ongoing technology revolution. And it's those five forces that we wake up every day saying, what do our clients need now? And then how do they anticipate the future? And I think there's a lot of lessons for all of us in that ability to you know, stay focused on capturing growth and serving your clients today, but always looking to the future and what does that mean uh, for things, steps you need to take today. Fascinating that the metaverse is one of your five priorities. So many people think the metaverse is just a corporate buzzword. For you, it's more than that, clearly. What is your metaverse strategy? How are you guiding your customers and your clients around it? Well, to give you a little sense of context, back in 2013, we do an annual tech vision, and we've done it for 30 years. And back in 2013, our tech vision, the title was Every Business is a Digital Business. And I will tell you, we spent the next year fighting with most of our clients because they did not agree. And, uh, you know, of course, today, every business is a digital business. Uh, my head of technology, Paul Doherty, when we spent a couple of days together on our tech vision, uh, which we called this year the Metaverse Continuum, said to me, I haven't been more excited about a tech vision, nor do I think it's more profound than this one since 2013. And that says a lot, right, uh, in terms of the impact we think the Metaverse will have. And it's still extraordinarily early. The technology is not yet robust. There's a ton that's going to change. But what it really is about is that whether you're uh, you know, dealing directly with consumers or within the enterprise, we believe that you will operate sometimes in virtual reality, sometimes uh, in physical reality. And that will be every, everywhere from you know, when you're doing manufacturing, being able to do digital twins, uh, being able to collaborate with others in the metaverse and then coming back to reality to how we own the enterprise. My, you know, I've challenged my team to say that I want an entire digital twin of my enterprise and I'm a services company. And, and what's a digital twin? A digital twin is the ability to replicate in virtual reality a manufacturing line. Uh, the you know your actual enterprise in terms of how it operates and so it's used right now in many point solutions in manufacturing so that you can you know test things and it'll be broadened uh, to not just point solutions but entire plants for example and then finally you know the metaverse will just be another touch point for the consumer and I you know I was just talking to a client this morning uh, who was saying look you know, we need someone like you because you have the reality of where the tech is. The technology is not there yet to do it at scale uh, and to have everybody have their own metaverse and, you know, millions of people uh, involved it, but it'll get there. And so the point now for our clients is to be future ready, to be thinking about their metaverse strategy across that continuum right. now. And then for many to try to lead in it and shape what the metaverse is going to look like in their industry. I heard that in order to become a new employee of Accenture, you go through onboarding through the metaverse. How does that work? We do. It's super exciting, actually. So uh, the reason we wanted to have a different experience is that we are still doing virtual onboarding. So we hire over 100,000 people a year. They used to have some physical experience. And what we know is in the metaverse, you first of all, for short periods of time, have better learning. But it's also a very unique experience. And so we said, how can we create the bonds of being in person and having a unique experience digitally? And so we have a two-day onboarding program, and about an hour of it is in the metaverse. And you basically go to one Accenture park, 
uh, which uh, is, allows you to explore the different parts of Accenture, to go to our labs around the world, to, to um, interact with others, you have your own avatar. And we've already had 75,000 people go through one Accenture Park. It is something that we do for all of our new joiners, and it creates a bond and an experience. Now, someday that won't be so unique, but it is unique now. But again, there's a learning advantage in terms of how people are actually learning about Accenture, and there's science behind using the metaverse for short periods of time and having a positive impact on retention. It's amazing because Accenture sits in a very unique place in the world, one of the biggest companies in the world, and you advise hundreds of companies all around the world, biggest brands. Right now, it's a really uncertain time. I think a lot of companies are trying to figure out how they react to the war, how they react to what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. Can you walk me through how you're advising them, what you're advising them to you know, handle it at this time when it's very sensitive? I'd probably think about it in two ways. So first of all, we're obviously spending a ton of time on what are the practical implications, which vary by industry, and on big things like food security, uh, energy security, uh, impact to health. Uh, and you know, industries that are energy intensive, like a chemicals industry, as 35% um, energy as an input. You know, what? How, what, how might they prepare? So lots of you know work around what are the different types of things uh, to do. In most cases, our clients are really thinking about accelerating things they were already going to do. They wanted to be more energy efficient. Uh, they were already facing inflation, so taking out costs. And so there's a lot of conversations about the acceleration of existing programs. On the flip side, though, um, you know, many of my conversations with CEOs are much more philosophical about how do they make sure they're doing all the right things, whether it's a pandemic or a war, because kind of this this new level of volatility and uncertainty uh, has made us all sit back and reflect. And I'd say there's three really key things in my own learnings. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and in talking to many, many CEOs, in the last six months I've done 200 client meetings, for example. Uh, and I think there's three key things. And the first is um, leadership, right? And the focus that you have to have on who are your leaders, how do you develop them, do you have the right you know, clarity as to what are the leadership characteristics that are needed? So leadership, lots of conversations around that. The second is operational agility, and that comes from having the right cost structure, having invested in technology, having the culture to you know, move more quickly. So for example, at Accenture, we doubled from $2 billion to $4 billion the acquisitions that we did um, the first, uh, after the first six months of the pandemic because we had the financial strength to do it and we had the agility to be able to put our leaders on that. And you can see that in our results that our doubling down on investments helped us widen the competitive gap during the pandemic. And so operational agility and what that means and having a strategy around it is critical. And the third is courage. And that is the courage to change and to change quickly. And Two years after the pandemic was declared, we're seeing the, the organizations that had the courage to change early, right, are very differently positioned, and they've built a new muscle that is allowing them to, you know, deal with the latest crisis, uh, you know, in, in a better position than say they were going into the pandemic. I'm glad you noted courage because one question that I've been asked a lot is. What are the industries or the types of companies that had the courage to make the digital transformation in the pandemic? What are the types of companies that have not and have lagged? From your perspective, working with 200 client meetings in every six months, what are the industries that are ahead and behind? You know, I would probably flip the question a little bit because while you can objectively say you know, sort of retail has been ahead of oil and gas in aspects of digitization. What we see is actually a different picture, though, is by industry, we see there's about, say, 10% of companies who are leading in their digital transformation, even if their starting points relative to other industries are different. There's another 20% or so of, uh, of the clients that we serve, of companies in those industries, not just the clients we serve, who are what we call doing a leapfrogging. So our research shows that leaders and leapfroggers 
are touching two times the amount of processes, they're flipping their IT budgets from maintenance to innovation, and they're going all in on technology first. And um, in almost all of those cases, they're doing what we call compressed transformation. They're, uh, what they would have done sequentially, they're now taking on multiple parts of the enterprise in, in total enterprise reinvention as a goal. Uh, and then what we're starting to see now, though, two years in, is the percentages that are growing are really growing into that leapfrog category. And that's what continues to drive our own growth, right, is that you're starting to see more and more companies embrace that they have to have this compressed transformation. And you know, we believe that there is a paradigm shift going on. I mean, back in 2019 when I became CEO, I said over the next decade, uh, the disrupted would become the disruptors. And by that I meant the traditional companies, the incumbents who've been disrupted by uh, technology first companies would over the course of a decade catch up. That's happening much more quickly. And we believe that uh, what you're starting to see with these companies who early on embrace compressed transformation is that they will be the innovators and they'll do so with incredible resources behind them, brands, and very importantly, a deep commitment to their communities. Because so many of the world's largest companies have decades of commitment to communities. And I think it's gonna be quite powerful over the next decade. And I'm very optimistic, despite the environment we're living in, that this acceleration of the reinvention of the enterprise, the embracing of things like sustainability, those five forces, create an opportunity for us to have incredible progress. So if the traditional companies are becoming the disruptors, what happens to a lot of those direct-to-consumer companies that at the beginning of the pandemic we thought were super disruptive? Do they go to the wayside? Do they get acquired? What's the trend there? Probably all of the above, right? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and of course this is not, this isn't gonna happen overnight, but you see it, look at, you know, someone like Disney, right? We talked about this earlier. Um, you know, in incredible move into streaming, right? Uh, I mean, you are, you are seeing so much change, industry by industry, uh, and it, it is very much tied to those three things we go back to. Great leaders, right, a focus on that, operational agility, and the courage to change. When we talk about some of the other core values, you mentioned sustainability. I like that you mentioned commitment to communities. We are finding that there's more pressure on companies to take a stand on issues, to respond to constituents that aren't just their customers, but rather their employees, for example. And so I guess the question is, how do you measure success in these other types of investments that aren't necessarily business outcomes? Is there a way to do it? So um, let me just start with Accenture. A big change that we made starting last year uh, when we announced our earnings is that we announce our financial results and we talk about that we measure our success by what we call 360 degree value and what we've created from all of our stakeholders. So in our case, that covers diversity, sustainability, uh, the upskilling of talent and our commitments to communities. And so you will see that every quarter I talk about both. Now, behind that, then in December, we launched the 360 degree value um, experience where we're reporting on it in plain English and then uh, we took about 15 months and we now report against every major ESG framework and I'm very hopeful that someday they're all going to become one but in the meantime uh, we are completely transparent now let's if you've any of you actually looked at these frameworks they're not easy to to read or understand but we are very transparent and that's why we have the broader reporting experience uh, and so what does all this mean? Uh, if you start as a company with, there's lots of sustainable development goals out there, but what are relevant to your company? Where can you make an impact? You have a clear strategy. You're able to measure it first internally. You can there, therefore communicate that. My top 500 leaders have as their scorecard these same metrics, like we're gonna get to renewable energy 100% by 2024, we'll be gender equal by uh, 2025, they're embedded in the measurements of success internally and externally. But you have to start by defining what's relevant to you. 
And just to follow up on that though, a lot of these companies are publicly traded. When will we get to a point where Wall Street is evaluating the share price of these companies based off of how they're meeting those types of goals? Or is it always gonna be business performance for the foreseeable future? Well, I guess I'd maybe take a step back and say um, one of our stakeholders are shareholders and shareholder value creation is absolutely tied to financial results. And so I don't see it as an either or. When you think about your stakeholders, um, shareholders want to invest in companies that do think their purpose is broader. And so they'll look at all of those things. But if you don't have shareholder value creation, first of all, it's really hard to do things like invest in your communities, invest in your people without strong financial results. And so I think sometimes it gets too polarized. It's not an either or. And as I tell, especially kids coming out of college, I'm like, hey, we have to make money in order to be able to do great things in our community, make pay raises, do, you know, have promotions. And so I think it's important that we kind of move off the, you know, is it an either or? It's, it's necessary to do all. And focusing on shareholder value creation from a financial perspective is an equally important responsibility. That's a good point. Uh, we have just a few seconds and so at Axios, we like to land on one fun thing at the end of our newsletters, and we're gonna do that here with the interview. A few years ago, Accenture brought, bought Droga5, which was one of the premier sort of creative and design agencies. How has investing in creativity impacted your business? Um, almost everything we do is at the intersection of creativity, technology, and industry. And I was really excited when David Droga, who came to us through his agency, became the head of Accenture Interactive, which is a over $10 billion plus digital agency, on my, but sits on my leadership team as a direct report, because we need more creativity, not less, as we think about how we're gonna harness the five forces. So. Yes, especially the metaverse. So just a quick rack above of the things that we learned, a digital twin, replicating your manufacturing supply chain in the virtual universe, I had no idea. I thought it was interesting that the metaverse and uh, sustainability are two of your five big priorities. Super interesting that the group of companies that are considered leapfroggers is growing as the pandemic recedes. And I love what you said at the end about it's not either or when it comes to values and what shareholders need. And Julie, I hope your next six months you get a break and you don't have 200 client meetings, but if you do, best of luck. Julie Sweet, Sweet CEO of Accenture, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, on social using the hashtag What's Next Summit. Up next, we have a segment where we're going to learn about technologies that help us measure and optimize how we occupy space. Uh, Joining me, uh, join me on the stage is Andrew Farah, the co founder and CEO of Density. Andrew? <laughs> Um, Andrew, Density has developed a technology that can empower a company, a city, to better understand how people occupy space, how we can better optimize it. Let's think about that at scale. Um, one interesting stat, um, globally, uh, we, we have about 11,000 buildings being built every day. Uh, it accounts for about 39% of carbon emissions. Um, explain to us, what would it look like if we had density's technology deployed in every city so that they can understand how people are occupying and optimizing their space? I mean, I would be retired, most likely. Um, but I think, um, just for some clarity, we, we build a, a radar system that essentially understands or makes sense of how humans use space, so counts people in spaces like this. Um, and we do so anonymously, so it's, it's not a camera-based system. Um, I don't know that the scale of space is obvious to everybody. Um, in the U.S., there's 10.9 billion square feet of leased or owned corporate office space, and 41% of that is vacant but paid for, meaning about a trillion dollars of space is essentially sitting there with nobody in it. You know, it's like the conference room that doesn't get, get used, or the cafe that's not touched, or the workstation that's untouched, and that was pre-pandemic. So post-pandemic, in sort of a hybrid world, the need to understand how space is used becomes sort of increasingly important. Um, and I, I would imagine, like, 
What's really exciting is being able to have a feedback loop on how a city is used. You know, what, what would happen if New York City all of a sudden knew how it was used is a very exciting thing to contemplate. And I, I think largely everything would change. You know, energy use would change, access would change, the physical design of the space itself would change, and ultimately it would end in, you know, the modified skylines of cities, which is, which is really exciting. Oh, that's, uh, that's exciting. Um, another topic that's top of mind for many of us um, is the return to work, the return to the office. Um, you know, every CEO in America right now is battling with this conversation and thinking about uh, what is the best solution? What does the future of work look like? Um, from that context, like, what's the one big thing that you would share? What advice would you give executives who are right now grappling with this challenge of what the future of work is going to look like? Um, you know, I think that, I think we, we've sort of invested heavily in the technologies that, companies are investing heavily in the technologies that are gonna help bring folks back to the office and investing in the technologies that are gonna help people do distributed work of some kind. Um, but I think there's like a, a really important set of questions about how do we wanna make some of the work that we do in office look more like the work that we've been able to do distributed. So at least in our own offices, you know, you walk in and literally everybody is on Zoom with other folks in different offices around the country. Yeah. Um, how do you facilitate work where uh, you have this very strange mix of in-person and distributed? And I think Stuart mentioned it in his last sort of interview about, you know, I'll show up to an executive team meeting and, you know, everyone in the room will be on their own sort of uh, video um, because it's more equitable, it's easier for the team to hear everybody um, and so forth. And I think those types of changes are less about like how do we change to support distributed work and instead like what is distributed work teaching us about how to design physical spaces that, that we're in the same place about. Yeah. Um, and then the other uh, thing, you, you know, for, for density and for you, privacy is a big thing. Um, so how, how, what are, how can we get the answers that we need to make sure that we can advance and progress uh, the built environment uh, without compromising or creating a, a surveillance state? Uh, what can you share with us about that? Um, well, this was mentioned at uh, sort of the round table a little bit earlier, but um, I'm, I'm reasonably certain there isn't a future in which we continue to use buildings, continue to design and sort of occupy buildings and don't figure out how they're used. Um, it's just a question of whether or not we end up with like an accidental mass surveillance state, you know. Um, can, there, far greater things than deploying cameras everywhere. Yeah. And just to be crystal clear, we do not design cameras. Sorry, we do not design cameras. Um, but, you know, far, far greater changes have been made to policy and law and regulation and, and requirements on companies than, than distributing the infrastructure for mass surveillance. Um, and the pandemic is a phenomenal excuse to say, well, you know, let's just measure it all with some type of optical system. And I, I, I think if we're not careful, this sort of like, um, and, and I'm setting density aside, but like this, this sort of um, massive acceleration in investing in new infrastructure for buildings and cities that the pandemic has caused could result in something that we all very much don't like, which is you know, centralized understanding of who you are and where you've been and how long you were there and, and so forth. And that is, is not a world that I would like to live in. Um, and so at least a, as we think about our own product development, um, we like to use the concept of, um, you know, does this person or do these people or occupants have a reasonable expectation to privacy? Because if the answer is ever yes, you should be deploying something that is anonymous at source. Meaning like no gender, no age, no ethnicity at source. Incapable of measurement. Because you're then sort of operating under the assumption that you know, a vendor is gonna eventually get compromised. So, so that, I don't know if anybody remembers the um, target hack of 2013 or something like that. It was, you know, 300 million addresses and credit card numbers is the lar it was one of the largest compromises in history. And the way that, that um, Target got compromised was through one of their vendors. One of, one of their, it was a Fab Fabrizio um, Mechanical, or Fazio Mechanical, or something like that. It was a refrigeration company. And um, they got access to the refrigeration company. They got access then to Target's vendor portal, and they found all of this data in plain text. So, the same thing will happen with whatever the infrastructure may be at some point. And it would be much better if at source, when you got to it, you had something that was anonymous as opposed to something that could, you know, call out individuals. Yeah. 
Um, bringing uh, Density's technology closer to, to the event. Um, I know the Density crew uh, came to the venue. Um, can you share more with us uh, what they did and you know, why it matters? Yeah, so, um, so our current technology, uh, it sort of looks like the Marauders map from Harry Potter. It's, it's pretty cool. It's like, it's like a floor plan and, and then like, you know, humans uh, are, are sort of measured in three-dimensional point clouds um, and you, know, you all move around, we all move around, I'm a human. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did prior to this event, because the space was so beautiful, um, uh, is we had our, our Helix team come in, which does, and I, I think I heard it in the previous talk, a, a digital twin, and walk the building. And so um, what you're about to see, don't go quite yet, but what you're about to see is essentially, um, it is not a video, uh, so it's not uh, sort of 3D cameras, um, although that is one of the sensors. Um, it is essentially like down to the centimeter measurements of, of a space. So I guess, um, I think let's take a look is the cue that I'm supposed to give. Let's take a look. <laughs> so, so this is where we are right now. Um, and this was done uh, with a sort of a Voltron looking sort of shoulder mounted scanning system. And uh, what it creates is essentially a near perfect replica of like this building or any building. And um, what's exciting is that you're sort of moving beyond, this is essentially the evolution of a, of a floor plan. So instead of having a, a two-dimensional line drawing that you've you know, updated nine times and it's a PNG or a PDF and it's not quite exactly a scale or whatnot, you now have something that you could navigate that looks kind of like a video game, um, which I think is cool. And uh, what you're gonna see a little bit later this year is, oh, this is where we're sitting. Yeah, that's uh, right there. And now, now this is a this is a video that you're looking at, but it's actually a navigable system. So like you can, you know, go through and m move around and whatnot. Um, I should say this is you know, very, very. That's a lot of density. It's a very, very early um, sort of. Uh, we we recently sort of acquired a company that does this, and um, what's cool is that when you marry utilization data with um, you know what actual reality is represented as. You can start to do some really cool things. Like, you know, we've noticed that, uh, you know, all conference rooms that have a whiteboard seem to get used, you know, 98% of the day, and all those without a whiteboard don't. Um, let's just replay the day and see how humans in sort of three dimensions move through this space. Is something that is uh, going to become possible in the next few years. Excellent, um, Andrew. Uh, thank you so much for for joining us for yeah. such a great conversation. Uh, we will take a 15-minute break. Uh, there's snacks outside, and uh, we'll be back here in, in a few. Money. How we make, spend, and save it is changing. From touchless payments to cryptocurrencies and brand new ways to invest. New technologies, pandemic retail trends, and a growing savings gap have spurred the financial sector to evolve. This changing landscape is creating new options for investors and making it important to know what's next for finance. So that was just a sampling of the financial flux that we are seeing take place. And I am really happy to be here with all of you at our inaugural What's Next Summit. I have the great pleasure of welcoming and introducing Lynn Martin, the president of the New York Stock Exchange. Welcome. So for those of you who are joining today, thank you again for being here. For those of you who are tuning in on our live stream, make sure to follow the conversation. The hashtag is What's Next Summit. And Lynn and I were talking about this full circle moment for me at this stage because the last time I was in front or near as many people as I'm seeing now was on the floor of the stock exchange where mm -hmm. I spent nearly four years. You must be sort of used to this by now, but I wanted to start there because a lot of people I think still ask me what are the traders doing <laughs> on the floor still? I mean, everything is electronic. You know, we know about these systems. So I would love to just begin with the role that the stock exchange still plays, but also yep. more importantly, the people who are still there. Yep. Uh, thanks for having me today, Hope. It's lovely to be here today. And I'm thrilled to see so many people in person as well. It's like a homecoming seeing all these humans in, in person. Um, you know, the role of exchanges is to provide a framework for buyers to meet sellers. Um, sounds like a really simple objective, but there's a lot of complexity that goes into it. And our job is to ensure that during periods 
particular, particularly of increased volatility like we've seen over the last couple of months, that buyers meet sellers in an orderly and efficient and transparent way. So that's really what we pride ourselves on. Now, back to your question about the role of the floor brokers. The floor brokers are really unique to the NYSE's market model. And their role is to ensure that those companies that are part of the NYSE community, those issuers who have selected NYSE as their listing venue, to ensure that their stocks trade in an orderly, transparent fashion. And if I look back, because I'm a data girl and I'm a numbers girl at heart, um, if I look back over the last couple of months, those companies that have been listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the issuers have seen two times less volatility at the open and two times less volatility at the close. So the role of the traders, the role of the designated market makers are doing what they set out to do in their mission. And the New York Stock Exchange is a symbol, I think, for a, a lot of people uh, a symbol of the capital markets, a symbol of New York. Mm. I remember when the stock exchange decided that they had to close two years ago, and that was a really big deal. I think for a lot of people, that really brought it home that this pandemic was a serious thing. What have you learned about what the stock exchange really symbolizes in those past two years? Yeah, I mean, our job is to remain open. Um, it was very important to us to balance safety and security of those employees that were on the floor alongside of our mission of providing fair, transparent, and orderly markets. And most importantly, it was important to us to remain open in an electronic fashion to allow buyers to meet sellers, particularly during those really volatile periods we saw in March, April, and May of, of 2020. Um, you know, that's been our mission, stayed, we've stayed true to that mission, and we continue to stay true to that mission. And when you've seen the changes that have now fallen on your plate as you've just come in, yeah. the geopolitical tensions have rocked the markets. We know that there were some investors who were already were looking at the signs coming into 2022, mm -hmm. started to sell off. So we're looking at this year starting off in a very different way than the way that 2021 ended. How are those geopolitical tensions playing out in, in your day-to-day -day world? Yeah, there's been a lot of volatility in the markets. I think I'm probably staying the obvious for those either watching us today or that are in the audience. We've seen tremendous volatility. And the one thing that I don't think I had expected but was very grateful to my predecessors, Stacey Cunningham and Tom Farley, for investing in is the technology. So when I look back over the last three months, this past quarter, we have seen peak messaging rates. We've seen our top five messaging days across our platforms of almost half a trillion messages processed across our platforms each day, multiple times over the last three months, which is a bit baffling when you think about the amount of information that is coming through our pipes. Obviously, that volatility has been good for you know, trading volumes, liquidity in markets. The markets have operated as they can and they should in a very transparent fashion. The systems have held up. But what it's meant is the IPO markets have been a bit quieter than we had seen, particularly in 2021. Now, that's not something that's foreign to us. When you think about you know, past periods of volatility in markets, particularly 2019, we came into that year where the government shut down, a lot of tensions in, in DC. Um, in 2020, obviously we just talked about mm -hmm. how 2020 started off with a global pandemic. So the IPO markets do get quiet when there are periods of volatility. Um, and that's very much what we saw. But the demand is there. The amount of firms we are pitching at the moment, the amount of firms that are queued up to come to market as soon as volatility comes down is significant. So there's still a significant amount of companies that are looking to access the public markets to fund their operations, to develop capital, to raise capital, to invest further in their businesses. So the signs are there that we are gonna have a rebound when the volatility starts to, to abate, which I'm hopeful is soon. So companies you think are sitting on the sidelines right now trying to wait for the right time. Yeah, a big indicator that most public company CEOs or, or companies about to become public uh, CEOs that I talked to are talk, looking at the VIX. Mm -hmm. index, the volatility index. It's a great measure of volatility in the markets. It does feel like the VIX calmed down to that 20 and below barometer, which is key for a company that's looking to come to market. Right around the time that the Fed 
did what they said they were going to do, which was raise interest rates by a quarter of a basis point. That did seem to calm the market down. And I think there's been a realization that this Russia-Ukraine tension um, may be here for a bit of time. So markets have clearly baked, are starting to bake that potential reality into the way they're trading. I want to go back to listings um, in a little bit, but you know, on top of all of our minds is this crisis right mm. now in Ukraine. Larry Fink of BlackRock recently wrote in his letter that he believes the era of globalization that we've seen over the past 30 years is coming to an end. Do you agree with him? I don't know that I would say that I agree or disagree. You know, it's certainly awful what is happening in the Ukraine. Um, it's caused us all to pause and think about, you know, the way we we transact our operations, and we can only operate on the basis of the information that we have in front of us. For example, you know, when sanctions got imposed, we decided to halt the Russian issuers who had stocks listed on NYSE, and as that you know, week progressed, and we saw what some of the index-based funds were doing, we wound up halting the ETFs that were also issued on NYSE. So I'm gonna be the eternal optimist, though, and halts are mean that the stocks are closed, and I'm hopeful that the world can get back to a, a global economy. Well, as both leaders of, of the capital markets in your own right, right, both Larry Fink and yourself, the other thing that he mentioned in his letter was around the idea that being able to access the capital markets is a privilege and not a right. Do you agree mm -hmm. with that? Uh, you know, I think our capital markets in the U.S. are the greatest in the world. We are the envy of the world, and we provide access to investors with the greatest amount of investor protection. That's been a system that has been developed, honed, and uh, tweaked throughout multiple crises, throughout multiple uh, wars, throughout pandemics, whatever the case may be. So I'd say that we continue to be the shining star and the, the symbol that the rest of the world should strive to be in terms of capital raising. And I also bring it up because I think what he's implying also in this is that companies have a choice of where they want to do business. Mm -hmm. And what role do you think the stock exchange, for example, plays? What role do you think you play in choosing maybe the companies that you also want to work with? Have you ever looked at a company and said, this is not a company we want listed on the well, stock exchange? Well, we have a variety of stringent listing standards, and we welcome all companies to the extent that they meet our listing standards. We have a different threshold than other exchanges in terms of uh, the amount of capital that, that a company would need to have on their balance sheet and different governance standards um, in order to be listed on the stock exchange. And that's why, you know, when we look at our companies, they're the entrepreneurs, they're the innovators, they are the envy of the global economy. And when you think about some of the more emerging risks that investors are worried about, such as environmental, social, and governance, which I'm sure you've heard today, you look at the NYSE community and we continue to lead the way through example of how our companies think about those types of factors, those types of disclosures, diversity on boards, things of that nature. World's largest stock market, I mean, you, you do serve as a role model, I think, for, for the rest of the world. Uh, going back to deals, so I think based on EY, IPO activity in the Americas region was only about 37 in this first quarter. That's a decline of 72% uh, compared to just uh, the year yep. ago, period. Yep. SPACs were a huge part of last year's uh, mm -hmm. activity. I think it was like 600 SPACs uh, you know, came to market out of 1,000, which was a benchmark. You're seeing a lot of um, skepticism, nervousness around SPACs. What's your outlook for this year? So, I mean, SPACs are an interesting way that companies can come to market. They represent yet another innovation in the market, SPACs, direct listings, um, traditional IPOs, and we think all of those avenues are good to allow more and more companies to come to market. That said, the SEC just came out with additional potential regulation around SPACs, and I think that you know balances investor access as well as investor protection. So it makes sense that a newer mechanism for companies to come to market may have additional uh, regulation placed on it. Do you think that SPACs deserve more scrutiny? I think that anything that adds transparency to markets and any time you can add transparency on a variety of factors, I think that's a good thing for public markets. You are a data girl. Uh, you have background <laughs> in statistics. You know that data is the underlining driver of all of the businesses that are on your, uh, your exchange that are you know, the, the crux of really um, companies today. 
what have been some of the biggest changes that the New York Stock Exchange has made to improve the data efficiency on your networks? Yeah, I mean, continued uh, investment in the underlying systems to handle the throughput of the messages that I talked about. Uh, one thing we very much saw during the pi pandemic was firms gearing up on their disaster recovery sites um, and enabling their systems to be fully functional from home, so ensuring that we had the right level of access available. But then also, uh, through some of our affiliates, we're focused on adding transparency to a variety of opaque markets. Uh, for example, the business that I ran prior to stepping into this role was our fixed income and data services business. And that business provides real-time valuations on 2.8 million securities, fixed income securities, around the globe on a real-time basis. That's a very opaque asset class. It's very different than the stock market. Um, you know, the muni markets, for example, are incredibly different. So, We've always been more of the philosophy that more information adds more transparency, and more transparency makes for a better liquidity in a market. And that's been our focus on the investment side, and will continue to be our focus on the investment side. A lot of Wall Street banks are getting into crypto, whether it's trying to open up direct access through funds mm -hmm. or creating their own exchanges. There were some patent filings mm -hmm. that uh, recent reports have uncovered with the New York Stock Exchange. Will the New York Stock Exchange become an exchange for crypto? Yeah, I mean, it's not something that's planned at the moment. We had filed for patent protection around NFTs and the metaverse and crypto, um, mainly because we wanted to get smarter about it. You know, if you look back, we actually made an early stage investment in Coinbase in 2015. We invested about $10 million, $10 million in Coinbase. We exited that stake uh, the end of last year, and the reason why we made that investment was to get smarter about the space. It led to some other innovations that we did within our holding company, including a company called Bact, which attempted to make the crypto transfer reliable and secure. And that's a business we just recently spun off into a SPAC combination. Um, but you know, we've also made a variety of investments uh, alongside in this vein. A company called T0 we just recently made an investment in, and that's very similar. We wanted to get smarter about just the whole idea of digitization and what that's going to look like to further add efficiency and transparency to, say, a little bit more less efficient or a little less efficient areas of the ecosystem. Today's all about what's next. Is it pretty much inevitable that the stock exchange will have crypto on its exchange or adding some services to accommodate the interest in the space right now? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's an area that you know we continue to look at with interest. Um, you know, we're continuing to look at what the regulation around the crypto markets will be. That's an area that is still a bit open, I would say, and it's uh, still something that I know the SEC, from my talks with them, is still thinking about as to whether it's a security, whether it's a currency, whether it's a commodity. So. I would say it's something that you know we continue to, to monitor closely. And for those of you who read Axios newsletters, my thought bubble would be that it would rather probably be inevitable, but we, <laughs> we'll, we'll check in with you in, in a couple of years. Um, one of the things that has come up recently um, you know, in the past year is um, a, a threat of sorts that your predecessor made, uh, warning that the stock exchange may leave New York um, if new tax on stock trades were implemented. Is that threat still, is still a, 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 a viable one? It's not something we're currently contemplating at the moment. And the other thing about the New York Stock Exchange in terms of the history is that it's you know one of the oldest exchanges in the mm -hmm. world, and there are lots of exchanges popping up everywhere, whether it's crypto, whether it's used clothing. I mean, everything is a marketplace yep. these days. For anyone who's looking at our conversation today and, and seeing how you build your marketplace, what would you tell them is the best thing to do in building a marketplace the right way for the, for the long-term future? I think the right way to do it is to disclose the rules associated with the marketplace and be very transparent about the rules associated with the marketplace. It makes for a better experience for everyone to know exactly what the rules of the environment that they're operating in. It's why, you know, when when we t you mentioned crypto, I think the one thing that is inevitable there is there will be additional regulation around that market. I think there's going to be additional regulation around a lot of markets. And that just comes back to the participants need to know what the rules are in order to add the highest level of transparency and liquidity to whatever the asset class is. One of the other big changes over the past year has been 
the influx of retail investors, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the meme stocks or you're seeing a lot of retail trading apps now proliferate and become very, very popular. How has that changed your business? I think it's great that there are the additional, the new class of retail investors in the market. It shows the confidence in the markets. It shows uh, the fact that the investors, the moms and pops, do actually believe in the long-term future of the stock exchange and uh, of lit exchanges. So I'm very excited about, about this new class of traders. They're a different breed of trader, though, so it's something that, from our perspective, we're focused on providing them as many tools to help them make informed decisions as possible. As you said, and as I said, I'm a data girl, so at the end of the day, if I can provide tools and services to someone to help them make a much more informed decision about risk management, that's always going to be something that's at the forefront of, of my mind. It's funny that you used the word, you know, breed or class, because mm -hmm. one of the things that sort of came up for a lot of the retail traders was they felt like they were being treated like they were somehow lesser than, right, than the institutional. They, they felt like um, they were being condescended to for, you know, certain networks and, and, mm -hmm. and reports. And, and I wonder if you feel that there is a different way that companies treat retail investors than they might institutional investors or an attitude that maybe you think needs to change. I think uh, because retail has emerged through the pandemic and it's been here to stay, it's something that has lasted through the two years. It's not a fleeting trend. And I do feel as though those concerns that have been expressed by the retail investor have very much been heard. I know, for example, some of the wealth platforms are very focused on attracting the retail investor, providing them with the type of research maybe a little lower touch research than the institutional investor is used to, but providing with them with some research so that it enables them to make a much more informed decision. All right, last question before we get to our one fun thing. Um, <laughs> what is the biggest threat to capitalism right now? You know, I would say um, a big threat to capitalism is probably the, the challenges that we see geopolitically. Um, I am concerned that this will have knock-on effects from a policy perspective uh, in terms of allowing you know, companies to come to the US, raise money in the US, and at the end of the day, that is a good thing for the investing public. It's a good thing for global investors. It's a good thing for US investors. I would hate to see any sort of bifurcation that occurs as a result of the geopolitical environment. And just to bring it back full circle to our first topic, which is the pandemic, what was one habit that you picked up um, that you didn't expect you would ever pick up? Yeah, so I became, I am a big fitness fan. Um, I'm a very big boutique fitness fan, so I was a big fan of going into the studios, and the one thing I never thought I was gonna pick up was the online fitness craze. So I, like many other people, um, bought a Peloton and used it actively, still do use it actively, but not just for cycling, the one thing that I, that I found surprising that I used it more for was you know, meditation and yoga and the ancillary courses. All right, and just like that, that's our time. Lynn Martin, thank you, such a pleasure and honor thank to you. be with you today, thank you. Hello, hello, hello. I'm Sarah Cahill Lanigu, Editor-in-Chief at Axios. Thank you for still being here. I hope you've been energized by this afternoon. Uh, just a quick reminder for those who are watching uh, us online, I encourage you to follow us on Twitter and use that hashtag, What's Next Summit. And now, I'm super pleased to, to introduce our next guest. She's the president and CEO of TIAA, Tashonda Brown Duckett. Welcome to Shonda. Thank you, it's so great to be here live and in person. I know, I know, we've been enjoying it. I wanna get right into it because you have such an interesting personal story. You are one of only two black women running a Fortune 500 company in 2022, which is pretty amazing. Um, but, <laughs> Thank you. so a lot of people are looking at your leadership and you have an interesting personal story that I think informs what you do. I've heard you talk about how your father 
worked at Xerox for a very long time, yeah. and then when it came for him to retire, you learned that he didn't have enough money right. to retire, and, and, and he had, you know, hadn't saved enough. And I, I'm dying to ask you, I mean, that must inform so much of what you do and how you lead one of the biggest financial institutions that helps people save for retirement. Yeah. So I, I'd love for you to, to tell us about that. Well, it's so great to be here. And we're just going to jump right into the personal story. <laughs> um, I'm sure all of us can relate to knowing that your parents do the best they can financially, and sometimes their best is insufficient. And then all the work and sacrifice that they have provided, especially my parents, Otis and Rosie Brown, enabled me to go to college, graduate, and then come home. And you have that conversation with your parents, somehow we got on money. And I saw my father's statement. And when the daughter has to tell the father that you don't have enough to think about retiring. I didn't know I was going to be a CEO of a Fortune 100 company at that time. I was making around $26,000. But the fact that my father didn't have enough what was really disturbing is that he never contributed to his 401k. This is a man who worked for over 40 years. And to know that there was something for him that would match his contribution, when all of his life he worked hard to provide for his children, that was a hit different. <laughs> and so when you say, how has that shaped my leadership? It's in a real profound way. It shaped me in understanding the character from which I was raised. That my father told me to reach for the moon because even if I missed, I would be among the stars. And I get to do that, even when there are ceilings that you have to bust through. It taught me empathy because he did the best that he could, but he didn't have the right information, the right connection, the right level of wherewithal to do better even though he wanted better. And so as a leader, when I think about financial inclusion, when I think about financial equity, I think about my father. And that drives me to ask the second, the third, the fourth question. Not to say, do we have something on the shelf? Do we have great benefits? But who's participating and who's not participating? How are we communicating in a way that someone like Otis Brown can see that that benefit is for him? and ultimately allow someone like Otis Brown to have a better future. And so I get the privilege to lead a company where every day I wake up and I think about Otis Brown, and P.S., my mother is a retired educator. So I get to think about Otis in Rosie Brown when I think about how do you lead a company like TIA whose whole mission is anchored on people being able to retire with dignity mm -hmm. and not in poverty. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story. I think it's so inspiring, and I think a lot of people can relate to that, actually. And I want to dig in a little bit about, yeah. you talk about retiring with dignity. Yeah. dignity. And the reality is, though, even though there's been headlines, and we've written a lot of these stories about Americans saving more during right. the pandemic than they did before, the reality is half of Americans haven't saved at all, haven't right. saved anything for retirement. And then there are, within that, those who have, there are huge gaps. Okay. There are gaps between what women have at the end of their careers and men. Okay. They have a lot less. Uh, there are differences along <laughs> racial lines okay. as well, of course, and there's a lot that goes into that. But how do you address those yeah. gaps in thinking about uh, your own experience and, and, okay. and as in what you do? No, I, you know, I, I think as a leader, you always start with the facts. And as you said, you know, the truth is 40% of all Americans will run out of money in retirement. And then when you disaggregate the data, which is why we can never get comfortable with the law of averages, because you'll never find where the real opportunities exist for that do better. And so when you look at the stats and you see that 83% of black seniors do not have enough to retire, and you think about that circle impact when that same you know, parent is being needing to be helped by their daughter who's also raising her kids, how are we going to shift the gap? So what do we do? There's three things that I would anchor on. Um, first, we have to talk about the access gap. Secondly, we have to talk about the savings gap. 
And then lastly, I would say lifetime income solutions. And so when I think about the access gap, and clearly there's a lot of lack of access for, for so many, but I would say you know, a third of um, working Americans working in the private sector do not have access to an employer-sponsored retirement plan. That is an issue. And so how do we make sure with policy and working with you know, other companies that we can make sure that more Americans have access to that employer plan? Secondly, when you think about um, savings, and I share that 40% stat, you know, how do we make sure that we're providing opportunity for people to get on a path to saving, getting on a path to have companies uh, match and contribute? And clearly, when you think about the pay equity gap for women and you think about the, the pay equity gap for you know, people of color, we have to understand that if we're not you know, solving it on the front end, when we think about pay equity, and if we're not you know, providing opportunities for mobility, then you'll get to that 30% gap for women. And so when we think about that savings gap, I think the opportunity for all of us as leaders is to really make sure we're disaggregating the data when we look at you know, our pay by different levels, that we're looking at mobility you know, by race and gender and ethnicity to make sure that all are able to have that real opportunity. And then we're making sure that we're doing all we can with technology and other levels of insights to help people get to that snackable action you know, that real next best action when you think about getting on a path to savings. And then finally, when I think about lifetime income, the reality, as I said, people are running out of money. And so how do we make sure that in addition to Social Security, which we know is not enough to replace your everyday expenses, how do we make sure that people have access to guaranteed income, which is something that we really focus on at TIA so that people can never run out of money, I think is very important. Thanks for, for outlining that to us. And, and, you know, just speaking of the news, um, last week the House passed uh, the SECURE yes. Act bill. Uh, it's not passed the Senate yet, but that is supposed That's to address exactly right. some reforms in retirement. That's policy is one part of it. Yes. Education is another part of it. But I guess uh, for those who haven't been following the latest with the bill, will that really address and what's in that bill? Would that really address some of the gaps that you're talking about? Yeah. What still needs to be added? Yeah, I mean, the reality is we know there's not one thing when you're talking about something as big as closing the retirement gap and making sure that all Americans can retire with dignity. But I will say policy matters. And what I will say is that the work um, that's been happening for years with SECURE Act 1.0 and now 2.0 in a bipartisan way is a really big step. And so one of the things that we're hoping that will continue to complement the bill is to embed the ability to have access to guaranteed income within the default. And so punchline, great progress. Yes, it's a step. It's a positive step. And yes, we think there's a few more steps that can be done to really uh, be able to make even accelerated progress in helping to close the retirement gap. But I do commend um, the work in that it was done on a bipartisan way I think is a great example of you know, the work that has to be done to solve a problem that is definitely an American problem, not a partisan problem. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about leadership in general. We've had a lot of conversations about the workplace so far, and part of what's next is, I think, what's next and what's <laughs> required of leadership in this moment. And in this pandemic, a lot of companies have been forced to really evaluate, and we've had some great conversations in our breakout sessions about what's required now of companies as they think about how to retain, recruit, and support the employees uh, that they need. And I guess I just, you know, what, how do you think, how has your thinking and your approach changed in particular after these last two years? Yeah, I mean, if you just, sometimes we don't take a step to think about what has happened over the last two years. So we know the, the macro environment with the pandemic. We know there are wildfires on the West Coast. We know the murder of George Floyd. We know that maybe we learned for the first time that our children learn differently and that we clearly are not equipped to educate our children on our own. Um, but we also got insight into how people were living their lives. And if you all remember, for the first period of time, we all tried to act like we had it all together. We still wore our full suit. We still was <laughs> like, life is good. And then we hit the bottom, unless I'm the only one. Did anyone else hit bottom <laughs> over the last few years? And then at that point, you know, the baby's popping up on the screen. You know, you're looking a hot mess. And you're doing all that you can to keep it together. I share that insight 
Because as we think about now, what is the next chapter of return to office or how do we think about the workplace? We have to think about mental health. We have all hit rock bottom and it had to be okay to not be okay. We all had to give the truth of trying to live our full life and recognizing that it's messy and that our boss and our, our colleagues experienced our mess. We also have to think about the fact of what choices did people learn that they love and that they don't want to give back. And so to me, when we think about the future, when I think about leadership, it's empathy. I think senior leaders have to bring empathy to the boardroom. I think with that empathy, you, we have to focus on how do we define our culture in a way that provides differentiation. And it's not just about is it no days at work, one day, two. If we only anchor on the count of the days, we'll miss the point, in my humble opinion, on what people are really saying. For me, it is about saying how do we lead with empathy? How do we understand the backdrop and the impact of technology? And how do we provide a differentiated culture experience where people can feel like they don't have to compartmentalize work and balance life, which does not reconcile. And so I am excited to, to, quite frankly, to say that I don't have all the answers. And I'm excited to say that we get to experiment, we get to try new things, but most importantly, we get to be really clear on who we are, what is our value proposition, and how do we make sure that we are equipping our frontline managers, the ones that are most proximate to our colleagues, to be able to listen, to be able to make sure we're listening and taking in that in input, but also making sure that we can be agile. I think the biggest disruption that we have not yet experienced in our country or around the world is human capital. We have not really changed our practices the way we have changed and innovated our technology, the way in which we innovated um, our products and services. I think we have to innovate human capital around benefits, around work life, around how do people want to experience work and how do we do that in a way that's accretive to delivering value for our participants, delivering value for themselves, and then ultimately delivering value for the larger community. Well, I don't think I've heard too many CEOs before uh, this today talk about empathy as much and mental health in particular. Yeah. So I do think that that's fascinating to share and, and super important. But I guess I wonder, today at least, I've heard a lot of women leaders talk about those things. Do you think women leaders are better at this? Um, at this moment? As a woman leader, <laughs> um, I can say that for many women, you know, we are not just leading a company. And even though, you know, we have great support, my husband is a stay-at-home dad and, and super dope, but I'm still mom, which means, you know, I still have a real important role that I cannot proxy away or delegate fully away. And so when we think about empathy and when we think about mental health, we're not just saying what we think, we're saying what we've experienced and we're being open and vulnerable to talk about it because I think that's where our strength lies. And so I do think that um, having women in leadership and hopefully more than 41 running a Fortune 500 when it's all said and done, I think there are new perspectives, additional perspectives that women can bring, which is the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's perspective. And I know that being a woman, being a black woman, being a woman running a company in raising children and trying to make an impact and taking care of the family and all the things that we do, I think that we can bring a unique perspective that will be additive when we think about culture. Mm -hmm. But the men can do it too. You just have to be willing to be a little vulnerable and get a little proximate to you know, not being okay, not having it all together. That's it's right. okay. You too, men, you can do it. Yes. Um, Let's talk a little bit about representation um, because I think that a lot of uh, women do look up to you. They see who you are. You bring your whole lived yes. experience, as we talked about, to your job. And this, com this country has not just in the past years had the pandemic, but I think a big conversation, an important conversation that's um, been elevated around racial injustice. And a lot of companies said a lot of things, threw a lot of money at this, um, but how are we doing? I guess what needs to be done, particularly from where you sit in terms of leadership at the C-suite level? Progress is not a straight line. You know, pressure makes diamonds, and you know, I think we've all been under a lot of pressure, and so I'm hoping 
that some real good diamonds will come out of it. But when you think about the fact that there's currently only two black women running Fortune 500, myself and Roz, and you think that the first was Ursula Burns, the CEO of Xerox, and that decades went by before the second and the third came about, um, you feel hopeful, you feel disappointed, but I think what we have to do is recognize that it is a mindset, and the mindset has to start in the boardroom because ultimately the board decides who's going to run the company. And so I think it is important to make sure that the board has that diverse perspective or has strong allyship with an anchored mindset that talent is created equally, opportunity is not. And that the way in which leadership can show up, that there's different, different muscles that can be expressed that can ultimately run companies. So I think it is a mindset shift that has to take place in order to make real sustainable progress. I do think we can't just rely on the emotion of what we all had to sit and watch. That is not a unique experience, unfortunately, but one that we all sat and watched. Well, when the emotion fades and when the narrative shifts, what are we left with? We have to be left with disaggregating the data and recognizing where do we see opportunities we have to then look at our practices and policies to say if we really want to have a different outcome, what practices or policies do we need to think differently about? And then lastly, what gets measured gets done. And that when you think about the commitments that you know, we all have made, I think that we have to operate with intentionality. We have to understand that the job is not done in a quarter. The job will be done quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter, and the reality is the job is never done when you're talking about progress. So my hope mm -hmm. is that though we're not where we want to be, I do know that there are a lot more conversations happening. I do know that there's a lot more intentionality happening across all sectors, but I do think that we have to continue to hold ourselves accountable to saying if the real job is to make sure that we have equity, if the real job is to make sure that more people can have access to you know, financial equality, then it cannot just be a moment in time that makes us get excited. It has to be part of the structure, the underlining chassis that mm -hmm. says we're committed to doing the work. So more to be done. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, really enjoyed this conversation. It's been real, it's been inspiring okay. and really thoughtful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, <laughs> pleasure. Yeehaw, you're still here, I love it. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Steve Boland, who is the Chief Administrative Officer at Bank of America. Steve. Thanks for doing this. I am a CEO and you are a CAO. What do you do? What does that mean? What is a Chief Administrative Officer? The question, then I'll explain what I do. The, the question everyone's <laughs> asking. Um, you know, it, it's a series of staff functions that range from public policy to ESG, global corporate security, all of our external and internal communications, and then the, the most fun part of my job, according to my kids, which is I'm responsible for global sports sponsorships. Whoa, that's like, that might be the coolest part of your uh, portfolio. There it is. What does that mean? What do you do with that? You know, we have everything from, I just got back from Augusta National, where we uh, sponsored the Augusta uh, National Women's Amateur Tournament. We saw the most amazing young women golfers compete on the grounds of Augusta National, which was neat. And, uh, you know, we uh, you know, support, you know, sports and teams and, and, and events and communities around the world. And do you get to pick which sports, which teams, which events you get engaged in? So what we, what we try to do, and this is kind of our global but local reach, is we have our local market, ex uh, market presidents in the U.S. and our country executives outside the U.S., and we ask them to tell us which are the most important ones for us to partner with, and that's how we go about it. Then my team puts it together. Uh, amazing. Uh, Steve has a very broad portfolio, as he just described. Uh, fill in the blank. Uh, at this moment, my biggest obsession is blank. Wow, biggest obsession. It, it, it is really about how do we move on and get back to normal. And, and, and it is, that covers our employees, getting them back to the office, getting them comfortable about getting back to normal. It's about our clients, getting them past the pandemic period. It's about our communities. It's really about how do we all get back to normal. Let's talk about the employee part of that equation. 
How many people work at the bank, roughly? A little over 205,000. That's a lot. And they're scattered around the world. The pandemic hits like everyone else. Everybody's remote. That's a big army you yeah. got to move around. And you've got a big banking system uh, to keep going. How do you think about that? What are the more unorthodox steps that the bank took to make sure that you had employees who could do the job they needed to do, but do it from anywhere? Yeah, you think about that. Like you said, you've got a couple hundred thousand people and we immediately say, let's everybody go home. You've now got a job to do. You've got to get everybody laptops. You've got to make sure they've got the internet access and capability and screens, not to mention taking care of health and safety making sure they had PPE, masks, sanitizer, gloves, all the things that they need to keep themselves and their families healthy. And then you had the work that we needed to do. We still right. need to help take care of our clients, right? And so it's whether our clients who needed to understand how they could access digitally what they might have come into a financial center and done physically before, or working on the administration's program through the Small Business Administration, and I galvanized 15,000 people around the world to process 500,000 PPP applications and deliver $35 billion in loans to right. our small business clients. It's, I mean, it, every day we were, we were figuring it out what right. we needed to do next. Well, and you have, when we send people home, we're not really dealing with regulators. You've got huge parts of your company that are dealing with massive layers of regulation and therefore regulators. Were there, were there parts of the company that were harder to figure out and sort of strategize on how I can move this into a remote environment? It, it, it's really kind of less about the regulators. We have an extraordinary infrastructure to support the control environment. And it really was about how do our clients know what we're doing for them? So for instance, in our financial centers, you know, some of our financial centers weren't gonna be able to be open, but we still need to be able to serve clients or quickly pivoting to the fact that maybe we could, you know, in the height of the pandemic, we had dedicated hours for some of our most vulnerable clients, some of our older clients, and, and, and giving them dedicated time to come in. It, it was that kind of thing that we were really kind of working through. You have been with the bank for a long time, and you used to be president of retail, am I mm -hmm. correct? And now you've got this portfolio that sort of sits atop everything. What's the difference between being a president at a company like yours versus being a chief administrative officer? Yeah. So every day as president of the retail bank, my job was driving that retail business, taking care of 35 million clients. Every day to day, it's how do I support all eight lines of business around the world? Uh, it was a very domestic-based job, and, and my job is more global today. Also, if, if you think about some of the work that we do, I just think about some of the work we're doing uh, you know, around the environment and climate change, and, and, and we're looking to support a just transition to a low carbon economy. So it, it's how do we support getting 250 billion in sustainable financing, which is what we just announced this week that we did last year. Right. And, and I partner with our colleagues to be able to make something like that happen, or work that we did around racial equality and economic opportunity, putting together a program with my former retail colleagues to have $15 billion commitment to affordable housing. It, it, you know, it, it, it ranges and every day is incredibly different in terms of what we're working on. You're about six months into the new gig, right? Mm -hmm. is, it, is part of it hard power versus soft power? If I'm running a line, you're responsible for, for a P&L, right? And you're responsible for a very specific number. Now you're not, but you have to cut across to everything. And does it require a different set of skills and sort of a softer hand or a more diplomatic approach to doing your job? Yeah, actually, it's interesting. I think the difference now, I have a reason that I can just butt my nose in anywhere. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I touch every part of the company and I, I, I support Brian Moynihan, our CEO, in every part of the company. But you know, here's an interesting thing about how we're organized. So, so we in the United States have 93 market presidents. They run each of the markets. Yep. And what that enables us to do is be this huge global company that can be incredibly powerful locally. So if you take right here in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., Larry Dorita, who is you know, the, the president for, for Washington, D.C., you know, we, 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 we had a, an effort. Um, we wanted to get all of our employees uh, to get vaccinated against COVID-19 and get boosted. And we'd also been talking with our community partners about dealing with issues around food insecurity. So we launched this plan, and we said we'll give $100 to a food bank for every employee who got boosted. The way that manifests itself, right here in Washington, D.C., we ended up, I think we donated like 150000 to Capital Area um, uh, Food Bank. 
but that was part of 10.6 million that we were able to do across the country. Right. It, it, it's galvanizing those 93 market presidents to bring all of our capabilities to bear in each and every community we participate in. If I'm one of the 200,000 plus working at the bank now, do I have to come in every day? Uh, we want you in every day. Uh, so we've been inviting our employees back in uh, and, and, you know, we, uh, we remind everybody, you know, it's interesting, by the way, you've got a group of employees who couldn't wait until we invited them back in because right. they missed that collegiality, they missed that opportunity to interact. Um, and then we've got some that, that you know, it, it took a little bit because it's, it's, it's a little odd after two years of not coming in. But we want everybody back in. We are a work from office culture and um, we think that you get a lot out of collaboration, you get a lot out of uh, mentorship and, and um, the, the collegiality we all get being back together. What if I don't, I say no? Well, you know, what we're talking employees about is we, we need to come back into the office. A separate question is this question that I think uh, industries are talking about around work-life work flexibility. So we're getting everybody back in and, and we're engaging with, with our employees around that topic, but, but you know, we need employees who have a job where, that require them to be back in the office. We've asked them to come back in and we're seeing them coming back. When you're talking to Brian, uh, your boss, do you ever worry that that will put you at a competitive disadvantage? You know, we had the, the founder of Bolt up here, you know, an hour ago saying you can work from wherever, you only have to work four days a week. That sounds pretty cushy yeah. to some compared to what it might be like at the bank. Do you worry about that, that that, that requiring or sort of, you know, pretty uh, heavily nodding and, and, and nudging people to, to come into the office that that might scare off some talent that you want? No, I don't. And, and you know, the, the, the important thing is, this is not a binary question about work from home or work from the office. I think the reason people come to work at Bank of America and are like me who've been here for 27 plus years, I told you, you know, earlier, um, is because of everything that we have to offer, right? We have, um, you know, we announced, you know, back, uh, I, I can't remember, it was in 2020, uh, we went to a $20 minimum wage, so we're going to 25 by 25, and we're raising the minimum wage a dollar each year. Um, we have great policies for maternity and paternity leave. Our lowest paid employees haven't seen increases uh, in their uh, health care premiums in a decade. It, it's all of those pieces that make it a great place to work. Our employee networks, which encourage people to come together. And I'll tell you, yesterday I did a, a town hall in Charlotte, and we had people back together in an auditorium uh, one, for the, one of the first times when we had a chance to talk to them about the company. Not only was the auditorium full, we offered some lunch after. You couldn't get people to separate and go back because they were, it was like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in two years and I want to catch up. And, and so we know that that happens once you just kind of get over the hump and get back. So we, we actually think it's an advantage in terms of the culture of our organization and, and, and what it's meant for, for so many years and for so many years more. We spent time with Brian over the years. I feel like we have a, a good read on him. Uh, Larry Dorita, who runs the operation around here, have a good... Uh, read on him. Tell us, tell the audience, like, what is it, what is the Bank of America culture? Like, what makes it different working at BOA versus JPMC or any other sort of institution or other company that you've worked with over the years? Yeah. So, you know, ev everyone has what is their um, values and, and, and what have you, and what's their purpose. We have ours, which is, you know, helping make the financial lives of our clients better through the, the power of every connection. And, and our values come back to when I talk about working together, it is about um, delivering together, acting responsibly, trusting uh, in your teammates. Um, but you know what I think makes this place special is who we are um, at our core in terms of how we help our communities. You know, Brian talks about the genius of the and. He talks about the ability to be able to deliver for our shareholders, for our clients, and for our communities. And, and that's what we're doing. And so it, it is something that as simple as, um, uh, you know, the notes I got um, from people when we uh, announced uh, the giving that we were gonna do uh, to support uh, uh, victims from the conflict that's happening between Russia and Ukraine right now and, and, and employees of Ukrainian descent reaching out and saying, thank you for doing this, allowing them to be able to match. We dropped our minimum match to a dollar plus we gave a million dollars to help with that. Um, it is um, what we do in terms of, um, the, I talked about the food bank and what we're doing, our commitment to environmental, our 
partnership with, with organizations like Special Olympics. I think it's all of those that make the fabric of who we are. And then, of course, what we do every day for clients, right? We're the, we're the largest small business lender, largest consumer bank. We um, um, deliver every single day for clients, and our employees get excited about that, even that Paycheck Protection Program. And I ask people to work virtually around the clock, holidays, weekends, what have you. I was getting notes from people saying thank you. Why? Because what they saw was we cared about helping small business owners get to the other side, and, and that's what they bought into was the spirit and fabric and culture of this company. Part of your portfolio is uh, overseeing diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and a lot of efforts related to that uh, internally and externally uh, at the bank. And talk a little bit about w what works. Like there's been a lot of, uh, everyone's obsessed with this topic. I think every company uh, says that they, they care a lot about it. I think most are sincere uh, when they say it. But do we, what does it mean to you? And, and, and how, how do you think the bank approaches it differently? Or how in your new role do you approach it differently? Yeah. Well, so. You know, you have the work that we do around racial equality and economic opportunity. We do that in terms of housing, in terms of health, in terms of jobs, schools, and education. But when you start to talk about the, this topic of diversity, I serve as a vice chair for our Global Diversity and Inclusion Council. Our chairman and CEO, Brian Moynihan, serves as chair. There's a reason that's important, because that means that you set the tone from the top. And so, um, you know, when we talk about representation, the fact that A, that he chairs this community, th this council. The second being that you look at the representation in our boardroom, on our executive management team, throughout our company, we strive very hard to reflect you know, the, the communities that we serve. And Brian has been um, passionate about, in our quarterly business reviews, holding each of us accountable, report out what we're doing around that. And so um, it, it is, uh, it's that, that, that passion from the top that really helps drive it. Steve, as we wrap here, I think everybody in the audience, at least the physical audience here, is from the D.C. Uh, area. We're about to have an interview uh, with the mayor. What's like the one kind of new cool thing that the bank's doing in D.C. that we should all be aware of? Yeah, well, we just announced today uh, an investment here, uh, $39 million to create more affordable housing units. We've been looking at issues in southeast and southwest D.C., a million and a half in philanthropic gift to create the first elevated public park and bridge to connect um, communities. And we think it's things like that where you bring philanthropy, you bring the ability to invest, you bring the ability to lend that helps us be able to invest in communities. Again, global but local. You nailed the landing. Thanks, Steve Bolton. Appreciate it. Cities. They make good testing ground for major changes. Today, people are staying closer to home. Smart technology is expanding, and shifting demographics are changing how public services operate and who controls them. Our urban hubs are entering a new era and providing important clues about what's next. Yes, there's a body and a face with that voice. Um, thank you so much for being here for our first ever What's Next Summit. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining on the live stream. The hashtag, by the way, is What's Next Summit if you would like to join us there. We've talked about so many things today. Um, such a wonderful conversation this morning with Jose Andres. We talked about cryptocurrency, electric everything. We wanted to have a conversation about an issue that is so important to this time which is climate and climate change, which is why I'd like to welcome to the stage Ali Zaidi, who's the Deputy National Climate Advisor for the White House. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. So I know this summit is called What's Next, but I feel like we do have to start in this present moment before we can get to the future. And I wanted to start by asking if you thought your time in the Biden administration as a climate advisor was going to include the largest strategic oil release in our history, a million barrels a day. You know, one of the things that you learn, um, especially working in climate, is to start to expect 
the unexpected. <laughs> and you know, we see that with every release of the United Nations IPCC, that's the panel of scientists with their reports, um, things getting worse, things getting challenging, um, and a bunch of uncertainty built into the models and into reality. Um, and you know, it's an uncertainty that folks are living with in their communities right now. Um, uh, what will be the extent of the drought uh, for farmers planning uh, the next set of crops? Uh, what will be the reach of the wildfires for folks wondering if their cabin's gonna still be standing at the end of the season? Um, and part of what's been challenging is these exogenous factors um, and war being the most grave uh, among them, how do we uh, respond to that? And I think for President Biden, for our allies and partners, um, this has been a moment of stealing our resolve on tackling the climate crisis and recognizing that real energy independence, real energy security is not something we're gonna find at the bottom of a well. It's gonna be something we find by accelerating our shift to clean energy. Um, uh, drawing power from the sun, uh, drawing power from wind and storing it, uh, energy like nuclear and hydro. Um, and you know we've been, I think, accelerating our pace there and, and one of the things that was notable and I think important about the, the set of conversations the president had during his trip in Europe was a redoubling of that commitment uh, to making sure that we follow through on the ambition we've laid out in Paris and then in Glasgow. So how do you thread the needle on the messaging for that? Because that's a lot of nuance that you just described there, right? That we have these immediate short-term needs, but that there are just as pressing future changes that we need to make. I think the it is nuanced, you're right. Uh, but in a way, it's actually very simple. And I think it's actually very much part of the DNA of the unique way in which Joe Biden has advanced climate action, and that is to meet people where they are. Um, you know, when he goes and talks about the electric vehicle revolution, he's going to Dearborn and to Detroit, got a chance to go with him, and talking to those workers who've been on the line in certain cases for decades, meeting them where they are and talking about the transformation and opportunity in front of us. And I think in this instance, He's meeting folks where they are, which is feeling uh, the pain of Putin's price hike uh, at the gasoline pump, stabilizing that situation uh, through extraordinary action and leadership, and then making sure we're moving as boldly and vigorously in the direction of a clean energy future as we can. So it's, I think it is a little bit nuanced, but I think it is simple in the sense that if we're gonna be successful on climate, it's gonna be because we took the time to listen to people, meet them where they are, and deliver solutions that are going to resonate in their lives today. And do you think that message is getting out there? I think so, and, and you know, I think part of it is making sure that we are uh, being relentless in, in delivering that, because I think, you know, there's so much about climate that can make you despondent. Um, whether it's the latest scientific news or uh, the reality we see in our communities or sometimes progress being stalled or stymied by folks who'd rather not make that progress. Um, but, you know, part of what makes me uh, show up to work uh, being as excited as I am every day is that I work for someone who is deeply and profoundly optimistic. Uh, and I think that's the only way you can, you can move forward. So obviously you do work very closely with the president. How does he talk about, like how does he process this personally, like all of the, like this pressing weight of climate change? How do you all talk about it? 
You know, it's, it's, it, it, it actually resonates a lot with me, um, and maybe it's because he's from Scranton and I grew up outside of Erie, um, but the way, and I think he's just got a profound talent for this, um, that he grounds these conversations around big, weighty issues of public policy um, in the very specific and granular way that people feel them in their lives. Um, that's, that's the conversation we have, is what is this gonna mean for people's sense of purpose and dignity uh, for their jobs that help them provide for their families and give them that sense of purpose? Um, and, you know, I think he presses his team to, to not just be greenhouse gas accountants, because uh, it's easy for us to go in and say, well, you know, you do this, you turn this knob and you get 100 million metric tons, and you turn this knob and you lose 50 of those, and that's why we gotta do uh, X, Y, or Z, and our you know, econometric analysis suggests whatever, and that's important to him, that everything adds up. Um, but I think he really presses us to say, okay, but who's the person on the other side of that? So I do have a greenhouse gas accounting question for you, <laughs> um, which is also I think falls under the category of despondent, but um, you and climate scientists yesterday gave governments a final warning in a new report out that said to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change, emissions have to peak by 2025. So just in three years. And my colleague, Andrew Friedman, and I were talking about it yesterday, and he called it a cold slap of water to the face. <laughs> um, the idea that emissions also have to decline by almost half by 2030. So how do you see us making that? Uh, a few different ways. Uh, you know, I liken it to um, football, although we are in March Madness, and what a game yesterday. Uh, but I'll use the football analogy nonetheless. Um, we've got to run a, we've got to operate a running game and a passing game at the same time. The running game is we know we've got some technologies that are ready to be deployed right now. And, and you go buy by the pound and you sort of make progress inch by inch, yard by yard. That's the deployment of uh, electric vehicles. That's the deployment of solar and wind and storage. It's the retention of key, uh, key assets like our nuclear assets. It's the bolstering of efficiency of assets like hydropower. That's not just true here in the United States. We gotta do that all around the world. And then the second is making sure at the same time we're throwing the ball down the field. Um, and, and there I'm thinking about technologies like our electrolyzers. Um, so for the longest time we've said, hey, you know, steel, cement, aluminum, heavy industry, very hard to decarbonize. Let's talk about that tomorrow. And uh, that, that moment is now. We can no longer wait. And so that's what's been exciting as we've been, as we've tried to be making those running yard gains, we've also been looking down the field at those technologies that are gonna help us change the equation. And part of it is not just reducing what we put into the sky, but it's actually pulling the carbon out of the ambient uh, uh, environment, out of the atmosphere, and that's direct air, car uh, direct air capture technologies where we secured over $10 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law to advance that. And, you know, Joe Biden was the first person who's ever mentioned cover crops at a joint session of Congress. Uh, our farmers and ranchers are gonna be part of that solution too. And so how do you see this working, these technologies in specific industries like agriculture? What do you think is working right now? You know, in, in agriculture, one of the things that I'm particularly excited about is the shift we're seeing on sustainable aviation fuels. And that's something where we've proposed uh, tax credit, we've uh, proposed uh, increased infrastructure investment, but we now are seeing not only a concept of sustainable aviation fuels in the laboratory, but literally planes flying from, in the case of uh, one of our domestic airlines from Chicago to, to Washington DC on sustainable aviation fuels. So we gotta hasten that to the marketplace and that's opportunity for farmers and ranchers. A second thing that we're seeing is the advancement of these carbon capture 
uh, technologies, whether it's the research and development in plants that have deeper roots and bigger leaves, uh, or it's this cover cropping that helps do better soil carbon management, uh, which is gonna be critical to our future. And then it's important to remember as, you know, as someone who did grow up in a rural community that there's a ton of other climate and clean energy opportunity in rural communities that we also have to be laser focused on. And that means being a partner to our rural co-ops as they make the transition uh, to bringing the savings that can come from solar and wind and efficiency uh, onto the grid. So we gotta, we gotta invest in that. And so when you think about things like aviation or sustainable aviation fuels, how much appetite is there in Congress to incentivize that? As you sort of, and I'm thinking about this in context of how things have gone over the past year as you, of thinking about different climate initiatives within Congress. Yeah, I think, look, one of the things that's, that's stark to me, um, having sort of walked out of the gates uh, in January 2017 at the White House and then walked back in uh, January 2021, um, is how much the political economy around this stuff has changed. And a big reason I think that the political economy has changed is one, these are no longer jobs that people are talking or writing about, they're jobs people are working. Uh, and they're not jobs on another planet, they're here in our communities. And second, the technologies are more ready to be harnessed. So we're seeing a ton of um, uh, appetite, I think, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and the bipartisan infrastructure law is a good example of that, where we got seven and a half billion dollars to invest in building out our charging infrastructure around the country. That's gonna be electrical workers uh, who are building out that network, and that's gonna help us accelerate the deployment of electric vehicles. So I think there is uh, excitement, and there's excitement in things that, again, used to feel a little esoteric uh, that are pretty real now. Um, I'll give you an example of cement. So if cement were a country with 8% of the world's CO2 coming from cement processes, it would be one of the five largest polluters in the world. And now we've got tools from carbon capture where we've cut the cost in half over the last decade to green hydrogen where we have a line of sight to $1 a kilogram where we can make that cement without fouling the environment. And so I think people are really excited about that because it uh, helps us build a competitive edge here in the United States. And uh, we're seeing excitement for carbon capture, for electrolyzers, uh, again, in both chambers and on both sides of the aisle. My podcast listeners have been texting me questions about climate change, and <laughs> we've been answering them over the past couple of months. And I got a message from a listener who asked about what additional evidence lawmakers who are skeptical of climate change science need in order to take this seriously. From your perspective as a former Republican, what do you think could make a difference in bridging that divide? You know, I, I don't know what more scientific evidence is necessary. Um, uh, this is not uh, a few scientists, it's not many scientists, it's not most scientists. This is uh, the judgment of the global scientific community. And, you know, you don't need uh, a degree in rocket science to go and see our communities being burned to the ground. You don't need a degree in rocket science to see the sea levels rise and threaten homes and livelihoods. You don't need a degree in rocket science to understand that what we are perceiving, hundreds of billions of dollars of damage year over year, is on a hockey stick. Uh, and it's getting worse if we don't take action in a bold way I do think this goes back to, to what the president, I think, pushes his team to do, is we gotta meet folks where they are, um, and you know, oftentimes that's a concern around those kitchen table issues. Where's my job gonna be tomorrow? Where's, um, it, you know, am I gonna be able to pay the utility bills, and so on and so forth, and harness climate action as a solution for those concerns. And that's what we're trying to do. So just sidestep it, really, because. 
I, I just don't know that folks wanna, that everybody wants a lecture in science. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people are wrapped up in grappling with their day-to-day -day challenges, and our job is to help people tackle the challenges that are right in front of them, whether it's wildfire and drought, uh, whether it's job security and energy bills. And it turns out that climate change and, and the action that we need to take to tackle it is actually a really great sword in attacking those other challenges as well. So you're in this every day, you're reading all of these reports, you're having all of these policy conversations. Do you have your own personal climate anxiety that I feel like I talk about with a lot of people all the time about just <laughs> worrying about everything? Um, you know, my, I don't know that that's what motivates me. Um, I was with the vice president yesterday. Uh, we went to Thomas Elementary School and we sat around the room uh, at one point with uh, five kids, I think eight to 10. And one of them almost leapt out of their seat to tell the vice president that he had figured it out. He'd figured out how we could keep people from going to the hospital uh, because they'd been breathing all this gunk into their lungs um, by helping our vehicles run on solar. He said, electricity is the solution. And the vice president just soaked that in and told him about these electric school buses she'd seen be manufactured on one of her trips. It's not anxiety that propels me, it's a sense of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's a sense of opportunity that, that we can see in the eyes of those kids at Thomas, Thomas Elementary. It's the sense of opportunity I think about, you know, there's this, I, I tend to process a lot through the prism of, of where I grew up. In Erie, um, uh, they used to manufacture locomotives for the longest time, including when I was growing up there. And today, uh, what used to be GE Transport is now this company called Wabtec. And they are uh, manufacturing electric locos in Erie in factories that seem like they were gonna get shuttered. Um, and factories that have been around since the 50s and 60s, places like Seaway, Window, um, folks who've been manufacturing windows for the longest time are now putting a little bit more coating, uh, a little bit different technology, uh, and are now part of the revolution to make our buildings more efficient. So I get excited about the opportunity. I think there's plenty of gloom and doom out there in the world. And, um, you know, and I take the cues from that kid at Thomas Elementary, I take my cues from uh, the folks who've been marching and striking and calling for action, impatient um, young people, and from the folks I've had a, the great fortune of meeting, um, following the president around in some of these places, uh, the people who just wanna put um, a good meal and an opportunity and their sense of optimism on the kitchen table for their families. Well, thank you for ending us on a hopeful note. We will have to leave it there. Um, White House Deputy National Thanks Climate so Advisor, Ali Zaidi, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Too kind. I'm Russell Contreras, the race and justice reporter, but without further ado, let me introduce the only woman to be reelected in this city, the mayor of Washington, D.C., Mayor Muriel Bowser. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure. Pleasure to have you. To get started, before we get into the city's future, let's go to the city's past. Up until the Civil War, this city was a refuge for people escaping slavery. And their descendants are still here keeping this city operated. They educate our children, they patrol our streets, they keep the trains running on time, they're the facility managers and the nurses, like your parents. I say all this because election season's coming up. 
In every election, politicians seem to bash Washington. It's this place, it's this horrible place, I'm going there to fix it. I know they're talking about the federal government, mm -hmm. but do you feel sometimes those criticisms are based on race and racism? Well, um, there's certainly a lot of criticisms that we, are, we think are rooted in race, but I do think that there is this distinction that we spend a lot of time making between the Washington that is the federal government in the DC where I'm from, uh, and that I have the privilege uh, to represent 700,000 people who pay taxes just like every other American, uh, yet are deprived uh, real representation, uh, a vote for their congresswoman and two senators, and we fight that battle every day. What is the status of statehood? Is this a dead issue, or is this still alive? This is what I, I, I'd say, Russ. We're closer than we're ever, we've ever been, and we're this close. And what that means is that we've had two positive votes in the House of Representatives in this session uh, and the last. We have more support than we have ever had from the United States Senate, from senators. Uh, we have the whole regional delegation, the Washington Post, the business community, all are supporting statehood, and 86% of Washingtonians want to become the 51st state. So what it's going to take, uh, in my view, is a carve out on some important democracy legislation uh, in the Senate to get beyond this filibuster, and then we can get it done. And you got a tweet today to in support of statehood, is that correct? You, well, yes. Well, people every day uh, learn about our status. Most Americans, they don't think about it. They don't really know um, that we're different uh, and that we pay taxes but don't have a vote. And so when we explain it to them, um, they want to say more. And so we have a lot of celebrities, I think, today. Taraji Henson, uh, who is a DC native and a big Hollywood star, um, just reminded everybody, we need the vote. Uh, the confirmation of Kadanji Brown Jackson brings the issue up to everybody's mind. Uh, because while her nomination was being debated, we didn't have two senators representing us to question her. Uh, when they go to vote uh, this week to make her a justice, we won't have any senators representing us. And so there are times like this and confirmation appointments where it's front and center in people's minds. Now, two years ago, you were in praise and scorn from some people for creating a space to celebrate Black Lives Matter. We're creating the Black Lives Matter Plaza there. Uh, and there were calls at the time to rethink how we fund police. Um, now your administration is calling for more resources for police as we see rising crime uh, and people complaining that they see this crime in their neighborhoods. So I ask you, is this a reversal of that policy? Are we moving away from police reform or is something else going on here? I've never supported defunding the police. Uh, even uh, in the time where we were taking our streets back, making a safe place for protesters in Washington, D.C., in front of the White House and affirming through public art that Black Lives Matter, uh, we've always, my administration has always been supportive of making sure our department has the police that it needs. Uh, and so now we, in many cities around the country, are facing spikes in violence. Uh, and we're throwing every resource that we have at curbing that violence. I actually think that this COVID pandemic and the two years of our world really being turned on its side are impacting a lot of things, including uh, public safety in cities across America. Uh, so for us, uh, we have to make sure that we reverse um, taking money uh, out of being able to hire good police officers. We have a thing here in Washington. We want to hire more women. We want to get to th a 30 percent female force by 2030, uh, and we can do it. We're already kind of ahead of the national average. Uh, we also want to hire more D.C. residents. So we have a very robust cadet program that focuses on hiring uh, D.C. high school students. Uh, and that is, goes along with everything else. Uh, to deal with public, uh, to make sure your neighborhoods are safe, it takes more than the police. It takes preventing uh, crime before it happens, and it takes uh, providing robust opportunities. So in D.C., uh, we, are, we lean into that, too. Uh, we have a program called Building Blocks. We spent last year $58 million on alternate to police programs. We know those take time to work, and we're willing uh, to make the long-term investment. To get to that number of 4,000 police officers, in some cities, they're lowering the standards. Right now, we're at 
3,500. If we get to 4,000, do we need to lower the standards to get to that number? Are you comfortable with the standards we have now? We're not willing to lower our standards. Uh, and uh, part of the reason why I separate our department from departments around the country uh, is because we've been on the trajectory of reform for more than 20 years. We've been professionalizing our force. We require our officers to have 60 credits of college training. Uh, we require all of our officers to go through um, training like bystander training and uh, de-escalation training tactics. And they all wear a body-worn camera and we have an independent police complaint sport. So we've been on um, this trajectory for a long time. Uh, and it's important, especially when you've dried up your pipeline for a couple of years for hiring, to get that pipeline going so that you can attract um, the right officers. I have um, put a, a proposal in front of my council um, that would allow me to hire 347, but also a retention package uh, to try to curb uh, the annual retention uh, that a force our size sees every year. And if we're able to do that, we can build those numbers uh, and get to a number where if you have to call the police, you're not waiting an inordinate amount of time uh, for, for them to show up. You mentioned the body cameras. Technology is really important, and Washington has been on the forefront of adopting some of this technology. One of it is uh, Shot Spotter. This is the technology that can detect gunfire and give it the information to police in real time. Is this kind of technology, you feel that it will help reduce gun violence? Are you confident about that technology right now? Uh, we believe in using every tool uh, at our disposal. Uh, and the one thing I know uh, that while we're having an acute uh, issue right now, uh, this is not the DC that even I grew up in as a teenager where uh, we did have a lot of, of violence and uh, it wasn't safe in a, a lot of our neighborhoods. So we've come a long way um, since then uh, where neighborhoods all across the city are safe with great schools, fantastic parks and recreation centers. Uh, people are moving here, businesses are locating here uh, because of the great amenities uh, available in DC. So going into the pandemic, uh, we saw our population growing, our businesses growing, school age kids um, increasing in our schools. And so we're very focused on getting back uh, to that trajectory. And that's really uh, what's next for us. How um, do we manage this comeback? How are we bold about it? Uh, how do we uh, leverage all of the good things that we had going into this uh, to really uh, enliven our downtown, get our workers back, and make sure that our residents who suffered the most during COVID uh, are getting the relief that they need? A resident at Ben's Chili Bowl asked me, are we going to have robot dogs in police force? Because there's some departments that have these robot dogs to help de-escalate bomb scares. The federal immigration authorities are using these, these kind of robot dogs. Is that something you would adopt? I don't know about that, but I would have to ask my chief. Uh, <laughs> if he thinks it's a good idea, then uh, we, we, we want to have what's cutting edge and effective, but I don't know about it myself. Ro robot dogs. Yeah. So you're waiting to see on robot dogs. I'll be a wait and see. Now, this is something you've talked about is tackling homelessness in the city. Um, you have the Homeward DC 2000. It seeks to in long-term homelessness. Anybody that comes in the city is stark where they see lobbyists going into the Russell Building and Senate with, with millions of dollars at stake in lobbying, and then a few blocks they see an encampment here. What's the answer? What can you do that others have tried and have failed to finally tackle this issue? We won't fail, um, and we have been willing, our taxpayers have been willing to make uh, the investments necessary uh, to uh, provide housing for DC residents. Uh, we know what worked uh, in curbing family homelessness. I made a promise when I became mayor uh, that we would make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring, that we would close a dilapidated, unsafe family shelter and build short-term shelter across the city in all eight wards that was small and dignified and would work for families. We've been able to do that, uh, and as a result, we're driving down family homelessness by 73%. Families are getting in housing, and um, they're succeeding. That's what it's going to take in the men's system as well. Uh, and we're running a pilot right now uh, in these encampment sites. 
a system also upended by the pandemic. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we didn't have COVID outbreaks in our shelters, uh, but we also had strict protocols, uh, which means some people decided to go outside, sleep in tents. Uh, we want them to come back in because we are a right to shelter city. We have shelter space for them, and we know when people can come into shelter, we can get them stabilized so that they can be on their way to permanent housing. On the encampments, uh, unfortunately, there have been a couple dozen that have developed. Um, we've already um, been able to offer housing and close sites that you know were the most problematic. And we're going to continue to work with our unhoused residents until they're all housed. Of course, there's been some criticism of the way that some of the encampments have been removed or shifted. Um, what, do you, what is your reaction to some of those who say it's been inhumane the way we've removed some of these encampments? Um, I would say um, people, there are some who think people should live in tents. I'm not one of them. Not in a city as prosperous as ours. Uh, we have the ability and we have shelter. Uh, and actually, once we get people stabilized, we can also offer housing. Uh, so that is not our value as DC residents to have people sleeping in tents. Uh, part of this job is making tough decisions. Uh, and we've been called on to make a lot of tough, tough decisions, but ones um, that are gonna be the best for the most people. Uh, and the care pilot, uh, which is our encampment pilot, is an example of that. Mm -hmm. And it turns out when you, you ask, uh, take a survey of DC residents, three out of four people would agree. On the flip side, Washington is changing. Some say it's gentrifying, but you have unveiled this black home, home ownership fund and efforts to help black owned businesses. How can this avert all this gentrification that we see in other cities and keep some of those original descendants in their home in Washington and build legacy wealth and generational wealth? So it's, it's uh, incredibly important. Uh, as I mentioned, I was born and raised in DC and in the 70s, DC was a very different city. Uh, we actually saw probably more people leaving the city during that time. Um, than, than we have in recent years, <coughs> excuse me. And you know why? Because they were leaving because the schools weren't any good and the neighborhoods were unsafe. And so I believe that the renaissance of our city is directly related uh, to a robust investment in public schools and in public safety. And when that happens, there are gonna be pressures on housing, but we wouldn't want it to be the reverse. We wouldn't want to be a city where nobody wants to live or nobody wants to start a business. Uh, and so that's why we've been able to make these types of investments. Is it important to keep that uh, culture, the cultural aspect of the city? We're talking about Ben's Chili Bowl. We're talking about go-go music, right? That's something that is ingrained in the culture of the city but could be lost if we're not careful. Absolutely, and we've been able to make some very significant investments. Um, go Go Music was made the official music of Washington, D.C. This like two years ago. I couldn't believe it hadn't been done already. Uh, and we are very uh, heavily invested in our legacy initiatives, which will focus on uh, investing in black home ownership and getting more people to be able to own their own home. You, if, for those who don't know Go Go Music, can you, do you know a song at all that, for a Go Go You don't artist? want me to sing. Oh, okay, just want to make sure. <laughs> On that aspect, you know, allergies, I, I, you have to excuse me, are really um, killing me. It's something I, I want to ask you is, you know, the history, black history here is so important. I've come here and I'm constantly looking for Marvin Gaye, where he lived and thing. What can the city do? We talked about uh, preserving some of our cultural sites, but allowing the visitor here to understand this is an emancipation city. This is deep and ingrained in our culture, and this is also the capital. Is there anything we can do to further help residents understand that history and experience it? You raise a great point um, because there's been, of course, a lot of discussion of Juneteenth and it's now a holiday. And uh, we celebrate Emancipation Day here. And we were emancipated in DC uh, almost a full year before the emancipation uh, reached everybody else. And so we celebrate that with a festival. We celebrate it with a, a, here, a series of events uh, in our libraries and schools. 
Uh, we're also very committed uh, to making sure that our statues and streets represent prominent African Americans. Hmm. I want to ask you about Miranda, your daughter. You're, uh, you decided, made the decision to adopt this child, right, and be a single mother at a time in Washington, 41% of our children are just single parents. I ask this because my grandmother did the same thing. Amen. Adopted my mother, and that's probably why I'm here today with you. Amen. You made this decision and put yourself, um, decided I want to be a mother and I'm going to be, <coughs> I'm going to be a leader too. How has this affected you in your professional life? You have your parents, you have a support system, but you're critiquing the idea that being a single parent denotes you poverty, that this is you can, a decision you can make and you can excel. So I ask you, after you've done all that, how are you doing and would you do it again? Oh, I would do it again in a, in a minute. I wish I had done it again, actually, um, because Miranda, she's just been a blessing. She's totally changed my life. Uh, and I think what you just described is that, and people stop me and will ask me questions, is that, and I just tell them, families are made in all kinds of ways. And we should celebrate family and how people choose to make their families. And where possible, support those decisions. So uh, I think that it is just uh, amazing uh, to be able to have an important policy-making job where I impact a lot of people but then to have this little three-year-old who really, like, already at three, has her, her opinions and, and can run things. And has she told you any criticism about the city? The way she it's loves the city. She thinks it's she does. great. <laughs> uh, but I'll just give you a little example. I, I, I was really focused on getting my daughter to, you know, sleep and, and sleep in sure. her room and have a schedule and all that. And the other day I came home and she says, well, I want to sleep in your room. And I said, well, why? Because you can sleep in your own bed and you have a nice bed. And she just goes, well, I want to cuddle. <laughs> so it is just, you know, she's just a sweetie. And this question came from one of our founders. Uh, and forgive me for it because I don't partake in this particular activity. But he asked, why is it still strange the way uh, DC sells marijuana, excuse me, cannabis? <laughs> that you have to buy a pencil in order to get a certain amount. Is that gonna change or is that gonna stay, this kind of quirkiness? Um, well, you bring it up on a day where um, our council was really debating it and it is unfortunate that we're in the position that we're in. We're in really in an untenable position of having um, legal possession and use by adults, uh, but the inability for the government to tax and regulate it. Uh, so what has emerged is a, a medical cannabis system that's suffering and an illegal market that's thriving and making the city unsafe. Uh, and unfortunately, President Biden kept this anti-democratic rider in his budget proposal. Um, so we're working very hard to get it removed in the Congress. And then that gives the local legislature the ability, just like any other state, uh, to control um, and tax and regulate the sale of marijuana. Final minute that we have together here. Uh, you're running for a historic third term. There is only one other mayor who has gone this far, and I think his name was Mayor Barry, right? What have you learned from the mayor for life? And do you model yourself on him, on some things, right? Mm -hmm. um, on how he ran this city? Well, um, I would be lucky. Uh, any mayor would be lucky if people loved you as much as people love Marion Barry. And for all his uh, foibles, uh, he was a good mayor. Uh, and he was especially a good mayor in his first term. And people, you know, the book has been written. <laughs> but if you go back and look at the women he hired, um, the initiatives he created, and the middle class that he built, unfortunately, a lot of it is in Maryland now. Um, but there, there were a lot of bold initiatives um, by, by the mayor. And so uh, his lasting legacies will be, I think, the summer youth program. Still 13,000 kids can work uh, in the summer in DC and get paid and get experience. And a lot of people uh, that work for us now started uh, with a summer job. 
Uh, and I think that uh, building a middle class and hiring, uh, you know, incredibly smart African Americans to be leaders of a major American city, uh, Marion will be known and appreciated for. Mayor Mayor Bear. Oh. <laughs> I almost said Mayor Bear. Mayor Bowser. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>